The Rules Committee will come to order. The Rules Committee will come to order. It's unfortunate that we have to be here today, uh, but the actions of the President of the United States make that necessary. President Trump withheld congressionally approved aid to Ukraine, a partner under siege, not to fight corruption, but to extract a personal political favor. President Trump refused to meet with Ukraine's president in the White House until he completed this scheme. All the while, leaders in Russia, the very nation holding a large part of Ukraine hostage, the very nation that interfered with our elections in 2016, had yet another meeting in the Oval Office just last week. These are not my opinions. These are uncontested facts. We've listened to the hearings. We've read the transcripts. And it's clear that this president acted in a way that not only violates the public trust, he jeopardized our national security, and he undermined our democracy. He acted in a way that rises to the level of impeachment. That is why we are considering H.R.E.S. 755 today, a resolution impeaching Donald John Trump, 
President of the United States for high crimes and misdemeanors. Congress has no other choice but to act with urgency. You know, when I think back to the founders of this nation, they were particularly concerned about foreign interference in our elections. They understood that allowing outside forces to decide American campaigns would cause the fundamentals of our democracy to crumble. But the evidence shows that is exactly what President Trump did. Not only allowed, but solicited foreign interference, all to help him win his reelection campaign. What shocks me, quite frankly, about so many of my Republican friends is their inability to acknowledge that President Trump acted improperly. It seems the only Republican members willing to admit the President did something wrong have either already retired or announced plans they intend to retire at the end of this Congress. I get it. It's hard to criticize a President of your own party. But that shouldn't, uh, you know, but that shouldn't matter here. I admired President Clinton when he was President of the United States, and I still do today. But when this House impeached him, which I didn't agree with, I went to the House floor and I said I thought what President Clinton did was wrong. Because moments like this call for more than just reflexive partisanship. They require honesty, and they require courage. Are any Republicans today willing to muster the strength to say that what this president did was wrong? Now let me say again what happened here. The president withheld congressionally approved military aid to a country under siege to abstract a personal political favor. He did not do this as a matter of U.S. policy. He did this for his own benefit. That is wrong. And if that is not impeachable conduct, I don't know what is. Now, I've heard some on the other side suggest that this process is about overturning an election. That is absurd. This is about President Trump using his office to try and rig the next election. Now, think about that. We like to say that every vote matters, that every vote counts. We learned in grade school about all the people who fought and died for that right. It is a sacred thing. You know, I remember as a middle schooler in 1972, leaving leaflets at the homes of potential voters, urging them to support George McGovern for president. No relation, by the way. Uh, I thought he had a great last name. Uh, and he was dedicated to ending the war in Vietnam and feeding the hungry and helping the poor. I remember, even to this day, what an honor it was to ask people to support him, even though I was too young to vote myself. And what a privilege it was later in life to ask voters for their support in my own campaigns. Now, I've been part of winning campaigns, and I've been part of losing ones too. People I thought would be great presidents, like Senator McGovern, were never given that chance. Make, make no mistake, I was disappointed, but I accepted it. I would take losing an election any day of the week when the American people render that verdict. But I will never... And I mean, I will never be okay if other nations decide our leaders for us. And the President of the United States is rolling out the welcome mat for that kind of foreign interference. To not act would set a dangerous precedent, not just for this president, but for every future president. The evidence is as clear as it is overwhelming. And this administration hasn't handed over a single subpoenaed document to refute it, not one. Now it's up to us to decide whether the United States is still a nation where no one is above the law, or whether America is allowed to become a land run by those who act more like kings or queens, as if the law doesn't apply to them. You know, it's no secret that President Trump has a penchant for cozying up to notorious dictators. He's complimented Vladimir Putin, congratulated Rodrigo Duterte, lauded President Erdogan, fell in love with Kim Jong-un. I can go on and on and on. And maybe the president is jealous that they can do whatever they want. These dictators are the antithesis of what America stands for. And every day we let President Trump act like the law doesn't apply to him, we, we move a little closer to them. You know, Benjamin Franklin left the Constitutional Convention and said, the founders have created a republic if you can keep it. There are no guarantees. Our system of government will persist only if we fight for it. And the simple question for us is this. 
Are we willing to fight for this democracy? I expect we'll have a lot of debate here today. I hope everyone searches their conscience. To my Republican friends, imagine any Democratic president sitting in the Oval Office, President Obama, President Clinton, any of them. Would your answer here still be the same? No one should be allowed to use the powers of the presidency to undermine our elections or cheat in a campaign, no matter who it is and no matter what their party. We all took an oath not to defend a political party, but to uphold the Constitution of the United States. History is testing us. We can't control what the Senate will do, but each of us can decide whether we pass that test, whether we defend our democracy, and whether we uphold our oath. Today, we'll put a process in place to consider these articles on the House floor. And when I cast my vote in favor, my conscience will be clear. Before I turn to our ranking member, I want to first recognize his leadership on this committee. We take up a lot of contentious, contentious matters up here in the Rules Committee, and often we are on different sides of many issues. Uh, but he leads with integrity and he cares deeply about this House. There will be passionate disagreement here today, but I have no doubt we will continue working together in the future and side by side on this committee to better this institution. And let me also state for the record uh, that Chairman Nadler is unable to be here today because of a family medical emergency. And we are all keeping him and his family in our thoughts and prayers. Uh, testifying instead today is Congressman Raskin. He is not only a valued member of this committee, but also the Judiciary and Oversights Committee. Uh, in addition, Congressman Raskin is a constitutional law professor, so he has a very comprehensive and unique understanding of what we're talking about here today and I appreciate him stepping in and testifying this morning. I also want to welcome back uh, Ranking Member Collins, a former member of the Rules Committee, uh, someone who I don't often agree with, but uh, <laughs> someone who I uh, respect uh, nonetheless and uh, appreciate all of his contributions to this institution. Now, having said that, I'm now we'll turn, over to, turn this over to our Ranking Member, Mr. Cole, for any remarks he wishes to make. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Let me begin by uh, reciprocating uh, a personal and professional respect uh, for you and the other members of this committee as well, uh, because I do think very highly of each and every person on this committee, and particularly of you, Mr. Chairman. But this is a day where we're going to disagree and disagree very strongly. It is, uh, as you referenced, Mr. Chairman, a sad day, sad day for me personally, for the Rules Committee, for the institution of the House, and for the American people. We're meeting today on a rule for considering articles of impeachment against a sitting President of the United States on the floor of the House of Representatives. This is not the result of a fair process and certainly not a bipartisan one. Sadly, the Democrats' impeachment inquiry has been flawed and partisan from day one. So I guess it should come as no surprise that Democrats' preordained outcome is also flawed and partisan. Seven weeks ago, when this committee met to consider a resolution to guide the process for the Democrats' unprecedented impeachment inquiry, I warned that they were treading on shaky ground with their unfair and closed process. Reflecting on how, how things have played out since then reaffirms my earlier judgment that this flawed process was crafted to ensure a partisan preordained result. Unfortunately, this entire process was tarnished further by the speed with which my Democratic colleagues on the Judiciary and Intelligence Committees have rushed to deliver their predetermined judgment to impeach the President for something, anything, whether there are stones left unturned or whether there is any proof at all. There's no way this can or should be viewed as legitimate, certainly not by Republicans whose minority rights have been trampled on every step on the way, <coughs> and certainly not by the American people observing this disastrous political show scene by scene. As I've said before, unlike any impeachment proceedings in modern history, the partisan process prescribed and pursued by Democrats is truly unprecedented. And it contradicts Speaker Pelosi's own words. Back in March of this year, she said, quote, impeachment is so divisive to the country that unless there's something so compelling and overwhelming and bipartisan, I don't think we should go down that path because it divides the country, unquote. 
The key word in that quote is bipartisan. Indeed, during the Nixon and Clinton impeachments, the process for even opening the inquiry was considered on a bipartisan basis. Back then, both sides treated the process with the seriousness it deserved, negotiating and finding agreement across the aisle to ensure fairness and due process for all involved in the inquiries. But that's not the case today. Instead, Democrats have pushed forward using a partisan process that limited the president's right to due process, prevented the minority from exercising their rights, and charged ahead toward a vote to impeach the president, whether the evidence is there or not. I suppose I shouldn't be surprised by any of this. Democrats in the House have been pushing to impeach President Trump since before he was even sworn in. In December of 2017, when a current Democratic member of the House forced a vote on impeachment, uh, impeachment resolution, 58 Democrats voted then to impeach the President Trump, even without an investigation, without any evidence to point to. And those numbers have only grown since then, to the point where the majority is now pushing forward with a final vote on impeachment, heedless of where it takes the country, and regardless of whether they have proven their case. Mr. Chairman, it didn't have to be this way. When, uh, it, we, when she became entrusted uh, with the gavel over the House, this Congress, Speaker Pelosi assured us all that she would not move forward with impeachment unless it was bipartisan and unless there was a clear consensus in the country. Neither of those two commissions are present here. Indeed, the latest real clear politics average of polls on impeachment shows the country evenly split with 46.5 percent of Americans in favor of impeachment and 46.5 percent against. That is hardly what I would call a national consensus in favor of impeaching President Trump. When half of Americans are telling you that what you're doing is wrong, you should listen. I think this is especially the case given how close we are to the next election. In 11 months, the American people are going to vote on the next president of the United States. Why then are we plunging the country into this kind of turmoil and this kind of trauma now, when the voters themselves will resolve the matter one way or another less than a year from today? All it does achieve is make the political polarization and divisions in our country even worse. That makes no sense to me. Though we may be moving forward with a vote, I certainly do not believe the majority has proven its case or convinced the American people that the weeks of wasted time was worth it. And personally, I believe the articles themselves are unwarranted. The majority is seeking to remove the president over something that didn't happen, the alleged quid pro quo with the president of Ukraine. Never mind that the foreign aid went to the Ukraine as it was supposed to, and never mind that no investigations required uh, for the Ukraine to get the aid, and never mind the, the two participants in the famous conversation, President Trump and President Zelensky, said nothing inappropriate happened. According to the majority, however, a quid pro quo that never existed is an appropriate basis for removing the president from office. And yet, even though the majority has not proven its case, and even though there's no basis for impeachment, are still moving forward today. What I cannot discern is a legitimate reason why. Why the majority is moving forward when the process is so partisan, why they are moving forward when the American people are not with them, why they are moving forward when they haven't proven their case, and why they are moving forward when there is no basis for impeachment. Why? Why put the country through all this? It makes even less sense to me when we consider the realities of the United States Senate. We already know that the votes to convict and remove the president uh, from office simply aren't there. Bluntly put, this is a matter that Congress as a whole cannot resolve on its own. Yet the majority is plunging forward regardless of the needless drama or the damage to the institution and to the country knowing full well that at the end of the day, the president will remain in office. And for what? Scoring political points with their party's base? Again, Mr. Chairman, this does not make any sense to me. We didn't need to go this route. We didn't need to push forward on a partisan impeachment process 
that had only one possible result. But we are here anyway, regardless of the damage it does to the institution and regardless of how much further it divides the country. As I said at the beginning, Mr. Chairman, this is a sad day for all of us. But it is especially sad for me knowing that this day was inevitable, preordained from the start. No matter what happened, no matter where the investigations led, the Democratic majority in the House of Representatives was pushing since the day they took over to impeach President Trump. The facts don't warrant that, Mr. Chairman, and the process is unworthy of the outcome. The President should not be impeached, and I urge all members, both here in the Rules Committee and tomorrow on the House floor, to vote no. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Um, and I appreciate uh, your, your comments. Uh, obviously, we have strong disagreements. Um, and I just, just one technical uh, point uh, I'd like to make. Uh, none of us in this House have uh, had an opportunity to vote on impeachment. Um, uh, the resolution that the gentleman refers to um, uh, uh, was some of us opposed tabling it because we thought it should go to committee um, where it could be appropriately evaluated. And that's what this process has achieved. The relevant committees have done their work, investigated the claims and wrongdoings by the president, and now the Judiciary Committee has recommended articles of impeachment. So the first time anybody in this House will get an opportunity to vote on impeachment will be tomorrow. Uh, having said that, I want to welcome our, both, both of our witnesses. Uh, and Mr. Raskin, uh, we will begin with you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, Chairman McGovern. Good morning, Ranking Member Cole. Good morning to uh, all of our distinguished colleagues on the House Rules Committee. And good morning to my friend, Mr. Collins. Uh, it is uh, my solemn responsibility this morning to present for your consideration House Resolution 755 and the accompanying House Judiciary Committee report concerning the impeachment of Donald John Trump, President of the United States for High Crimes and Misdemeanors Committed Against the People of the United States. I'm appearing, as you said, Mr. Chairman, this morning in place of Chairman Nadler, who could not be with us. I am sure I speak for all the members of both the Judiciary Committee and the Rules Committee in sending strength, love, and prayers to Chairman Nadler's wife, Joyce, and all of our hopes for a speedy recovery. The Judiciary Committee, along with the other committees which investigated President Trump's offenses, the Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence, the Committee on Foreign Affairs, and the Committee on Oversight and Reform, bring these articles with a solemn purpose and a heavy heart, but in active faith with the constitutional oaths of office that we have all sworn. The investigating committees conducted 100 hours of deposition testimony with 17 sworn witnesses and 30 hours of public testimony with 12 witnesses. The Judiciary Committee is now in possession of overwhelming evidence that the President of the United States has committed high crimes and misdemeanors, violated his constitutional oath to faithfully execute the office of the President of the United States, and to the best of his ability, preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States, and violated his constitutional duty to take care that the laws are faithfully executed. We present two articles of impeachment supported by hundreds of pages of detailed evidence and meticulous analysis. The evidence and analysis lead inescapably to the conclusions embodied in these articles of impeachment. First, President Trump has committed the high crime and misdemeanor of abuse of office. He abused the awesome powers of the presidency by using his office to corruptly demand that a foreign government interfere in our American presidential election in order to promote his own political campaign in 2020. He corruptly conditioned the release of $391 million in foreign security assistance that he held back from the Ukrainian government, along with a long hoped for White House presidential meeting. <clears throat> he conditioned those on Ukrainian President Zelensky's agreement to go public with two statements. One statement was announcing a criminal investigation into former Vice President Joe Biden, a leading presidential candidate and rival of the president. The other statement was announcing an investigation that would rehabilitate a discredited pro-Russian conspiracy theory by showing that it was Ukraine and not Putin's Russia that tried to disrupt the last American presidential election in 2016. This scheme to corrupt an American presidential election 
subordinated the democratic sovereignty of the people to the private political ambitions of one man, the president himself. It immediately placed the national security interests of the United States of America at risk, and it continues to embroil the nation and our government in conflict. Second, after this corrupt scheme came to light and numerous public servants with knowledge of key events surfaced to testify in our committee investigations about the president's actions, President Trump directed the wholesale, categorical, and indiscriminate obstruction of this congressional impeachment investigation. He did so by ordering a blockade of administration witnesses, by trying to muzzle and intimidate witnesses who did come forward, and by refusing to produce even a single subpoenaed document. In the history of the Republic, no president other than this one has ever claimed and exercised the unilateral right and power to thwart and defeat a House presidential impeachment inquiry. Yet that would have been the final and unavoidable result of the president's outrageous defiance of Congress had 17 brave witnesses not come forward in the face of the president's threats and testified about the Ukraine shakedown and its scandalous effects on our national security, our democracy, and our constitutional system of government. But make no mistake, while this investigation was saved by the courage and old-fashioned patriotism of witnesses like Ambassador William Taylor, Ambassador Maria Yovanovitch, Lieutenant Colonel Alexander Vindman, and Dr. Fiona Hill, the president's aggressive and unprecedented resistance to congressional subpoenas for witnesses and documents is blatantly and dangerously unconstitutional. If accepted and normalized now, it will undermine, perhaps for all time, the congressional impeachment power itself, which is the people's last instrument of constitutional self-defense against a sitting president who behaves like a king and tramples the rule of law. By obstructing an impeachment inquiry with impunity, the president will have the power to actively destroy the people's final check on his own corrupt misconduct and abuse of power. The framers insisted that we have impeachment in the Constitution precisely to protect ourselves from a president becoming a tyrant and a despot. And we cannot and we will not allow the impeachment power itself to be destroyed. <clears throat> These articles charge that President Trump has engaged in systematic abuse of his powers, obstructed Congress, and realized the worst fears of the framers by subordinating our national security and dragging foreign powers into American politics to corrupt our elections, all for the greater cause of his own personal gain and ambition. Article 1, Section 4 of the Constitution provides that the president shall be impeached for treason, bribery, or other high crimes and misdemeanors. This is the essential check that the people's representatives maintain over the executive branch. As our constitutional expert witnesses testified, the framers sought to capture a broad range of presidential misconduct and wrongdoing through this provision, but the commanding and comprehensive impulse for including the impeachment power in the Constitution was to prevent the president's abuse of power, which the framers saw as the very essence of impeachable conduct. In Federalist Number 65, Hamilton wrote that impeachable offenses are defined by abuse of some public trust. From the Federalist Papers and the records of the Constitutional Convention and the ratifying conventions, we find that the framers feared principally three kinds of betrayal of office by abuse of power. Abuse of power by exploiting public office for private, political, or financial gain, number one. Number two, abuse of power by betraying the national interest and the public trust through entanglement with foreign governments. And number three, abuse of power by corrupting democratic elections and denying the people proper agency through self-government. According to the framers, any one of these violations of the public trust would be enough to justify presidential impeachment for abuse of power. However, President Trump's conduct has realized all three of the framers' worst fears of presidential abuse of power. Never before in American history has an impeachment investigation crystallized in findings of conduct 
that implicate all of the major reasons that the framers built impeachment into our Constitution. Mr. Chairman, the conduct we set before you today is not some kind of surprising aberration or deviation in the President's behavior for which he is remorseful. On the contrary, the President is completely unrepentant and defiantly declares his behavior here perfect, indeed absolutely perfect. He says that Article II of the Constitution gives him the power to do whatever he wants, conveniently forgetting Article II, Section 4, which gives us the power to check his misconduct with the instrument of impeachment. We believe this conduct is impeachable and should never take place again under our constitutional system. He believes his conduct is perfect, and we know, therefore, that it will take place again and again. Indeed, our report points out that this pattern of showing spectacular disrespect for the rule of law by inviting and welcoming foreign powers into our elections was in plain view in the 2016 presidential election. America remembers when then-candidate Donald Trump uttered the imperishably infamous words, Russia, if you're listening, I hope you're able to find the 30,000 emails that are missing. And just five hours later, Russian agents moved to hack his political opponent's computers as part of their continuing effort to upend the 2016 presidential campaign. As identified by the Justice Department, the Trump campaign had more than 100 contacts with Russian operatives over the course of that campaign, and none of them were reported by the Trump campaign to law enforcement or national security agencies. Moreover, during the special counsel investigation into the sweeping and systematic Russian campaign to subvert our election, President Trump engaged in another systematic campaign of obstruction of the investigative process to obscure his own involvement. Mr. President, Mr. Chairman, we present you not just with high crimes and misdemeanors, but a constitutional crime in progress up to this very minute. Mayor Giuliani, the president's private lawyer, fresh from his overseas travel looking to rehabilitate once again the discredited conspiracy theories at the heart of the president's defense, admitted that he participated directly in the smear campaign to oust Ambassador Yovanovitch from her job. According to the New Yorker magazine, Giuliani said, I believe that I needed Yovanovitch out of the way. She was going to make the investigations difficult for everybody. And here, of course, Mr. Giuliani refers to the president's sought-after investigations into Joe Biden and the remnants of the discredited conspiracy theory pushed by Russia as propaganda that it was Ukraine and not Russia that interfered in the 2016 American presidential election. Given that an unrepentant president considers his behavior perfect, given that he thinks the Constitution empowers him to do whatever he wants, given that he and his team are still awaiting President Zelensky's statement about investigating Joe Biden, given that he has already invited China to perform an investigation of its own. We can only ask what the 2020 election will be like, or indeed, what any future election in America will be like if we just let this misconduct go and authorize and license presidents to coerce, cajole, pressure and entice foreign powers to enter our election campaigns on behalf of the president. Who will be invited in next? The president's continuing course of conduct constitutes a clear and present danger to democracy in America. We cannot allow this misconduct to pass. It would be a sellout of our constitution, our foreign policy, our national security, and our democracy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you very much, Mr. Collins. Welcome back to the Rules Committee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's good to see you. And uh, Mr. Cole, as well, and members who have spent many hours in this room with. You know, the chairman made a statement about uh, my friend here, Mr. Raskin, and he is a fine attorney, and, and it's been amazing to me um, throughout this year how the Judiciary Committee has sidelined fine attorneys like himself into not asking questions and to not being a part of the process. It's been really interesting to watch because he's actually a, a good one. And as you said, he's a good constitutional attorney. I'm not a constitutional attorney. I'm a pastor and an attorney from North Georgia. But I believe that you take another look at this and you can apply constitutional lenses. We all sit through those classes. But it's a common sense lens. It's a common sense lens. 
Mr. Cole made a question, a comment the, when he, in his opening statements, he says, you said, Mr. Cole, it said it doesn't make sense. Yeah, it does. It makes perfect sense. Look at the pattern. You know, the, the only thing that is, that is uh, a clear and present danger right now in this room is the pattern of attack and abuse of rules and, a, and decisions to get at this president that started over three years ago, really the night he was elected. And, it, and, and I said the other day in the committee hearing, I talked about you know the, having the means and the motive and the opportunity. The opportunity for this day occurred last November when we lost the majority. It occurred. Because they'd already talked about it for, for years and prior, and so now we just bring it forward. And we've tried a lot of different things to get there. And we'll talk about that, I'm sure, as, as the time goes on today. And look, we can have plenty of time to talk about the, the articles and, and the very vague articles that we did. It's, it's pretty interesting if you read the report from the majority. There's a lot of discussion about crimes, but they couldn't find it in themselves to charge one. Again, common sense. Articles, and when you think about impeachment, you're thinking about impeaching a president in particular for crimes. You're thinking about it, you're, you're sitting it down. It was, it was, and this majority has tried so hard to be like Clinton and Nixon and failed so miserably. But every time we try, we try once again, except the one thing, when it came down to the very end, the one thing they couldn't do is actually find a crime. They talk about it a bunch. If you read, their, read the majority's report, it is well written. It is some of the best work you'll see, frankly, in some ways of fictional accounts of what this actually is, but it actually talks about it. That the problem here is a majority bent on finding something for this president. So Mr. Cole, it's not a surprise. In fact, it's a sad day, for not only for the Rules Committee, but for the Judiciary Committee. You know, it's telling that the articles of impeachment, to show you how partisan this is, and really this concerning part that I see, and Mr. McGovern is a friend, and we disagree, and you, you're exactly right, we disagree probably on a lot of things. Is this glass half full, half and, and that's fine. That's what we're supposed to do. That's what our voters send us here for. But to find ways to actually work, well, we have worked together. The question I have here, though, is if this was, as, your, as the speaker said, to suppose it should be overwhelming, bipartisan, and, and the American people understand it, then why are we in the Rules Committee today? When it was with Clinton, it was a UC straight to the floor. It wasn't, it didn't have to come to the Rules Committee because both sides could see there was something needed to be discussed, and that's not true here. And so we're having to bring it up here to the Rules Committee, a place that I have uh, spent many uh, hours and many of us in this uh, group have discussed many things, but this is, should not be one of them. You know, it's interesting that I hear a lot today, and I've heard already from Mr. Raskin and from the, from the chairman as well, the discussion of the founders. And it's interesting, we, we cherry-pick the founders, and that's okay, that's what you know, partisans do. When you're in a partisan impeachment, you cherry-pick the founders. If you like this partisan work, you do that one. If you like the other partisan. But the one that's not mentioned is the very thing that we're here for. And that was found, I believe it was in uh, Federalist... Uh, I think it was 65, it was, it was Hamilton, when he said this, he said, the founders warned, warned against a vague open-ended charge because it could be applied in a partisan fashion by the majority of the House of Representatives against an op opposition president. Alexander Hamilton called partisan impeachment regulated by more of the comparative strength of parties than the real demonstration of innocence or guilt, the greatest danger. And additionally, the founders explicitly excluded the term maladministration from the impeachment clause because they did not want the subject pres presidents to the whims of Congress, their words. James Madison said, so vague a term will be the equivalent to a tenure during the, ple during the pleasure of the Senate. And I would say it would be a tenure to the pleasure of this House. When we understand what's going on here, when we look at the, the, the discussions here, there are many things that I want to talk about, but the first I want to do is... When we talk about how we get to a certain place, proper process leads to proper results, and we've not had any of that in this process. I have always said, and I've said it many times uh, in our discussions uh, lately, is that this is all about a clock and a calendar. It has been for a while. Since January, when we were sworn in, it's about a clock and a calendar. Why do I say that? Because we had to get to it by the end of the year, because if we went into the next year, it would be really too close, especially from the House's perspective, to the elections that they're trying to interfere with. And yes, they're trying to interfere with elections, the 2020 election, by actually beginning this process and been going forward. Now, the conduct is not conducted in the perspective of the American people. The clock and the calendar know no masters except themselves. 
You see, our committee held its first hearing on December 4th, literally the day after Schiff publicly released his report. In the first minutes of the hearing, Mr. Sensenbrenner furnished the chairman with our demand for a minority day of hearings. The chairman also set a deadline of December 6th for Republicans and the president to request additional witnesses. But it wasn't until Saturday, the day after the deadline, that Chairman Schiff transmitted 8,000 pages of material to the Judiciary Committee. And we still haven't gotten everything, not that it matters to the majority. For, for institutionalists, this should bother you. You can, you can still go ahead and vote for your yes tomorrow and vote for yes today and do that, but it should matter for this institution that while I was in Georgia, I received a call from my staff saying they've just released 8,000 documents, some drives, some of which were going to be kept in a secure holding. And when I asked the chairman about these documents, what are they going to be used? He said, well, we're not going to read them either. We're not going to have a chance to go through them. We're just going to go ahead with what we're doing. That was from my chairman, who I respect greatly. We've done a lot of things together, but it has been very difficult when in a hearing of this magnitude, how can anyone, Republican or Democrat, actually go back and look at their constituents in the face and say, we looked at all the evidence. I looked at everything and I came to this conclusion. No, we cherry-picked the evidence and we only used what we wanted to do because that material, which by the way, has still not all been released. There's the Inspector General IG report that is still transparent, has not been released. Now, whether it's good or bad is irrelevant. But when you're talking about impeaching a president, shouldn't the underlying evidence sent to Judiciary Committee actually matter Again, it doesn't take constitutional experts coming in and telling us about it. It takes common sense to know that you don't impeach somebody without at least making all the evidence proper. But you know, that's what happens when you're to the tyranny of a clock and a calendar. When you're the tyranny of a clock and a calendar, nothing else matters. It's like what's going to happen here in the holidays is you're getting close to that day and you're supposed to give that gift. Nothing else matters. You just got to go get it. And it's, it's the last minute. If you don't have anything, Mr. Chase, I bet you've done this. You go out and you just buy the first thing you get. And this is what was happening. The clock was running out. So they found a phone call they didn't like. They didn't like this administration. They didn't like what the president did. They tried to make up claims of that there was pressure and all these other things that they've so outlined in the report. But at the end of the day, it's simply last minute Christmas shopping. They ran and found something. They said, we can do it. But no crimes. None in the articles. Abuse of power in which any member can make up anything they want to and call it an abuse of power. But in the report, they document bribery and extortion, and all these other things, which they can't put into the articles. And then the obstruction of justice. Again, it's sort of interesting when I just read Chairman Schiff transferred on a Saturday 8,000 pages of what we were supposed to be working at for the next hearing. We submitted our list of witnesses to Nadler the day before, Mr. Nadler, before the, the Schiff sent us, had, we submitted it before Schiff had sent us any more evidence. Last Monday, we had a hearing so Schiff's staff and Nadler's consultants could tell us that the president needs to be impeached. Again, nothing from Chairman Schiff, who had made the reference to himself being like Ken Starr. But for those in this room who have at least opened a history book, Ken Starr actually came and testified and took questions from everyone, including the White House counsel. On Monday, the chairman rejected our, all of our witnesses out of hand. And on Tuesday, the morning after the presentation of articles were unveiled. Remember, think about this. No factual base witnesses. We had a bunch of... Law professors, one for us. By the way, I did ask for another one. Didn't get it. No reasoning. We just went back, and we were in impeachment hearings, and we went back to the normal 3-1 ratio. I asked for one more and basically didn't get it, and it was an interesting conversation between the chairman and I. Didn't get it. Then we came in and got our witness list, summarily dismissed. We get information dumped to us in the middle of, of what we're supposed to be doing right before we're having to have hearings before we had to, after the fact, we had to turn on our witness list. <laughs> Judge, I don't think this would fly in any regular normal court proceeding, because I know this is not, so before anybody wants to tweet or say anything, we're not in a court, I know that. We're in a kangaroo court, it feels like, in this place, because all of this is backwards. What's up is down and down is up. We're more Alice in Wonderland than we are House of Representatives. Because whether you agree that he needs to be impeached or not, do you not think there needs to be a modicum of process and rights. All of this is true. The rules completely aside, the minority hearing day, broken. Access to committee records rule, broken. Due process rights for the accused in impeachment, completely out the window. Rules for decorum in debate, well, we've seen that broken even on the House floor. H. Red 660, the authorization for this whole thing, the chairman could have used it to run a fair process. Unfortunately, we didn't. The problem comes down today is there's several things, and I'm gonna leave you with, Mr. Chairman. 
And this is it. After all that has been said, all that's been talked about, and all that is well in that wonderfully written report, there's four facts that will never change. Both the President and Mr. Zelensky say there was no pressure. The call transcript shows no conditionality in aid and an investigation. By the way, Mr. Sondland, their key witness, the only thing they ever quote is his opening statement. They don't like to quote when he actually was questioned when he said, well, yeah, I presume that. And then when he talked about Mr. Yarmuk, Mr. Yarmuk said, we didn't have any conversation about conditionality of aid. That was just come out just the other day. I'm not sure where we're getting this, but it definitely wasn't a call transcript. Ukrainians were not aware the aid was withheld even when the, when the president spoke, and Ukrainians did not open investigations, didn't get a meeting, and still got their aid. But what did we see last week and over the past two weeks? We saw Mr. Zelensky, President Zelensky, pillared in our committee. He's either a liar, a pathological liar, according to the majority, or he is so weak he shouldn't be governing that country. That's tragic. We actually did that to this sitting leader, world leader, in our committee. These are the kind of things that bother many of us. But also, I know this is also on a clock and a calendar, too. We'll have a few hours here. We'll talk about it. But I will remind my majority friends, and I do consider you friends, the clock and the calendar are terrible masters, and they lead to awful results. And yes, there will be a day of reckoning. The calendar and the clock will continue. But what you do here and how we have trashed the process in getting here will live on and it will affect everything that we've come for. And so whatever you may gain will be short-lived because the clock and the calendar also recognize common sense, which has not been used in this proceeding. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you very much. Thank, I want to thank both of you for your opening statements. Um, <laughs> Uh, Mr. Collins, you, you raised the issue of why we're here in the Rules Committee today, um, and uh, let me just state for the record that, uh, as you know, the Constitution gives the House the sole power of impeachment and the power to determine its own rules. Um, you know, when President Nixon, uh, during uh, the time he was going to be impeached, uh, the Chairman of the Rules Committee, Chairman Madden, actually spoke on the House floor and announced that there would be a rule governing how that proceeding would move forward. When the Clinton articles of impeachment uh, were brought forward. There was a unanimous consent request uh, uh, to kind of govern how we conducted ourselves. And um, I'm not sure how likely it, it would be that we would get a unanimous consent request. I'd like to ask unanimous consent without objection to enter into a record a, a letter that was sent to the chairman of the Judiciary Committee signed by, I think, 70 Republican members, including the Kevin McCarthy, the Republican leader. and. <laughs> Uh, basically, and let me read the, the key line here, is we will avail ourselves of every parliamentary tool available to us in committee and on the House floor to highlight your inaction. Translated means to try to delay and to make this process uh, as impossible uh, as it can be made. Uh, I'm not sure, uh, in light of this letter, that we could get a unanimous consent request with regard to these proceedings to break for a cup of coffee, never mind, um, you know, determine... Uh, the rules of engagement. So I, I, I point that out. Uh, in terms of process, uh, I just want to, again, stay for the record because I think it's important um, that I think the House is engaged in a fair impeachment inquiry process. Uh, Democrats and Republicans have had equal opportunity to participate in the months-long uh, impeachment inquiry. Members of both parties have been involved at every stage in this process, from sitting in and asking questions in closed-door depositions to questioning witnesses in open hearings. Uh, the committees uh, took more than 100 hours of deposition testimony from 17 witnesses, held seven public hearings, which included Republican requested witnesses. They produced a 300-page public report that laid out their findings and evidence. The Judiciary Committee then took that report and conducted two public hearings evaluating the evidence and legal standard for impeachment before reporting the two articles uh, that we are dealing with here today. And I should also point out that President Trump was provided an opportunity to participate in the Judiciary Committee's review of the evidence presented against him, as President Clinton was during um, his impeachment inquiry. President Trump chose not to participate. President Trump, to date, has not provided any exculpatory evidence, but instead has blocked numerous witnesses from testifying uh, about his actions. Uh, and so um, I just thought it was important to point that out. Mr. Mr. Raskin, I, I saw you scribbling furiously while Mr. Uh, Collins was testifying. I don't know whether there is something that you wanted to respond to. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. You know, my friend Mr. Collins speaks very fast, so it's hard to keep up with everything that he's saying. Um, but it, a couple of things to... Slow as I've ever... 
<laughs> that, that's all right. I'm, I, I'm from Massachusetts, and people say the same thing about my accent. So. I, I give you credit that you were making an effort at the beginning, and so was I. So they accuse me of the same. Um, let, let, let me. Let me. He, he raises some really important points, and I, I'd love the chance to to briefly address them. Um, the one thing that we've been hearing is that we didn't charge crimes, and um, in some sense, um, that just uh, duplicates a basic confusion that people have about what the process is. Uh, we are not criminal prosecutors prosecuting a criminal defendant in court to send to jail. That's not what we're doing. We're members of Congress who are working to protect the country against a president who's committing high crimes and misdemeanors, that is, constitutional offenses against the people of the country. Now, lots of the conduct that we plead in our specific articles alleging abuse of power and obstruction of Congress themselves could become part of criminal indictments later on. But uh, it's been a curious thing for me to hear our colleagues across the aisle repeatedly make this point and kind of spread this confusion that they're not crimes in there, when they were the very first ones to be saying and continue to say the Department of Justice cannot prosecute the president. The president may not be indicted. The president may not be prosecuted while he's in office. That's the position they take. They then cannot turn around and say, oh, and you can't impeach him because you haven't charged him with any crimes and prosecuted him and indicted him. You see, heads I win, tails you lose is the essence of that argument. And of course, if you go back to the, the Richard Nixon case, we didn't have to see that Richard Nixon had been convicted of burglary in the District of Columbia by ordering the break-in to the Watergate Hotel before he, was accused, before he was charged with abuse of power as a high crime and misdemeanor. That's exactly what we're charging President Trump with here. We don't have to first go out and prove that he committed bribery or committed uh, honest services fraud or committed extortion, all things that he really could be prosecuted for later. We simply have to allege the, the course of constitutional criminal conduct he was engaged in. And so I think that we can set that one aside. Um, a second thing that, um, that my friend said was that there were no fact witnesses, um, that, uh, that this was based on the report that was delivered to us by the House Committee on Intelligence. And of course, that's a play on words too. There were 17 fact witnesses um, who appeared before the House Committee on Intelligence, the House Oversight Committee, and the House Foreign Affairs <coughs> Committee. The way that we structured this impeachment process, which is completely our prerogative under Article 1, Section 2, Clause 5, as you said, uh, Mr. Chairman, is to have the fact investigation into this affair, which involved foreign governments and ambassadors and so on, in the Intelligence Committee, then to have them bring the facts in a comprehensive report to the House Judiciary Committee, which would then make the decision about the law. Do all of these events rise to what we think is uh, impeachable conduct? And of course, uh, we did. So there are lots of fact witnesses. The fact, uh, we, we also had the counsel for the House Intelligence Committee come into to deliver the report and defend the report. And all of my friends on the other side of the aisle had the chance uh, to question, as we had the chance to question, when you say there were no fact witnesses, that's also a perfect description of what took place during the Bill Clinton impeachment. Because all of that took place as part of uh, the uh, independent counsel investigation by Kenneth Starr. There were closed door, secret depositions taking place there. Then Kenneth Starr came to deliver the report, and remember all the boxes of material they brought over in a U-Haul truck, and gave it to the House Judiciary Committee. That was the end of it. Monica Lewinsky didn't testify before the House Judiciary Committee. There were not witnesses who had been there who were brought before the House Judiciary Committee. So we're following the exact same pattern, I think, that took place there, except that it was the House of Representatives here which did its own fact investigation through this assortment of committees. Uh, finally, um, the, um, well, the, uh, let me just say a word about the fairness of the process. And, uh, you know, um, we, we all know what they teach you in law school, which is if uh, the facts are against you, you pound the law. If the laws are against you, you pound the facts. If the law and the facts are against you, you talk about process and you pound the table. And I'm afraid I've seen a little bit of that in the uh, performance of our colleagues here. And I don't blame them because they're dealing with the hand that they were dealt 
we have 17 fact witnesses and all of their depositions and all their testimony was published in all part of the report. Everybody, uh, everybody can find it. And all of their testimony is essentially unrefuted and uncontradicted. It tells one story, which is the president of the United States conducted a shakedown of a foreign power. He used $391 million that we in Congress had voted for a besieged, struggling democracy, Ukraine, to defend itself against Russian invasion and attack, to coerce that, the president of that foreign government, President Zelensky, to get involved in our election campaign. What did he want him to do? <coughs> well, he wanted President Zelensky to make an announcement on television that Joe Biden was being investigated. Now, what does that have to do with the foreign policy of the United States? What does it have to do with what Congress voted for? What does it have to do with any legitimate interest of the US government? Mm -hmm. But the other thing that he wanted President Zelensky to do was to rehabilitate the completely discredited conspiracy theory that it was Ukraine and not Russia that had interfered in our election. Our entire intelligence community, the NSA, the CIA, the FBI, the Senate Committee on Intelligence issued a report about this. All of them say the same thing, which is that it was Russia that conducted what the Department of Justice called a sweeping and systematic campaign against our election in 2016. You remember, Mr. Chairman, they injected propaganda into our polity through social media, Facebook and Twitter and so on. They directly conducted cyber invasion and attack and espionage against the Democratic National Committee, the DCCC, Hillary Clinton's headquarters. And they directly tried to get into our state boards of elections. Not two or three, all 50 of them they tried to get into. That's what Russia did. And now suddenly we have the President of the United States telling uh, President Zelensky that if he wants the $391 million that we voted for him, and that he's been certified for by the Department of Defense and the Department of State, clearing every anti-corruption screen that had been put in place and called for by Congress, if he wants the money, and if he wants the White House meeting that he desperately wanted to show that America was on Ukraine's side and not Russia's side, if he wanted to get that stuff, he had to come and get involved in our presidential campaign, and he had to rehabilitate this discredited story about 2016. Yield back. Well, um, thank you. Um, you know, I, I think I've been listening to some of the commentary and the news from some of the pundits, and sometimes I, I think people need a lesson in constitutional law. That's why it's great that you're here. I mean, let, me, let me ask you a basic question, because I think sometimes people don't understand this. Why is impeachment in the Constitution? Oh, that's a great question. And uh, Mr. Collins uh, uh, invoked indirectly uh, my favorite American revolutionary, Tom Paine, who, of course, wrote Common Sense and The Age of Reason. And he said, you can't have one without the other. In other words, you need the common sense of the people, and you need people to be conducting things according to reason, rationality, facts empiricism, science. But why did Paine come all the way over here to participate in the American Revolution, which was not foreordained to win in any way? Because America was the first nation in history born out of a revolutionary struggle against monarchy, against the idea that you could have hereditary rule. Paine said, a hereditary, a hereditary ruler is as ridiculous as a hereditary mathematician or a hereditary artist, right? He said, the people have got to decide on their own leaders. Now, impeachment is an instrument that our founders put into the Constitution informed by the British experience. There was impeachment that Parliament had, but it wasn't against the king. It was only against royal ministers. Why? Because of the British doctrine, the king can do no wrong. Right? That's kind of like, the king can do whatever he wants. The king can do no wrong, and therefore the king couldn't be impeached. But our founders insisted that impeachment be in there, not just for other civil officers who might commit high crimes and misdemeanors against the people, but against the president himself. And of course, the president in the Domestic Emoluments Clause is limited to a fixed salary in office, which can be neither increased nor decreased by Congress, and he can't receive any other emoluments from the government itself, and any other payments, the president is effectively an employee of the American people. That's the way he's designed. He's not above the people. He's a servant of the people like all of us are. And the president's core job is what? To take care that the laws are faithfully executed. 
And if he doesn't faithfully execute the laws, if he thwarts the laws, if he tramples the laws, and he commits crimes against the American people, then we're not going to send him to prison. He's not going to go to jail for one day, but he needs to be removed in order to protect democracy. And for the record, why is abuse of power an impeachable offense? Well, abuse of power is the essential impeachment offense. That's why it's in there. What, it, what it's about is elevating the personal interests and ambitions of the president above the common good, above the rule of law, and above the Constitution. And so the, the founders didn't want a president who was going to behave like a king. We'd seen enough of that. We wanted a president who was going to implement the laws, go out and you know, implement right. the Affordable Care Act and implement the environmental law. So that's your job. You know, that, that's what you're supposed to be doing. And, and so we've seen evidence that the president decided to withhold from Ukraine important official acts, uh, the White House visit, military aid, in order to pressure Ukraine to announce investigations of Vice President Biden and the 2016 elections. Why does that constitute an impeachable offense? Um, so, um, well, it basically implicates every single one of the concerns that were raised by the founders at the Constitutional Convention. One, it places the personal political agenda and ambitions of the president over enforcing the laws and enforcing the rule of law. Two, it drags foreign powers into our election. That was something that the framers were terrified about. There was a, uh, a great exchange between uh, Adams and Jefferson about just this issue, that there would be constant foreign intrigue and influence, attempts to come and influence because we would be an open democracy and so people would try to exploit our openness by getting involved in our elections with their foreign government concerns, which is why the president had to have complete undivided loyalty to the American people and to the American Constitution and not get involved with foreign governments, not drag foreign governments into our affairs. So basically, you have everything the framers were concerned about tied up into one bundle here, which is uh, involving foreign governments in our elections, placing uh, the, the president's interests uh, over, all of, over everything else, and then essentially uh, threatening the rule of the people in democracy. And, 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 and where do you draw the line between a legitimate use of presidential power and an abuse of power? I mean, and, and why is it significant that President Trump acted for his personal political advantage and not for the furtherance of any valid national policy objective? Well, that's a great question because our colleagues have shrewdly zeroed in on the fact uh, that some of the witnesses, including uh, Ambassador Sondland, said, well, of course there was a quid pro quo. The president was not going to release the, uh, the aid. He was not going to have the meeting until he got what he wanted in terms of political interference. And then even the president's White House chief of staff said, yes, of course there was a quid pro quo. I'm not quoting directly, so I don't have the exact words, but he's saying, yes, this is, this is the way we proceed. Get used to it. Okay. And our colleagues have said, well, there's always quid pro quos tied up in foreign policy. In other words, it's legit to say to a foreign government, um, we will give you this aid if you comply that the aid is all being used in the proper way. We will give you this assistance if you attend these conferences and meetings with us to make sure that the assistance is being used properly and so on. There's nothing wrong with that. But look at what happened here. This was, this was an arrangement where the president conditioned all of this uh, foreign assistance that we had sent, $200 million to the Department of Defense, $191 million to the Department of State to help Ukraine defend itself against Russia. Um, and the president said, but, I, uh, but what he was holding out for was the interference of the Ukrainian president in our election mm -hmm. to harm his political opponent. And I think everyone can recognize that is not the normal kind of push and pull and arrangements that nations make for each other. Why? Because the president privileged his own political interests, and that's why it was all done uh, secretly. Uh, luckily, there were witnesses who were willing to come forward and to explain what happened. And Mr. Collins, I'll ask you and Mr. Eskin the same question. I mean, was the president's call with President Zelensky perfect, as the uh, president has said? And was it appropriate for him to ask another country to investigate an American citizen. I find there was nothing I've said this before. There's nothing wrong with the call. And then when you look at it, and again, I'm frankly the last. The problem we're having right now is, is exactly the last 15 minutes of this. Great oratory on a lot of things that mean nothing to this actual impeachment. I mean, it, it, we get down to the bottom line here, and and, and I'm just leave it at that. Let him answer that question. I'll get back to it later because 
everything that's been thrown out here is exactly what the problem we've had in, in the discussion. And this idea of throwing law and fact, we've disproven the facts. We've talked about the law. Law wasn't broken. They didn't put it in the, the Constitution. So I'm not, I can yell on both of them. I can talk about both of them. Wait, wait, the problem wait. we have here is, is this is the very problem we have. And I'll just address one thing before I let it back. Or, or if you want me to switch right now, I will. No, I mean, that's okay. fine. Ms. Ms. I'll give it to him. I mean, yeah, oh, that's fine. I mean, I'm, I'm looking at, you know, the president and the transcripts. I would like you to do us a favor, though. I mean, I... Do you think it was a perfect call? I well, mean, Lieutenant uh, Colonel Vinman actually said it was perfectly okay for the president to ask for a political uh, call, and I can actually say it was in his testimony. And, you, yeah. and do you think it's so appropriate? So he for said, a, Lieutenant Colonel Vinman said, would it ever be, it was asked, would it ever be U.S. policy in your experience to ask a foreign leader to open a political investigation? He replied, certainly, the president is well within his right to do that. I mean, do you think it's right for the president to be, ask a foreign government to investigate a U.S. citizen like that? No, I think it's absolutely wrong. And, you know, one of the interesting things about the hearings, of course, was that that every single uh, I think every single member of Congress who has at least endorsed the impeachment inquiry has said that it's completely wrong for uh, the U.S. president to use any of the means at his disposal to drag foreign governments into our election. And we were unable to get our colleagues on the Judiciary Committee to weigh in on that, saying, let's assume that you think, let's stipulate you think that the president did nothing wrong here. Do you think it's wrong for the president of the United States to get foreign powers involved in an election? And... We couldn't get an answer. I reissue the invitation to Mr. Collins because I, I believe that in his heart he thinks that's wrong. And I certainly would not, not want that to become the pattern for all future presidencies. I think the interesting thing here is, Mr. Chairman, if I could, I, would, I don't want this to become the pattern for future impeachments. I think this is the problem I have. And, and, and the understanding here is I guess it's okay, though, to uh, get involved in a, in a 2016 election when you pay a third party to go uh, pay for a dossier. I mean, these are the kind of things that we can talk about, but the interesting issue that is just discussed here is exactly where we are right now in a question and a comment, because the, the, what Mr. Raskin just brought up is an interesting point. So is it okay if you're running for president that you can't be investigated, even if you did something overseas? So if you were running for president and you did something overseas, it would be, a, it would be off limits according to Mr. Raskin's argument for the United States government to investigate that. That's the argument he just set up. I think you need to be very careful with that argument. Uh, I appreciate, I, I, I guess, the, the, again, I mentioned this in my opening statement, the frustrating thing is that it's hard, I mean, I would seem so obvious to so many of us about inappropriate behavior, we can't even get, I mean, I, I look at, uh, you know, uh, our, our former colleague, Charlie Dent, uh, says he spoke with Republicans who were absolutely disgusted and exhausted by the president's behavior. Another former Republican colleague of ours, David Jolly, said we've witnessed, quote, an impeachable moment. Uh, former Republican Congressman Reed Ribble of Wisconsin said clearly there was some type of quid pro quo. When asked if he believes the testimony presented Warren's impeachment, he said, I do. Former South Carolina Republican Bob Inglis, who served on the Judiciary Committee during the Clinton uh, impeachment, said last month in a tweet, without a doubt, if Barack Obama had done the things revealed in the testimony in the, in the current inquiry, we Republicans would have impeached him. Joe Scarborough, a former Republican congressman from Florida, said every Republican knows that Donald Trump was asking for dirt on Joe Biden in exchange for releasing military funds. I mean, I, 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 I get, well, let's, let's go on to, um, I don't know, do you want to respond, Mr. Raskin? Sure, I'd be delighted to. But one thing, I, I've just passed a note saying I may have gotten the numbers wrong. The Department of Defense uh, had a $250 million um, appropriation for the purposes of aiding Ukraine, and the state had $141 million. I may have... He's spoken and said 200 okay. um, but, but, you know, as to that point, um, I, again, I, I feel for my friends because I think they're put into a situation, put into a box, so to speak, which was what uh, uh, President uh, Trump was quoted as saying about what he wanted to do with President Zelensky. He wanted him in a, a box about these statements. But I think they're put into something of a corner here because the president has declared his conduct perfect, absolutely perfect, and he can do whatever he wants. And so they are unable to say, to make the case that I would make, is if, I, if I were trying to defend the president, I would say, okay, that was totally wrong and off limits, but it's not impeachable for X, Y, and Z reasons. But they're not allowing anybody that space to say it. They must go with the president's assertion that this was categorically correct. There was nothing wrong with it. It was perfectly right. And, you know, he quoted legal scholars. He didn't name them, but he invoked legal scholars who told him that, the call was perfect as well. And I, I, I kind of want to move my question along here a little bit. So uh, uh, let, me, let me ask you on the issue of obstruction of Congress. Why is obstruction of Congress an impeachable offense? 
Well, look, and it, this is something, um, the, Mr. Collins made a really important point, which is that we've got to think about this in institutional terms, okay? And he rightly calls us to redouble our commitment to fairness in the process. I've seen lots of fairness in this process. I've seen the, in, in the closed door depositions, I saw the Democratic Council get an hour. I saw the Republican Council get an hour. I saw the Democratic members get to question. I saw the Republican members get to question. I have seen this committee bend over backwards to, to get all of the depositions out as quickly as possible, while the President of the United States is, is stopping at least uh, seven witnesses from coming forward. Uh, it, it may be more than that, but he has blockaded Where's witnesses. That? The President, who says the process is unfair, is the one who's stopping everybody from coming to testify and uh, is essentially trying to blockade the whole investigation. Look, why is this essential, Mr. Chairman? It's essential because for institutional reasons. It's essential for institutional reasons because in the future, it might be a majority Democratic Congress, it might be a majority Republican Congress, but in any event, it's Congress. And one of our jobs is, as members of Congress is to make sure that the president does not violate the laws. We're supposed to stand sentinel uh, to make sure that the president will only enforce the laws, take care that the laws are faithfully executed. Well, what happens if you get a president who totally trashes the law, okay? Some of us think we may be there now. Uh, I know some of our colleagues don't believe that, but certainly they can imagine a situation where a president advertises spectacular disrespect and contempt for the law and trashes the law. What is our ultimate check against that? It's going to be impeachment. That's why it's in the Constitution. But now we have a president who, for the first time in American history, says, I am going to try to block the ability of Congress to impeach me by not turning over one single document, by trying to hold back people from testifying, like Secretary Pompeo, like Chief of Staff uh, Mick Mulvaney, like multiple other members of the administration, I don't want them to come forward to testify. And so we're gonna have to use our common sense to derive conclusions about what that means. Uh, what, what does our common sense tell us when you have all these other people are coming forward and testifying about the misconduct of the president, and then the president trying to block everybody else from coming forward to testify in his administration. And let me just point out for the record, um, we have requested several documents and testimony from members of this administration. Uh, and what has the president and his administration done in response? Nothing. It just, I think it's important for people to understand, just for the record, requests for documents from the State Department, ignored. Requests for documents from the Department of Defense, ignored. Requests for documents from the Vice President, ignored. Requests for documents from Giuliani Associate Lev Parnas, ignored. Requests from documents from Giuliani Associate Igor Fruman, ignored. Requests from documents from the White House, ignored. Requests from documents from Rudy Giuliani, the President's lawyer, ignored. Requests from testimony of, of former National Security Advisor John Bolton, ignored. Requests from the testimony of White House Chief of Staff Mick Mulvaney, ignored. And you know, here's a list of all the requests that have been made. The, the red marks are basically to demonstrate noncompliance, that they have been ignored. Um, I think this is what you call obstruction, plain and simple. Uh, and in fact, the only people that have complied with our requests have been patriotic public servants, many of them defying instructions uh, that they not comply. Um, and um, I mean, I, I guess I'd just ask, you know, what presumptions should we make when the president, when the president prevents witness from, witnesses from complying with congressional subpoenas? Well, let's use our common sense. Um, people who have exculpatory evidence, which is just a fancy way of saying evidence that shows their innocence, want the court to see the evidence. People who have evidence that demonstrates their innocence would bring that to Congress. People who have evidence which they think may be inculpatory, people who have evidence which may lead people to believe in their guilt, will try to keep it away. But you just make a really profoundly important point, Mr. Chairman, which link Articles 1 and Article 2 of the impeachment articles. Do we want to set a president that people, that US citizens can become president of the United States by inviting foreign powers to get involved in our election? Then once they're in, if Congress decides that their conduct is impeachable and involves high crimes and misdemeanors, they can then pull a curtain down over the executive branch and not allow any investigation, not allow subpoenas to be honored and so on. That is a very dangerous prospect that would have terrified and horrified and shocked the framers of our Constitution. 
Thank you. And I, you, you want to, do you have these? Are we, are, no. Okay. I, I'm, <laughs> well, I'm about to, I'm about to yield to my, uh, to the, uh, my ranking member, who I'm sure has lots and lots of questions. But I, I do, I do want to take a moment. I think it's important um, that uh, we remember this. I want to remind everybody why we're here today. The president abused the power of his office for his own personal gain and obstructed a congressional investigation to look into that conduct. How did he do that? He withheld aid for a country that was under siege by Russia to leverage help for his political campaign. President Trump's abuse of power has endangered our free elections and national security and remains an ongoing threat to them both. He showed us a pattern of inviting foreign interference uh, in our elections and, is, and trying to cover it up twice. And he's threatened to do it again. Uh, with the 2020 elections fast appro approaching, we must act with a sense of urgency to protect our democracy and defend our Constitution. You know, our, 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 on our first day as members of Congress, we took an oath to support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic. Uh, I did not swear allegiance to a political party. I swore allegiance to the Constitution, and I hope all my colleagues will do the same. Uh, with that, I would yield to the ranking member, Mr. Cole, for any questions he may have. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And you're right, I do have a lot of questions, and I appreciate your forbearance because it's a I'm, I'm very li liberal. Yeah, yes, you Especially are. Right. And uh, yeah. in this sense, in the finest sense yeah. of the word. So I, I express my appreciation for that ahead of time as we've discussed. And uh, to my friend, Mr. Raskin, um, a number of my questions have been crafted or were originally crafted for Chairman Nadler. Uh, you may or may not be able to answer those directly. We certainly understand why he's not here, and we, as the chairman said, we sympathize with him in the difficult time. But we think they're still important for the record. But I appreciate I just wanted, wanted to so, sort of highlight that for you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I asked unanimous consent to enter into the record a document entitled, quote, How We Resist Trump, unquote, authored by Congressman Jerry Nadler and posted uh, uh, on www.jerrynadler.com on November 16th of 2016. Without, without objection. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. In this document, Chairman Nadler wrote, quote, we cannot wait four years to vote Mr. Trump out of office, so we must do everything we can to stop Trump and his extreme agenda now, unquote. Mr. Raskin, on August 8th, Chairman Nadler stated with respect to the Judiciary Committee's hearing, regarding the Mueller report that, quote, uh, this is a formal impeachment proceedings. Uh, but the House, un unquote, but the House did not actually authorize impeachment proceedings until the adoption of H. Res. 660 on October 31st. So I believe it's important to clarify for the record when formal impeachment proceedings actually started. Is Chairman Nadler correct when he said uh, they started on August 8th, or did they begin when the House authorized them? on October 31st. Okay. Um, forgive me, Ms. Cole, I was not actually prepared to answer that question, but I think that uh, the Judiciary Committee has taken formal positions which we can track about this question. I would just direct you to, uh, again, Article 1, Section 2, Clause 5. The House of Representatives has the sole power of impeachment and can design and structure impeachment as it sees fit. Well, it's... Uh, Mr. Cole, could I just say, not, I outside of, not outside of House rules, they can't. Not without passing a resolution that then gives them power and authority that goes outside of House rules. That's the problem we had with this early on, is they were going outside of House rules. And again, when councils are not, you know, been here forever, they're trying to make this happen. This is what happened this year. They went outside of House rules. So that's, that's the problem I've had with this, and we can discuss that more in depth. Well, I think the spirit uh, behind this suggests that this has been going on for quite some time longer than the formal proceedings. Uh, Mr. Craston, on December 10th, 1998, during the Clinton impeachment proceedings, Chairman Nadler stated uh, in the House Judiciary Committee that, quote, there must never be a narrowly voted impeachment or an impeachment supported by one of our major political parties and opposed by another. Such an impeachment will produce divisiveness and bitterness in politics for years to come and will call into question the very legitimacy of our political institutions. Uh, do you believe that this impeachment, which is supported by only one political party, has produced bitterness in the current political climate? So, well, the, I'm, again, I'm going to have to allow the Chairman Nadler to speak for his own words. But I certainly understand. Yeah, I, so, um, look, there, there's been a lot of bitterness and division in our country uh, for several years now preceding 
um, any impeachment proceedings, and it's a sad thing, and I hope that everybody rallies around the Constitution because it's the Constitution that will get us through this difficult time um, in our history. And let me just say about you know, the, the, the Clinton impeachment, um, so the, the conduct that President Clinton was charged with, which was um, he hadn't been convicted or prosecuted for perjury, but he was, he was uh, essentially charged with perjuring himself uh, in describing uh, private conduct, a sexual affair. And um, the conduct that we're looking at today um, goes right to the heart of why impeachment is in the Constitution. Impeachment is in the Constitution because of public offenses by political leaders against democracy itself. So I think you cannot compare what President Clinton uh, was impeached for by the House of Representatives, and I hold no brief for his conduct in any way, but I don't think you can compare that to the massive, overwhelming, and unrefuted evidence we have that the President of the United States today has tried to drag a foreign power into our elections to his own political advantage. It wasn't exactly the question I asked, but uh, let me turn to Mr. Collins and see if you agree with Mr. Raskin, if there's anything you would disagree with there, and what's been the impact of this process on the, the domestic politics of the country, since it has been essentially partisan in nature. Uh, well. Look, not trying to, you know, and again, I'll, I'll cut some slack that he was trying to answer for a chairman's own words, and, and, and I get that. But I think there's several things. That's, let's just talk here for just a minute. Let's, let's, let's unpack what has happened here, because the only thing I appreciate really out of the whole last few minutes was the chairman trying to bring it into about impeachment. I agree with him on to that point that this is about impeachment. Uh, what I disagree is it's not about abuse of power. It's not everything else. And it would come a lot better from the majority if they have not had a long history, a written record. This is something that you love to see in the law because it's a written record of motive. You've seen it since the day that he was elected. You've seen it in this whole process working out. You saw it last year when my chairman ran for the job because he would be the best for impeachment. What was hanging out last year for impeachment? What became a, a Mueller report that didn't give them everything they wanted. And then we came into a call. This is, this is a pattern. And look, you, I, I've said this to, to my chairman who I respect. You've got the votes. You just voted. You've got the votes. You didn't go explain it to the American people. Talk about, talk about afflicting an election. This is what, what we're looking at. But there are also a few things here, though, that is interesting. As I said earlier on, time and clock are terrible masters. And I've heard it so many times from the, from the chairman of this committee, the chairman of my committee, and others. We've got to do this because of the 2020 election. Well, put a candidate up that's worth voting for. How about that? Instead of going after a president who you're having trouble beating because of the things that have happened in our country with unemployment, with the economy going good, and everything else. That's what political uh, primaries are for. Not this. When you look back, and, and I get, still never got an answer to my question I had just a few minutes ago about have we now set a standard that if you run for president, you can do anything you want to overseas and not get investigated for it? Not got that question answered. But in response to also the chairman's question about uh, requesting stuff, as the chairman knows, and also my chairman knows because my chairman likes subpoenas. He likes to threaten them anyway. Um, but the Secretary of Defense responded. He said it was open to negotiation for you. The Secretary of State, part of the document dump uh, was part of that. And the House Judiciary Committee, the dump that we did get from the Intelligence Committee, had OMB records from the Budget Committee in it. I mean, there are issues here that, that I have had problems with all year in this. And, you know, if you didn't receive a letter, as we have done in the past when we were in a majority under President Obama, and President Obama in Fast and Furious and other times, the thing that amazes me is that it seems like the majority this year all of a sudden discovered that the executive branch and the, and the legislative branch don't play well together in the sandbox. This is not a shock for any of us who've been here under the Obama administration. We saw this happen over and over. I was on oversight my first two years here. My former legislative director is here. She's in the room. We pulled our hair out of this. This was at IRS. We had everything else, and we was constantly being stonewalled and stopped, had to actually issue subpoenas, in which finally the courts did rule and they'll think this is your problem. The courts ruled many years later that, that Attorney General Holder did violate, you know, not giving the information out. And that was actually done. But it was many years later. And again, your time and clock is at calendar is a terrible master. And you're having to do this because you promised it. You promised it. This is, we're carrying through on a promise here. You know, the other thing is we talk about fairness here. 
that, that my friend said that, oh, this has been completely fair. I, nobody's questioned the fact that our folks got to question a witness. Nobody's questioned that fact. They call, but what about the fact of uh, the majority preventing witnesses under rules from using agency counsel, even under the auspices of, a, of an impeachment investigation? How about cutting off Republican questions and refusing to allow uh, the third branch on, to even rule on claims of privilege when one was actually done? You actually withdrew from the, the lawsuit. So again, it's not a matter of time here. It's not a matter of facts. Again, when we go back to it, I can't not repeat this over and over again because it comes up with Mr. Rassi, it's come up with the chairman, it'll come up again many other times. Put pressure on a world leader. I, I, folk, this pressure is, is amazing to me because the guy who was supposed to be pressured denied it ever happened. On multiple occasions, one of his own members of cabinet said, we never talked about conditionality. Yarmick said, we never talked about conditionality of aid. The only times that they talk about this outside of presumption and hearsay, presumption and hearsay, their main witness, Sondland, said it was presumption. Oh, that's what I presume. Because when he actually asked the president straight up, what do you want? He said, I want nothing. I just want him to do what he, what he promised and he ran on. That's all he did. So it's presumption and hearsay. And granted, this is not a court of law because believe me, this would have been over a long time ago. We wouldn't have gotten to this place. The rules have allowed it to get to this place because majority rules in this, in this place. But here's the problem. The pressure issue is sad because, again, to continue this line of thought after the president of the Ukraine has came out and denied it and denied it and denied it and denied it, you're either calling him a pathological liar, a world leader, or you're calling him, as was actually, he was actually called in our committee last week, a battered wife. He was actually called that compared to a battered wife. How low have we sunk? This is the problem because at the end of the day, and we can go into the process files, we can go into everything else, but you know something, I, I made, I don't say it's a mistake, but I took my own chairman at his word when I read about his comments from 20 years ago when he said the Judiciary Committee should never take a report from a third party and actually not try to investigate it itself. Otherwise, we become a rubber stamp. Congratulations. Our Judiciary Committee became a rubber stamp. I hope we recover. Because that's all we're doing right now, is just rubber stamping what Adam Schiff did under his own rules, under his own time frame, under his own ways. Again, a man who has also been out for this president since day one and would not come and testify. That's the most amazing, shocking thing to me in this whole process. But when you understand where we're at here, I can understand why Mr. Raskin, who is eloquent in his discussion of Constitution and why we have an impeachment, let's just cut to the fact. You don't like the guy. You don't like the conversation, you don't like how he does business, because at the end of the day, when you start talking about the pressure on a foreign power to do something for you personally, again, or to, to even get to that remotely, you're having to change words in the transcript. Instead of do us a favor for our country, do us, you have to change it to me. You have to change the facts. And the last time I checked, this country is not real kind to those who are accused having those who are in power change the rules to fit their game. That's not due process. But I'm going to go back over it because the chairman actually said, here's why we're here. There are four facts that never change. Four facts that will never change. And it goes straight to the heart of anything he said outside of abuse power or anything else. There's no pressure, President Trump, President Zelensky. The transcript shows no conditionality of aid and an investigation. And the only one relied upon over 600 times in the uh, Intelligence Committee report was Mr. Sondland, who after he got past his perfect... Uh, opening statement when questioned said, well, that's what I presumed it to be. And then when actually talked to the President of the United States, he was told, no, all I want him is to do his job, nothing else. And then when he actually said I had a conversation with Mr. Yarmouk, Mr. Yarmouk said there was nothing discussed of conditionality. So how do you put this much faith in Mr. Sondland when he has conditionally told stories that change? And all of the rest were hearsay. All of the rest were actually going off of other things. And even the Colonel Vindman, who, is, who I respect as a, as a soldier, actually said when the question was asked, is it okay to have this call? Said, yes, it's okay for a president can do that, to ask for a political investigation because it happens. And he even said that. So the question comes back, the Ukrainians were not even aware their aid was withheld. And the Ukrainians didn't open an investigation to get the money. Let me ask you, is this uh, the first partisan impeachment inquiry in the nation's history? Yes. Has the president ever been impeached without votes from a minority party before? Um, I think there was, uh, there was some discussion about that with the Johnson impeachment from many years ago, but that was also when the Congress itself set him up with a law. So I think you have to say that was an impeachment. This is a, in a, in a modern-day era, this is a partisan impeachment.
In March of this year, Speaker Pelosi said impeachment must be, quote, compelling and overwhelmingly bipartisan. Only Democrats voted to authorize the impeachment inquiry. There's bipartisan opposition to the inquiry, and it appears there'll be bipartisan opposition to the articles. Uh, Ranking Member Collins, given uh, all of that, do you believe the upcoming vote on HRS uh, 755 comports with the standards set by the Speaker herself? No, it comes nowhere close. Is your belief that the meeting an arbitrary deadline is more important to the Democratic majority than building a viable case uh, if, in fact, there is cause for impeachment? Their own words convict them of that. The uh, premise uh, of these articles of impeachment rests on a pause placed on Ukrainian security assistance. A pause, by the way, of less than two months, 55 days, I believe. Democrats have spun creative narratives as to the meaning and the motive of this pause, but offered no factual evidence. Did Ukraine ever initiate investigations into the Bidens? No. Uh, was the aid ultimately released? Yes. Do you believe the taxpayer dollars of the American people were well served by the pause? They were. In fact, the president himself, not policymakers, not uh, administrative officials in different offices are not the ones who have final authority to decide if, if that is going to be. That's the president's call. It's the president's decision. And he made a call. Is it unusual for aid to be paused on by chief executive? No. Uh, did the Democratic majority subpoena all core witnesses with firsthand evidence on any potential quid pro quo with the Ukrainian controversy? No. Has anyone in the Trump administration been charged with or convicted of a crime under the current allegations related to the Ukraine? No. Now, let me continue. It's uh, my understanding that the minority properly exercised its right under Clause 2J1 of Rule uh, 11 uh, to demand a minority hearing. Is that the case? That is correct. What day did you ask for that hearing? We asked for it on the first day of our when we convened in the Judiciary Committee. I believe that was Mr. December 4th. I don't remember the dates in front of me. I December have it 4th. right in front of Good. me, so I'll uh, be happy to provide that. Uh, has that hearing been scheduled? No, it was summarily dismissed by the long letter, which uh, was told that, in essence, that it was dilatory. I've never seen a, a minority hearing called dilatory. Uh, on the very first day, this request could have been made. Mr. Raskin, are you familiar with the following statement? The minority is entitled to one additional day of related hearings at which to call their own witnesses if a majority of the minority members make their demand before the committee's hearing is gavel closed. I believe I think uh, Mr. Collins invoked that at our hearing. So you are familiar with yeah, that? Yeah, I'm just familiar from that. I actually, I wasn't aware of it before that. A statement's posted on the Rules Majority website in a document entitled, quote, House Rules Which Govern the Committee Hearing Process, unquote. Uh, based on review of the hearing video, the minority properly presented their request to Chairman Nadler before the original hearing uh, concluded. Uh, are you familiar with a memo written by former, uh, Mr. Raskin, I'm sorry, I should have made that clear by former Rules Committee Chairman David Dreyer regarding the application of the House rule governing uh, minority hearing days? No. Okay. Uh, Chairman McGovern, I ask unanimous consent that this memo be made part of the record uh, and will note that the memo states in part that a point of order may lie against the reported measure in which the minority's demand for a hearing was improperly rejected. Without objection, and I'll ask unanimous consent if I can, to also insert in the record uh, our response to your letter, and we could talk about that after your question. Yes, certainly appropriate. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, during the markup of HRS 755, Chairman Nadler overruled the ranking member's point of order against consideration of the resolution and interpreting that the rule requires that the minority hearing day occur prior to the consideration of the relevant measure or matter uh, would permit the minority to improperly de delay Proceedings. Were you trying to improperly delay proceedings, Mr. Collins? No, I was actually at one point in these uh, hearings actually have a proper following of rules. So, uh, again, this you made this request the very first day of hearing. Is that correct? We did. Okay, the hearing at which the demand was uh, properly made was entitled in part, quote, the impeachment inquiry of Donald J. Trump, unquote. My colleagues on the other side of the aisle have offered a number of reasons why Chairman Nadler's refusal to schedule the minority hearings appropriate. I'd like to take a moment to respond to those. 
My colleagues claim that the legislative history of the rule suggests that it was designed as a backstop to ensure the minority gets at least one witness at a hearing. I do not find this reasoning to be compelling. If that indeed was the purpose of the rule, the plain reading of the text and reason itself would say otherwise. While traditionally it's been used as a negotiating point between the majority and minority regarding the number of witnesses, the mere fact that the minority has a witness at a hearing does not mean that there's an implicit waiver of the right to demand a minority day hearing. Uh, there are times in which the minority waives the right to a majority day hearing. For example, our discussions regarding Med Medicare for All hearing, we waived that right uh, to a minority day hearing in order to secure two more witnesses. Um, Mr. Collins, at any time, did you waive your rights under Clause 2J1 of Rule 11? No, I did not. And I believe that's why we're here today, actually. Yeah. Did you request a second witness day, and did they provide that second witness, uh, or, or second witness, excuse me, and did they provide that second witness in exchange for waiving your rights for a minority day hearing? No, it was not even discussed. Okay. My colleagues on the other side of the aisle have previously quoted Joint Committee on Organization of Congress uh, 1966 recommendations, which stated that a minimum safeguard be established for, quote, those infrequent incidents when a witness representing the minority position are not allotted time. Perhaps in 1966, the majority was more willing to provide witnesses to the minority. However, that's not the case today. Witness uh, was allotted time in this case, uh, but not witnesses. In other words, we didn't get anything in exchange for our right not being exercised. And while this may uh, have been one reason for the adoption of the minority hearing, Day provision, it doesn't render meaningless the plain reading of the text. So uh, we spent a lot of time on this, but we think it's uh, very important. We simply weren't given something that uh, we think by, you know, by right we should have had and uh, would actually subject this to a point of order. My colleagues also claim that Chairman Nadler is not required to schedule the minority hearing day before the matter is reported out of committee. you got to be kidding. In other words, <laughs> We cannot agree that the House intended that the right for the minority hearing day can be fulfilled by scheduling a hearing on a measure after the measures voted out of the full committee. I mean, that just doesn't make any sense. So, Mr. Collins, with the presumed passage of these articles of impeachment, isn't the minority hearing day now irrelevant? I believe it is, and I believe that's the concern that many of us have who institutionally love this place. Okay, Mr. Raskin, uh, even if Chairman Nadler didn't believe the House rules required him to schedule the minority hearing a day prior to marking up the articles of impeachment, as a member of both Judiciary Committee and Rules Committee, wouldn't you agree that it would have been better for the institution and the American people uh, to prevent all this disagreement, partisan rancor, just to schedule the hearing? It's just one day. Thank you, Mr. Cole. Um, Again, I just learned of it the other day when Mr. Collins raised it, and I, I looked at the rule, and the rule does say that the chair of the committee is not required to schedule the minority hearing as a condition precedent to the continuing course of legislative action. Um, <coughs> and I, I, having been in the minority for my first term here, I, I feel your exasperation about that, that it might not happen before uh, the bill passes, and if we want to make a change to that rule, I think that's absolutely something that we should talk about for future Congresses. Well, I, uh, I appreciate that. I appreciate the sentiment behind it because I know it's sincere. Um, again, I can go on and on on this, uh, but we do believe, Mr. Chairman, it's a violation of the spirit. And we appreciate your letter very much, which is very respectful. We tried to make ours respectful when we made the request. It was. To us, the, the facts are clear. Chairman Nadler ignored a right the right of the minority in committee. It's being ignored by the Democratic majority now, and by doing so, it fundamentally alters the tools available for the minority and all future minorities. So I do hope the Rules Committee uh, will correct this misguided decision, refrain from waiving all points of order against the bill, and at the very least have the matter debated on the House floor. Mr. Raskin, after the adoption of HRS 660, and before the Judiciary Committee's uh, first hearing pursuant to that resolution, Ranking Member Collins wrote seven letters to Chairman Nadler on the subject of the committee's consideration of impeachment. On November 12th, he wrote Chairman Nadler regarding the manner in which the Intelligence Committee conducted their investigation. On November 14th, he wrote Chairman Nadler demanding that the same transparency and fairness that existed in prior impeachment required inquiries be prioritized uh, in the current inquiry. 
On November 18th, he wrote Chairman Nadler regarding the credibility of a particular witness and Chairman Schiff's uh, coordination with certain witnesses to conceal basic and relevant facts. On November 21st, he wrote Chairman Nadler asking uh, that he obtain <coughs> all documents and information from Chairman Schiff pursuant to House Resolution 660 and its accompanying procedures. On November 30th, the persistent Mr. Collins wrote Chairman Nadler asking for an expanded panel and a balanced composition of academic uh, witnesses to opine on the subject matter at issue during the December 4th hearing. On December 2nd, he wrote Chairman Nadler asking for clarity on how he plans to conduct the impeachment inquiry, referencing five previous letters he had sent uh, to questions that were never answered. And on December 3rd, he wrote Chairman Nadler reminding him of his recent letters requesting the Judiciary Committee provide the President uh, due process with the Intelligence Committee, and Chairman uh, Schiff did not. Uh, it's my understanding that Chairman Nadler never provided a response to any of these letters. To your knowledge, does Chairman Nadler generally not respond to letters from ranking minority members? Um, no, and I, I will concede that Mr. Collins, like um, the aforementioned John Adams and Thomas Jefferson, is a prolific letter writer. Uh, I, I don't know whether or not they engaged in conversation to follow up on any of those, but of course, you know, we're all together on a daily basis pretty much. Um, so I, I just I can't speak for the chairman. Okay, well, I just want to note for the record, when we sent a letter to my uh, chairman, he did respond, and uh, we appreciate that very Mr. much. Mr. Cole? Uh, yeah, I'm turning to you it, next. Go thank right you. Ahead. Oh, yeah, it's regular in my committee. We don't get a lot of answers. And this was very true. We got one answer on our witness list. That was it. The other one was a discussion that I had when I asked for another witness, and it turned into an interesting conversation on, were you asking for three to two? or it, We're asking for ratios, and all I was asking for was another witness. And told me it was too late and that he could add it. You know, it was just, it, that's the only uh, red I got. I appreciate the chairman's under a lot of pressure. That time and calendar do, do kill you. I, I, I do, too. And I recognize that. And that's true of all of us. But, you know, this committee does, in, in a sense, have a special responsibility to make sure the other committees, uh, you know, operate uh, according to our rules and, and just common courtesy. Uh, Mr. Collins, uh, articles of impeachment are based on a report written by the chairman Shift and transmitted to the Judiciary Committee, correct? That's correct. Uh, did uh, that impeachment report rely on he uh, hearsay to support their insertions? Yes. What explanation does Chairman Schiff provide when asked why hearsay rather than first-hand testimony evidence was uh, incorrectly presented as evidence? Well, besides his own discussion of making up the phone call to start with, but also he's not really provided one because he didn't come testify in my committee. Well, did uh, you ask Chairman Nadler to invite Chairman Schiff to come testify? I did. Um, just to be clear, you were asked to vote on articles of impeachment against our Commander-in-Chief based on a report full of unsubstantiated allegations and hearsay, and you were not permitted to ask the author of the report any questions? That is correct. All I got was a, st a staff member. I'd like to note for the record, Mr. Chairman, that Chairman Schiff refused to discuss the report with the minority, yet he was uh, more than willing to appear on Fox News Sunday just two days ago. Uh, it's unfortunately abundantly clear the shift reports made uh, for television documents rather than the result of a transparent, thorough, bipartisan investigation. Well, also worth noting for the record, and I'll ask you this, Mr. Collins, was the president represents, you know, this is a really odd thing for us because generally the Judiciary Committee is the main committee of impeachment. That's historically been the case. That's clearly not the case yes. here. The, no. the Committee on Intelligence is the main committee yes. of impeachment. Does it uh, have any counsel there? Uh, no. And some, somewhere along the line, we lost our right to be the impeachment, you know, to work on impeachment. We got it at the end to finish it, but we, well, we lost I, it. I, you know, there's a difference between window dressing and substance. I mean, two or three hearings yeah. at the end where you don't even question the author of the report, on, or you're not allowed to question uh, the author of the report on which impeachment is based. The president never had representation there. In the past, we always had representation. You were at judiciary. Yep. The president was there. He could ask questions. He could, yep. But the main place where all these things come out of, the president was specifically excluded, and you were not in, the, right. in what's supposed to be the main mm -hmm. committee on judiciary. You were not allowed to ask the author of the principal report any question. Mr. Cole, you've just presented in a, in a short summation, which I've always admired by you, the, the crux of this whole problem. 
by the time it got to Judiciary Committee, this was a done deal. The train was on the front, not even on the track. The train was past the station. They just had to run to catch up to it. It was already decided what they wanted to do. And so here it is, and I've heard this argument, and you can dress this up, when to dress it anyway, but I think when we go to the institutional integrity problem that we have here, when you get, when you do whatever you think of HRS 660, the only place it truly provided the opportunity for fairness for the president and the administration was in the Judiciary Committee. Because at that point in time, they would have been able to uh, you know, ask for witnesses, by the way, which they were turned down. They were, you know, all these things that they were, but they were never opportunity. There's no way, and I don't care how much the majority pretties this up, there's no way you can call calling four law school professors, two staff members, and, and that's the only hearings you have, to provide any opportunity for the president to question and get anything out of them. But I have heard from my majority colleagues, which I, as a former defense attorney I think is pretty funny, well, if he's innocent, just tell him to come prove it. When is that ever part of what we should be doing here, really? I don't think any of my civil libertarians in the Democratic aisle, they ought to be just laying awake at night saying, how can I be associated with this? Because no matter what you think, there's a way to do this fairly, and they can still get their results. Because, by the way, they still outnumber us, and they've been trying to do this for three years. Mr. Raskins, uh, did you have any conversation with Chairman Schiff about the contents of the report? I, I'm certain I have along the way, yes. Uh, really? Because nobody on our side evidently had any conversations. Uh, to your knowledge, did Chairman Nadler have any conversations with Chairman Schiff about the contents of the report? Oh, I'm sorry. When you say the contents of the report, you mean the substance of what's in the report? Yeah. Well, I think this is... None of our people have had that opportunity. Well, I, think, I think as a committee, we've been talking about the substance of it for a long time now. But no, I, I had not... I mean... Well, I, we've I was, been talking about the substance of the report. We didn't have yeah. any opportunity to question the person who actually authored the report. Oh, I, I see what you mean. Okay, and uh, either formally or informally, to my knowledge. Well, the um, uh, again, the, the the council for the uh, intelligence committee came over uh, to discuss all of the factual findings that were in the intelligence committee's report of it's his not, work. He's not the principal author of the report. He's the council for the committee. The chairman's principal, principal author. Okay. Fifth. And uh, and and by the way, a fact witness as well in many yes. ways. Uh, and so, well, if, if I could respond to this general line of, of attack, the House Resolution 660 had a number of significant procedural protections for the president, even on the House side. And as you know, the role of the House is to act as the grand jury and the prosecutor, and the actual trial takes place over in the Senate. But still, we had very significant procedural protections, including we invited the president and his counsel to attend all hearings. We provided the President's counsel the opportunity to cross-examine witnesses and object to the admissibility of testimony. And we provided the President's counsel the opportunity to make presentations of evidence before the full Judiciary Committee, including the chance to call witnesses. Now, the President chose not to avail himself of any of those opportunities. So it, it's, it, it reminds me of, you know, the President blockading all these witnesses and saying, you don't have enough people with direct first-hand well, evidence to, of what to, I to, First of all, did you, were those rights provided only in Judiciary Committee? Because you're not the principal committee of impeachment here. That's just the reality. But, but you're, you're sort of the final stop. So did the President get those rights in the Judiciary Committee, excuse me, in the Intelligence Committee? I, I believe not. I'd have to go back and check. But I can assure you not. Well, but then let me let me explain. Well, you may not accept this analogy, but here's the analogy that we proceeded on because this is the first modern impeachment where the fact finder was the House of Representatives itself instead of a special counsel or an independent counsel. When the special counsel and independent counsel did their work <coughs> in the Nixon and Clinton impeachments, all of that was closed door depositions because you don't want the witnesses to be coordinating their testimony and so on. That's how uh, prosecutorial investigations take place. The, the House Committee on Intelligence was our fact-finding committee. That's why they performed closed-door depositions, because they wanted to pr avoid witnesses coaching each other and coordinating their testimony. Let me give Mr. Collins an yeah, th this is, I mean, we're, we're driving down an interesting hole here because this is, I also am ranking member of the same committee that said early on when we were, quote, doing impeachment, that if the president saw something he didn't want, he could write us a letter just like everybody else in the world. This was actually said, that he could write us a letter. That would be the, how he would be taken care of. But let me hit a couple of these things. The White House still has not received all the documents it's supposed to have. 
I mean, we're still we're we're here doing impeachment right now, and they still haven't received all the documents. I still have not received all the documents from the Intelligence Committee. That's in direct violation of H six sixty. I don't know how we get around that, but we can pretend, we can paint pretty faces and say it doesn't happen. It does. But also, here's another thing: the staff member that they sent, Mr. Goldman, would not testify or answer questions on the methodology on how they actually did their investigation. And even in an egregious violation, in their own report where they named members of Congress in their phone records, he would not actually say who ordered that. Was it Chairman Schiff or him? Now, I've always defaulted, as I think you would, Mr. Cole, to the member with the pen, which would be Mr. Schiff. But Mr. Goldman actually sat there and said, we would not discuss the methodology of their investigation. This has got to be just the most amazing thought when you come to an impeachment, when you're trying to give due process to the President of the United States, and these are all ignored. And we can pretty it up any way we want to, but it's just not buying. This is not right. And look, you will impeach him. You have the votes. But at the end of the day, is it worth the integrity of the House? I don't think so. Well, during the staff presentation of the evidence, Ranking Member Collins asked how the investigation, you just made this point, was conducted, resulted in the Schiff report, never got an answer. Uh, Mr. Raskin, the House Intelligence Committee Democrats released phone records, including four phone calls by Intelligence Committee Ranking Member Nunes. How did the Committee Democrats get those phone records? I'm going to have to ask staff counsel to pass me a note on that. I will say... But the House counsel didn't answer that. Is that correct, Mr. Collins? Uh, no, he wouldn't answer the question. Just, so telling us to go ask somebody who didn't I, answer the question... I, but, but, well... But, I, I understand that we forcefully represented that there that no member of the House of Representatives and no member of the press was targeted with uh, any investigative resources. Oh, that's uh, Mr. Mr. Cole. Go ahead. Really? I mean, I respect Mr. Raskin, but I'm not even sure I, I, he got that statement out without stumbling over everything. You cannot say that you take. I mean, this is we need to talk about metadata, talking about numbers. At some point, somebody with a ranking member's phone number had to go down through there and look for the ranking member's phone number. They had to go down and look for Mr. Solomon's phone number. This is what they don't want to deal with. This is how bad it is screwed up. And I know they want to gloss over process. I know they want to gloss over how they did their investigation because the time and the calendar are terrible masters. I've repeated it over and over. But this is what we're talking about, and they wouldn't even talk about it. So to say that there's, you know, that nobody was doing this intentionally is just not being factually accurate. It doesn't happen on its own. I'd ask both of you this question. Who specifically matched the num phone numbers of the ranking member Nunes, and what method did they use? But I have no idea. I, I just want, if I could say, Mr. Cole, in certainly, response certainly. to the whole line of questions, the President of the United States was given the opportunity to call any witnesses he wants. Any of the 17 witnesses who appeared before the House Intelligence Committee and Oversight and Foreign Affairs could have been called by the President. He would have had the opportunity to cross-examine any of them. But of course, he didn't want to because all of them essentially told different pieces of the exact same story, which is the President ex executed this shakedown of President Zelensky to come and get involved in our campaign at the expense of former Vice President Biden. Uh, you know, that just doesn't hold water when you look at our, again, I can't say this enough. It goes back to our calendar and our clock. How is it possible when I talked to the chairman himself, sent him letters asking, you know, when we were going to get witnesses, when he didn't even build the witness day in for ourselves? He didn't even build in the calendar a time to accept one of our witnesses, much less the White House witnesses. So don't tell me that you could have accepted, he'd have sent witnesses and we'd have accepted it. It was never on the calendar. Let me ask you this because these numbers didn't particularly need. Who specifically ordered the inclusion of phone, these phone records in the Schiff report? Mr. Uh, ranking Member, I'm afraid I can't answer these questions. I just don't know. Let's Mr. see. Cowan? Well, in Dali, it was the Intelligence Committee carrying out what seemed to be a political vendetta against another member of Congress. Either of you think it's proper to have the names of individuals swept up in call logs who are not the target of uh, criminal investigation, have their names and numbers? No, it is nothing but a political drive-by, and I brought that out. They could have done it several different ways. They could have said member one. It could have been person one. They could have done it any other way, but they chose to actually use the names. This was a political hit job. Give you an opportunity to respond, Mr. Askin. Do you think it was appropriate for those numbers and names to have been released? Um, again, they were not I, the targets of the investigations. They were just swept up. Yeah. You know. Yeah, I, I was not involved in that part of it, and so forgive me again speaking. No, I, never again, I understand. And, uh, Will the gentleman yield for a minute? We did have testimony on this. No, I'm not going to yield my time. Okay, I mean, there was You'll testimony. You'll have your time shortly. Yeah. Ms. Cole, the testimony was, I'm not going to tell you. Okay. Uh, 
How many times, Mr. Collins, the shift report or hearsay statements uh, use this evidence? Hundreds. Well, actually, only 54. It may seem you take, when you take off one person talking off another person off another person, yeah. it goes up. How many times in the shift report or news reports the only evidence supporting factual assertions? I'm sorry, I repeat the question. I, was, okay. I had something. How many here. times in the shift report or news reports the only evidence supporting factual assertions? It would have been the main factual assertion was Mr. Uh, Sondland, one. About 16 different times. Uh, Mr. Raskin, it's my understanding Chairman Schiff did not transmit the evidence collected during his committee's investigation to the Judiciary Committee until Friday, December 6th. Is, does that comport with your memory? That, that is correct. Okay. So, Judiciary Committee majority, uh, did it have access to any evidence beyond the actual report from the Intelligence Committee until the weekend? before the Judiciary Committee actually considered articles of impeachment? Well, um, I don't remember exactly when all of the deposition statements were released publicly. I think some of them had been released publicly before that time. Um, we could go back and check the exact chronology. Sure. Yeah. Uh, and there are certain members of the Judiciary Committee who are also members of other Certainly understand. So. Certainly. You're... Yeah. Uh, it's my understanding that Chairman Schiff did not transmit all the material collected by the Intelligence Committee to the Judiciary Committee. Is that the case? It is still true to this day. So would you not agree, and I'd ask this to both of you, that the House Judiciary Committee should have had the time and opportunity to review all that material collected by the Intelligence Committee? Did you both have that time and opportunity? We did not. It's a direct violation of House, Rule 6, House Resolution 660. <laughs> the, the, Mr. Cole, all I can tell you is the the vast amount of what we ended up getting was what was being uh, produced, released publicly along the way. I know the Intelligence Committee um, made the commitment to release those depositions, uh, those deposition statements publicly. And, I, and so I, I've considered it a very fair and transparent process. I, did, I don't think I got to see a single thing through the Judiciary Committee that I was not just seeing come out and being released by the Intelligence Committee. In any event, all of it, is in the final report. It's there for all of America to see, um, and I don't want us to lose sight of the, the big picture. We of really don't know if it's all there in we the don't. final report. For all, if you haven't seen them yourself, no, we do it. not know. That that's a statement that is assuming something. Uh, you know, facts not in evidence. That that we don't know what we. You know, this is the old classic case of evidence being given from a prosecutor to a, an you know in, in a trial. We don't know what we've not seen. We do know what we we know one a few things we know have not been transferred, but we'd also have heard of other things that's not been transferred, and it's not can't be under report if it's not been transferred because then we could at least say it was in the report. Let me move on to the articles themselves because, in my view, we've established the intelligence committee process was substantially flawed and procedurally defective. That's my view. I underline. A uh, judiciary committee uh, failed to create an evidentiary record sufficient to justify moving forward on, uh, on articles, but you basically relied on the uh, Intelligence uh, Committee, again, where the President was unrepresented. That violated rules of the House, in my view, and the entire circus has been politically motivated uh, from the very beginning. On the obstruction of Congress charge, it's uncommon for the executive, or excuse me, is it uncommon for the, and I ask this to both of you, uncommon for the executive branch to push back against requests for information from Congress? Well, um, no, it is not uncommon for the executive branch to push back on the production of this or that document or the timing of a particular visit. What was absolutely breathtaking in its unprecedented and radical nature was this president's determination to shut down all discovery. They did not produce a single document to us, Mr. Call, uh, that was subpoenaed uh, in this process. And the president essentially ordered everyone in the executive branch not to cooperate with us. Uh, and yes. Excuse me, I don't want to cut so, you off. But I think that's a dramatic uh, escalation in kind and in degree over anything that's ever been seen before. And that includes Richard Nixon, uh, who I think tried, tried to block seven or eight particular requests, like the Watergate tapes. And that in itself became part of the case against him for abuse of power. But, you know, President Trump makes Richard Nixon look like a little leaguer when it comes to obstruction. Uh, Mr. Collins, same thing. Do you think it's unusual for an administration to push back against congressional subpoenas? And no, it's common. Um, if it's pretty common, 
Do you believe it's a high crime or misdemeanor to assert privileges in response to congressional requests for subpoenas? Not it is. And again, I want to go back and just give a, a little bit of history since we've had history lessons here from Ms. Rath. And even in our own committee this year, what's been really interesting is, is uh, it's, it's been a total, you know, just walk toward impeachment the whole time. But what was interesting in our committee is we would send subpoenas or we would, you know, we, again, we sent out letters and stuff and we never followed up on. But also one of the interesting things about our committee was is we never engaged for the most part with the agencies for documents. But what I thought was really interesting was Mr. Schiff in the Intelligence Committee, while we were still struggling during Mueller and some other times, Mr. Schiff actually negotiated with the Department of Justice and actually got documents released that our committee couldn't. The House Foreign Affairs Committee, Elliot Engel, who is one of the quieter chairmen, but one of the more effective in my personal opinion from across the aisle, had engaged all year with the administration on ways to get documents. It's a matter of how you go about it. And to say that this is just unheard of is just not right. Well, and, and again, I'd ask this to both of you, and I think this gets to the point you're making. There's a normal accommodations process for resolving inter-branch disputes between the House and the executive branch. Is that not correct? Yes. Uh, okay. And that process really hasn't occurred here, I think, Mr. Collins. That's what you're telling me. I presume... It, it doesn't fit neatly into the, the uh, you know, speaker's impeachment and Christmas timeline, to borrow your, uh, your uh, way of looking at it. I mean, we've not gone to court. No, they have These things, uh, we're not really engaged. This is a normal give and take where actually both sides tend to avoid, quote, you know, an exchange where they might go to court and lose something. Right. But all that's been set aside. We haven't had any process like that, have we? No. And Ms. Cole, I'll even point out something that I disagree with. Mr. McGann. We, I mean, there's been a court case in which we've lost in which Mr. McGann, and it's still being appealed, but it does show you the process is working. It just don't work as fast as they want it to work. And I think that's where we have to go back to um, in this whole process. So, no. And, in fact, even the one uh, that they had that was actually uh, one of the members of the administration contested, they just withdrew their uh, subpoena and withdrew them from the, from the uh, lawsuit because they just didn't want to deal with it. I know Mr. Raskin would have a different view, and if he wants to respond, I would. But I'm going to ask you specifically, Mr. Collins, is there any actual evidence that the pause on the Ukrainian assistance was for the president's uh, improper personal political benefit, or could he have had other objectives? That's directed to you, Mr. Collins. I'm sorry. Uh, I apologize. And it's all right. I'm throwing a lot of questions at you. Is there any actual evidence that the pause on the Ukrainian assistance was for the president's improper personal political benefit, or might he have had other reasons for withholding aid? He had plenty of other reasons. And I think that the part of it is the law itself, which says that, you know, even though it was certified, it was the president's call to make sure that there was no corruption in where aid is given. There was other com countries during that time in which aid was held. I think from an appropriator standpoint, Mr. Cole, you'll also understand this aid was not even scheduled to go out. It had to be done by September 30th. September 30th. It actually went out early, if you look at it from that time frame. Um, so there were other reasons. Uh, there was a recent poll, it just to show you, and again, we talked about this in, a little bit from our side. The corruption in the Ukraine was so prevalent. Six, a recent poll said 68% of normal, just everyday Ukrainians had said that they had bribed a public official in the past year. There was reasons for this uh, to be discussed and reasons to go at it. But also I want to point out one last thing on this other issue. Fast and Furious, the infamous uh, issue with the Obama administration, it was seven months from first subpoena to first document. Seven months. That doesn't fit the uh, timeline here. That doesn't fit the timeline here. Go ahead. So that, this is an essential point um, that you raise right now. And I think that there is not any credible evidence from any of the witnesses or anything in the record to suggest that the president was actually trying to ferret out corruption as opposed to impose a corrupt scheme on the president of Ukraine. Let's start with this. In 2017 and 2018, the president could have raised corruption in withholding military and security assistance to Ukraine and never did. Then in 2019, he did. What changed? Well, Joe Biden was running for president and the presidential campaign was much on his mind. The president uh, removed Ambassador Yovanovitch and we learned today from, uh, from Mr. Giuliani that he was involved with the campaign by Parnas and Fruman to smear uh, Ambassador Yovanovitch to say there was something wrong with her. In fact, when she was, according to all the testimony we had and all the public information we have, she was one of the leading anti-corruption ambassadors that the United States has on earth. 
And they sabotaged her, they undercut her, they subjected her to an unprecedented smear campaign that led several of the other witnesses to protest that the State Department was not standing by its own ambassador. And they got rid of her, as uh, Mr. Giuliani said in today's paper, because she was getting in the way of the investigations they wanted. And what investigations were those? Those into Biden, those into the 2016 um, conspiracy theory. So that's pretty clear. It had nothing to do with corruption. Moreover, if you go to the July 25th telephone call, President Trump never raised the word corruption once. But he did talk about Joe Biden three times. So we didn't hear corruption, corruption, corruption. We heard Biden, Biden, Biden. That was the favor that we were looking for, right? He wanted the president of Ukraine to come over and say he was investigating the Bidens. Look, that's unrefuted and uncontradicted in the record. I don't, we should, I don't think we should be trying to pull the wool over America's eyes about this. Let's not play make-believe. If we want to say it's okay for the president to do this stuff, then let's just go ahead and say it. But let's not claim that he was involved in some kind of anti-corruption crusade at the time. I think America knows that we can't take that seriously. This president cut anti-corruption funding to Ukraine by 50%. The chairman of his campaign, Paul Manafort, was on the take. He was on the dole for millions of dollars to a former corrupt president in Ukraine. President Zelensky, who was getting shaken down, was the reformer. He was the product of the revolution of dignity in 2014, which tried to bring some democracy and tried to bring some fairness and anti-corruption efforts to Ukraine. Giuliani and his gang that can't shoot straight, they went over there because they wanted to take advantage of the situation and go back to the corrupt forces in Ukraine. So this president had one thing in mind, his own reelection and how President Zelensky could help him. And you can see that if you look at the phone conversation that Ambassador Sondland had with the president the day after July 25th. On July 26th, he had this phone conversation that was um, partially overheard by David Holmes um, in the State Department. And he hears him tell the president that Zelensky will do whatever you want. He's going to do the investigations. He loves your ass and so on. And then he gets off the phone and then he tells him what? Uh, that what the president is interested in is the big stuff relating to the president's own political amb ambitions, like the Bidens. He's not interested in uh, the war with Russia. And I would say, obviously, he's not interested in corruption. He was interested in the Bidens, and that was it. Now, e either we think that's an appropriate and proper thing for the president of the United States to be doing, or we think it's wrong. And give, some of us believe it rises to the level of I want to give Mr. Mr. Collins a chance to respond before I do. Uh, President Zelensky, any Ukrainian official ever tell you they felt shaken down? Well, there's lots of evidence in the That's record. That's not what I asked. I said, have you got any no, statement? No, I've never spoken to him. Okay. And are there any statement on the record? Uh, I don't think so. No. There's statements on the record. The record ours, we wasn't, we wasn't pressured. We wasn't part of anything. I wouldn't be a part of that. Those are the, the statements from Mr. Zelensky. What, you know, well, don't let, I'm at this Mr. point. Kyle's chance to respond. Yeah, don't, they, come they, back. There yeah. are contemporaneous emails where, uh, and somebody will pass me the exact language, but essentially where uh, Mr. Yermak, who is the, the top right-hand man to uh, the president of Ukraine, says that the president does not want to be treated as a political pawn in domestic American politics. For several weeks, they were doing everything in their power to try to get out from underneath the straitjacket of this scheme that was coming, that was bearing down on them from every different direction. Mr. Collins? Wow, that's a story right there. We're, you know, this is amazing. I am maybe this is good we're doing this because we're having to expand the story to fit our narrative here. And because it, you know, if you don't, let's don't play make believe. There's nothing. If they had something in the phone call, it would have been in the articles of impeachment. They don't. Because at the end of the day, there's no direct evidence the, of what they're trying to spin here, and that was that there was a uh, pressuring or a quid pro quo, or however you want to put it, um, uh, to Mr. Uh, Zelensky. The problem here is, is that Mark Sandy testified under oath that there was a wholesale investigation going into foreign aid this year. So you can go back and quote 2017, 2018, all you want, but this year, because of the problems, he testified that there's a wholesale investigation onto foreign aid everywhere. Trump, uh, but if you know, the President Trump actually raised this with Mr. Poroshenko in 2017, and that was testified to by Mr. Volcker and the former ambassador. So when you look at this, there's no direct evidence of, of what was said here, and to try and then come back and put this into a different uh, perspective. And again, going back to Mr. Yarmuk, who Mr. Yarmuk said, there was no connection between, ever discussed between the, the aid and a investigation. And also, if they were trying to get out from under it so hard, I, I guess if we're looking at that, because they never did anything to get the aid. They never did anything to get the aid. If they were that scared, something was wrong. 
Um, I'll, I'll try to bring this uh, to conclusion because I th and I know there'll be a difference of opinion here, so you both certainly both can respond. Um, contrary to my claims uh, or to my friend's claims across the aisle, uh, Mr. Collins, uh, you think the Democratic majority effectively denied the administration a meaningful opportunity to participate in this proceeding? They didn't effectively. They did. Okay, on October 30th, uh, the Rules Committee held our original jurisdiction markup on HRS 660. And there were many serious concerns from our side uh, of the dais about the damage this unprecedented process to have the institution. Republican members of the committee were repeatedly assured that, quote, the president has been afforded all kinds of rights before the Judiciary Committee. We've heard that assertion again today, and that this would be an open and transparent process. Uh, despite the fact that we received the text of the resolution a mere 24 hours earlier, did not have a single amendment made in order. Um, Mr. Collins, was the administration provided the opportunity to participate in the Intelligence Committee proceedings? Because in my mind, no. they basically supplanted the judiciary as the principal committee of impeachment. They were, and they definitely weren't in the judiciary. And you, they can, it was put into the record that they should have been. But the problem is, is the actual uh, way it played out in the scheduling in Judiciary Committee made it nowhere possible that they could even, if all of a sudden they you know, wanted to, there was no time in the calendar for it. Yeah, so I'll just end with this. I mean, I certainly, have, well, I'll let my friend respond if you need, wanted to. Thank you. You're very kind, Mr. Call. Um, the, um, when Lieutenant Colonel Vinman testified, um, he said that this request for a favor was not uh, in any sense, uh, a friendly request. It was a demand in the context of the hundreds of millions of dollars that were being held up, the request for the White House meeting, uh, and so on. For weeks, the Ukrainians pushed back on the demand of the president and his agents and advised U.S. officials they did not want to be, quote, an instrument in Washington domestic reelection politics. You recall the uh, testimony of Dr. Fiona Hill, uh, who said that this was a domestic political errand that the president's team was on in order to extract this commitment from President Zelensky to come and give this interview. And in fact, they had publicly um, announced, uh, or they were going to publicly announce the investigations in an interview that President Zelensky had scheduled on CNN. But then Ukraine canceled the interview uh, a few days after the president's scheme was publicly exposed and the military aid got released. In other words, when the whole scheme blew up, then President Zelensky felt that he could uh, be free from this obligation to come forward and say well, with, he was all, investigating the With Biden. all due respect, the President was telling uh, United States Senators in August that the aid was probably going to be released long before, uh, you know, there was any notion about a whistleblower or anything else. Senator Johnson from Wisconsin has testified to that effect. Well, so, yeah. and again, with all due respect, I mean, uh, the last administration for four years didn't provide any military assistance to Ukraine. The idea that 55 days was somehow life and death in this situation, particularly during the period of transition from one government to another, uh, you know, it's just pretty thin gruel to impeach a president of the United States on. Um, Mr. Chairman, you know, with all due respect to my friends here, uh, who I admire uh, both and who I think have, have uh, been very helpful in their testimony and as always straight and forthright, my view, Chairman Schiff ought to be the person answering questions in front of the Rules Committee. Uh, it's his report. I don't blame the President uh, for passing on the opportunity not to go before the judiciary for what was clearly going to be perfunctory and, and provide a, a sort of window dressing of legitimacy to this process. So to claim that uh, he was given meaningful or consistent opportunities treated anywhere like previous administration, I just don't think holds up when you're denied an opportunity to participate where the principal action's at uh, and then given a last-minute thing. And so, again, I, I just I'm going to yield back my time, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank both of our uh, distinguished members, former and current of the Rules Committee, uh, for coming up here and, and providing us their insight and their testimony. It's, uh, it's great to work with both of you, and I appreciate your service to your districts and to the Congress and to the country. Yield back. So um, I want to thank the gentleman for his uh, questioning. I, I said I'd be liberal with the time. You, you, you were. You're going to make me into a conservative by the end of this hearing. Um, uh, 
But let me, let me just do a couple of things here. Um, one is I want to ask unanimous consent to, without objection, to insert in the record an October 23rd New York Times article entitled Ukraine, Ukraine knew of aid freeze by early August undermining Trump defense. Um, I also want to uh, make a, um, a couple of comments about the Minority Day witness issue. Um, I did uh, send a letter to uh, my colleagues on the, on the Rules Committee. Uh, we made it part of the record. Uh, Mr. Nadler has confirmed that he would work with the minority to schedule a, their hearing a day on constitutional grounds of impeachment, uh, notwithstanding the fact that he already oh, allowed yeah. a minority witness. And we, we did a lot of history. We did, looked at the history of, of this, whole, uh, this whole rule. And basically, it was designed to ensure that uh, the minority was not shut out of witnesses, uh, that they were not completely shut out of hearings, as had, been, uh, as has, had occurred in the past. Uh, and uh, the minority did get a witness. Uh, I tried not to watch the judiciary proceedings as much as I could, but I did see him. Uh, he was there. Um, but I would just say that, um, you know, that this, I, this notion that somehow th that uh, the minority has this superpower uh, ability to be able to uh, not only uh, name the witnesses, but set the day and to be able to slow down progress on any bill, uh, if that were the case, having been in the minority for eight years, uh, we would have used it to stop most of the agenda that my Republican friends have put forward. So I, 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 I put that, I would, again, just, uh, I will make that letter available to anybody who's interested. Mr. McGovern. Uh, uh, yeah. Mr. Chairman, I do have a question. I was, I, you made a statement, and I'm not sure if you were, how you were wording it, if it was a paraphrase or not, but I was never promised by Mr. Nadler that he would work with us on a minority hearing day from now to infinity. I mean, he just he just basically said, "No, we're not having it." Well, my, he did my, not. My understanding is that he said that in committee. Maybe I, I'm I'm wrong, but I, we we find well, we, out during the break. we've had a little issue of consultation. We we, lately, yeah, so. we, get, we, we, we will look that up, and and by the time we get back, we will get you that get that get you that answer. Uh, but let, let me let me again remind everybody here why we're here today. I mean, because I, it, it's easy to get kind of get caught up into the weeds and to talk about weeds. process. Um, and well, 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 let me let me I, I just was handed it. Uh, now there, in the states, I'm willing to work with the minority to schedule the hearing. I'll, I'll pass that on to the to the gentleman. If you we have consultation it. issues in our committee, right. and sending that and not talking about it and yeah. taking all of our witnesses out is not true. Yeah. And to impugn it into letter is fine, but it's right. still not true. Right. Well, it's, it's what he said. Right. Though. Right. So I, you know, I, I will ask that to be part of the record as well. Look, let me let me just remind everybody why we're here. As I said over and over again, the president abused his power of office for his own personal gain and obstructed a congressional investigation to look into that conduct. Um, and we all know how he did it. Uh, he tried to shake down the government of Ukraine to ba get, basically get dirt on his political opponent to help him in the upcoming 2020 election. Uh, and he engaged in a systemic pattern of denying any documents of any cooperation with Congress. Uh, that is obstruction of Congress. And, and Mr. Collins, you, you, you kept on saying something that I, I actually agree with. You talk about how the clock and the calendar uh, is important. You know, from my vantage point uh, and from the way I look at what has happened here, it is important because I believe, as Mr. Raskin stated at the beginning of his testimony, that there is a crime in progress. I mean, we have an election coming up in less than a year. Uh, and the president is openly trying to encourage foreign interference in that election. I mean, that is a big deal. That should shock everybody, not only in this committee, in this chamber, all throughout this country. It is just wrong. It is so wrong. Uh, and so we will continue this hearing. We're, we, just, we just had votes, and we will uh, um, uh, recess uh, uh, and come back at the beginning of the last vote, uh, where we will then turn to Mr. Hastings. The Rules Committee stands in recess.
I hit the power out.
See this plug down here? That's where it's going. Yeah.
Rules Committee will come to order. Let me welcome back our, our two witnesses. And at this time, I am uh, happy to yield to uh, my distinguished colleague from Florida, uh, Elsie Hastings. Thank you so very much, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, with your permission, I would like uh, very much to yield to our colleague, uh, Ms. Scanlon, for some questions uh, that she may have of our witnesses. With, with, without objection. Okay, thank you. I just wanted to clarify one thing. We had a line of questioning from Mr. Cole right before we broke, and it had to do whether or not there had been subpoenas issued for Ranking Member Nunez's um, phone records. And, you know, there seemed to be some confusion from, from our two witnesses here, but I recalled the testimony that we had in judiciary, which was that, in fact, no subpoenas had been issued for any member of Congress or for any jur journalist. That the Intel Committee has subpoenaed metadata, so just call records, not actually phone taps, of four people who'd been involved in this scheme to abuse the power of office and, and smear Ambassador uh, Yovanovitch um, after each of those people had been subpoenaed individually. So that was Giuliani, Parnas, and Fruman, and Sondland, two have been indicted for crimes now related to this investigation. Um, so once those phone records were brought in, patterns were noticed around particular events. Um, and that was when uh, Ranking Member Nunez's phone number was identified. It wasn't that his number was sought. He just happened to be in conversation with the co-conspirators there. So if people are interested in that, in addition to the testimony we heard in judiciary, um, that information can be found in the Intel report that was filed on pages 45 through 47, and then at footnote 76, which is on page 155. And I would just note particularly there, it says the committee did not subpoena the call detail records for any member of Congress or staff. So, you know, to the extent that we were getting distracted by some notion that people were um, trying to improperly investigate members of Congress, I think we should put that to bed and call it out for being a distraction and, and just not the truth. Mr. Raskin, did that answer. refresh your recollection on any of that? Uh, Ms. Scanlon, thank you very much for d adding the details. My uh, primary recollection of our conversation about that was precisely this, that the <coughs> Intelligence Committee targeted no member of Congress. It targeted no uh, journalist. It did not direct <laughs> subpoenas against any of them. Uh, and I believe that uh, the names that came up came up in the normal course of uh, standard investigatory procedure. So there's nothing untoward there that, that I can see. Okay. And also there, there was testimony from Mr. Nunez, in, or not testimony, questioning of Ambassador Taylor um, by Mr. Nunez indicating that, in fact, he had been phoning folks in the Ukraine, right? So he had acknowledged that. But he... Mr. Nunes, yes. Nunes said, uh, yes, as, uh, yes, I, I believe that's in the transcript as well. I mean, he, he basically has said that he was conducting uh, a kind of investigation of his own into okay. what happened there. Okay. Uh, hopefully that puts that to bed, and I'd yield back to Mr. Hastings. Yes, I yield to, I certainly yield. Yeah, I appreciate it. Uh, it doesn't put it, I appreciate the gentleman bringing it up, but it had nothing to do with the questions that was asked. And it doesn't put it to bed at all. I've always acknowledged that the, they were properly done for subpoenas. I'm, I'm still an institutionalist. I believe the subpoena power of the committee's actually work. And I've never denied that the committee's didn't. In fact, I said it in the Judicial Committee that day to Mr. Goldman. Never questioned the, the committee process, never questioned the subpoena, and also acknowledged there was never a direct subpoena on any members of Congress. What I did say, and what I'll continue to say was, even in the gentlelady just acknowledged it, was that when they started going through the phone records, they looked at the people they called, and then someone somehow had the, the ranking member's phone number. And they collaborated that with that phone call that was working. Now, even to that point, I could say, OK. But my problem comes is the way it was actually put in is what I would consider a political hit job in the report itself when it could have been done many different ways because it was not a, a, applicable notice to this article of impeachment. It was not anything that was furthering a narrative except to, frankly, look at getting back at the ranking member and others. They could have put that in, as, as we've seen in other reports, con Congress member one, Congress member two. So nothing that was supposed that was said that, I, and I appreciate the gentlelady bringing this up, but I never questioned the subpoenas, never questioned that. My question was, who is actually was said to actually start putting these together and then put them in the report? If I could just say, I, I just, um, 
bristle a little bit at the suggestion that the Chairman Schiff and the Intelligence Committee did anything wrong there. Uh, I was uh, a State Assistant Attorney General for a couple years, and uh, my recollection is that if you get uh, a table of telephone records and other numbers come up, you do your due diligence on all of the other numbers to see who's involved. I mean, what we're talking about is possibly conspiratorial activity. And so that was the way in which those numbers surfaced, and I think they did their regular due diligence on it, and that's how um, those callers were identified. Could, could I ask my friend uh, to yield for just a moment? To... I, I have the time, I'm, I'm... and I'll yield to Mr. Woodall. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Right. Mason. I appreciate that. I, I did not uh, know that I understood what you just said. I, I thought you said your experience uh, in the state prosecutor's office led you to uh, release the kinds of names of co-conspirators co as, as those things were, were discovered. Certainly you are not suggesting that Mr. Nunez was a, was a co-conspirator in, in any way, shape, or form. No, 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 not, okay. at no not at all. No, not at all. Thank you. I thank my friend for right. You finished, Ms. Gallagher? Yeah. All right, thank you. Mr. Chairman, when we uh, 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 took our uh, recess to vote, you had just made what I consider to be uh, a very profound statement that's uh, short. And it is um, uh, that uh, the president's actions, in your words, were so wrong. Uh, and it's hard for me to believe um, uh, that all of us here and in the previous committee and as this matter proceeds, uh, do not all understand that. Uh, but the die is pretty much cashed. Um, in, in, in this institution, we are fond of saying, um, <laughs> after everybody is exhausted and talking about whatever the issue is, that everybody has said everything that needs to be said, uh, but I haven't said it yet. And that's, that's what's going to happen with uh, every one of the members uh, uh, that uh, uh, come uh, after me. But what is disturbing to me is that we, we're like we're in alternative universes, uh, not just here in the Rules Committee, but in the Judiciary Committee, in uh, uh, the uh, Intelligence Committee, where I served uh, for eight years, uh, and really in America. <laughs> and it's, it's regrettable um, uh, that my friends, um, um, uh, uh, the Republicans, are not addressing or defending the president's actions. What, <laughs> what, what, what you're doing is talking about the process. I might add footnote right there. You haven't seen nothing yet if you listen to Lindsey Graham um, and um, uh, the majority uh, uh, leader, uh, McConnell, about how if the, and when this matter gets to them, uh, how they're going to act. How dare somebody say uh, that they aren't going to pretend that they are fair and the other one is going to collaborate um, uh, uh, with the White House. So if it, uh, I, I would assume that the managers that are Democrats, when they get over there, are going to be talking about process because if you're talking about unfairness, just the mere fact that both of those people who should recuse themselves, in my judgment, uh, made those kinds of statements uh, indicates um, uh, uh, where they are. But to turn back to you, Mr. Chairman, about something being wrong with what the president uh, did. When I was a boy, and that's 83 years ago, <laughs> my dad, who never went to school a day in his life, when I had crucial issues over the course of uh, time, both as a child, a uh, little boy, and uh, he lived long enough to see me become a lawyer, uh, and uh, the difficulties along the way in college and what have you. He would always say to me that right don't wrong nobody. And the fact of the matter is um, uh, that what we are doing here is right. Let me just excise one thing. 
so-called corruption, and Mr. President, uh, Mr. Chairman, with your uh, permission, just to make sure that this record uh, is complete, not that this transcript uh, has not been uh, uh, released, but I ask unanimous consent that the unclassified uh, version of the telephone conversation of the president of, uh, uh, with uh, 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 President Zelensky of Ukraine be made a part of the record. Without objection. I'm going to come back to that. We find ourselves here today discussing two articles of impeachment against President Donald John Trump because of his disregard of and disrespect for the United States Constitution. President Trump withheld American taxpayer money that was appropriated by their duly elected members of Congress, all of us, uh, to help our ally fight a hot war. It would be one thing if, 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 if we, as we do help around uh, the world, um, if this was not an enemy of the United States, a corrupt enemy of the United States, Russia. I don't have to ask anybody about it. I've been there. I saw the changes that took place. I monitored elections there. So I know that corruption is rife in, in that country. And yet we witnessed last week Sergey Lavrov, who I know, coming here in the Oval Office with the president smiling. And you all aren't prepared to defend uh, uh, that kind of uh, action with reference to corruption. I find it strange. Uh, that you're in that uh, position. But Trump withheld this taxpayer money to help our ally, the, uh, the, uh, the ally fight a hot war against Russia. So he, President Trump, could obtain a personal political benefit. And I'm going to get back to this document I asked you see on uh, at some point uh, to talk about that. And just in case folks think that the facts, which my colleagues will not discuss, are a bit too tenuous, a bit too hazy, please remember that on October 3rd, 2019, President Trump went out on the White House lawn, stood in front of a bunch of reporters and television cameras, and advised President Zelensky to announce the investigation. For good measure, he then encouraged China uh, to also start an investigation into the Biden family. Not long afterwards, on October 17, 2019, President Trump um, allowed his chief of staff, Mick Mulvaney, to hold a press conference in which Mr. Mulvaney not only admitted that a quid pro quo existed, but that we should get over it because that is just the way things are, he said, when it comes to foreign affairs and apparently foreign countries being lobbied uh, to meddle in our elections. Uh, Mick is dead wrong. That is not how we exercise our policy uh, in this country. Uh, I'm no world expert, but I began my career here 27 years ago on the Foreign Affairs Committee. I was appointed by Newt Gingrich, uh, along with Doug B. Ryder, um, uh, to study the reversion of Hong Kong to Ma uh, 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 and Macau to mainland China. I went with Donald Payne often to 26 countries in Africa. And over the course of time, I became the president of the Parliamentary Assembly of the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe. And if you can say that, you ought to be the president of that organization. Um, but there are 57 countries in that organization, including Russia, and Canada and the United States make it a transatlantic uh, organization. I went to Europe 36 times during a two-year period. To most of those countries, I made it to 47 of those uh, 57 countries, and I swore in Montenegro um, as the 57th country in uh, the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe. I think I know a little bit more about the world than Mick Mulvaney, uh, and that is not the way President Bush, um, uh, President Clinton, 
um, uh, uh, President Obama. That is not the way they conducted um, uh, policy at all. Well, he says, get over it. I, for one, will not accept uh, that vision of this great country, let alone get over it. Mr. Chairman, also consider an article of, of obstruction of Congress today we are, and I believe the record shows the administration's obstruction ought to be beyond debate, and you have demonstrably shown lots of that um, obstruction. And while many of our members don't want to bring it up, um, I, I cannot, uh, when I was ill at home for a protracted period of time, I read every line of uh, the Mueller report. And the Mueller report clearly reflects uh, that the president obstructed uh, justice uh, 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 long before we get uh, to this uh, particular matter that we are dealing with. We are stewards of the House of Representatives. And to not have all members of this body object in the most strenuous terms to this administration's complete obstruction of our clear constitutional prerogative to conduct an impeachment inquiry is, to me, truly disappointing. <laughs> to not object, to not draw the line here, is to do a great disservice not only to those who came before us, but those who will come after us. Uh, with that, Mr. Chairman, I have a few questions uh, for Mr. Raskin. Mr. Raskin, did President Trump solicit Ukraine's interference in our country's 2020 election? It is overwhelmingly clear that he did. Did President Trump solicit this foreign interference in order to obtain a personal political benefit? He absolutely did. Did President Trump condition the release of taxpayer money appropriated by Congress on President Zelensky announcing an investigation into President Trump's political opponent? All of the evidence we have says that he did. Did President Trump's actions undermine the national security of the United States and that of a key ally, namely Ukraine? I believe that they did. Ukraine had been invaded and attacked by Russia. There had been more than 13,000 casualties in that war. The president was desperate, the president of Ukraine was desperate to get security assistance. Um, and um, that was provided by Congress. Congress decided that this money was a good investment to defend a besieged ally that we needed to contain the continuing uh, imperial designs of mm -hmm. Vladimir Putin to expand uh, Russian power and to uh, control nations in the neighborhood there. On January 20th, 2017, Donald John Trump took an oath to preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. Has, in your opinion, the president violated that oath? I think this was an essential betrayal of his oath of office when he decided to try and coerce a foreign government to get involved in our presidential election, this presidential election, in order to steer the result in a particular direction. And then, as the pattern shows, to cover it all up by stonewalling Congress and by issuing an unprecedented, categorical, and indiscriminate ban on participation in a congressional impeachment investigation. You know, we got a, a letter from Mr. Cipollone when he, where he didn't even bother to invoke a privilege. Hmm. He didn't even bother to invoke the, the phony absolute immunity pretext they'd been using. He just said, no, we're not going to participate. They really think that unlike every other American citizen, they are not subject to congressional subpoena. And like you, Mr. Hastings, um, I, I would wish that even if uh, our colleagues across the aisle differ with us on Article 1, they have some difference which has yet to be expressed, certainly uh, under oath by anyone. But if they believe there's a different story or the president has an alibi, okay, fine. But in terms of Article 2, the president cannot have the power to destroy our oversight investigative power if we're going to be able to impeach a corrupt president. And that's the next question I wanted to ask you. Does the United States Constitution place the power of impeachment solely 
in the Congress. Solely in the House of Representatives. In the and, House of Representatives. And the reason why it's stated that way, Mr. Hastings, is because the framers didn't want the Senate thinking that they could initiate an impeachment. They can't. It's got to come from the House of Representatives. And because they wanted to demarcate it from the discussion, discussion. which had taken place mm -hmm. at the time, which is that, well, the Supreme Court should impeach or the state legislature should impeach. There were lots of ideas out there. But look, they said that the House of Representatives was the organ that represents the people. We are the people's body. Now, mm -hmm. the Senate has some claim after the enactment of the 17th Amendment. They're elected by the people now, too. They used to be chosen, chosen by the state legislatures, the but they really still do represent on the kind of disproportionate basis of, the, of each state getting two, despite the size of mm -hmm. uh, the state. But we are as close as you get uh, in our Constitution to the pure representatives of the people. And the Senate acts on oath and affirmation as well, am I correct? They are the constitutional jurors, and in some sense the judges too. They will decide on matters of law, but they will make the final application of the law to the facts in this case. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's why I think you're correct to point out that all of them have to think very carefully about what the constitutional oath of a juror entails. And Thank certainly you. some of them have been saying things that are, seem to be apart from what we would expect of jurors in any other context. It is my understanding that, uh, and the chairman, uh, McGovern, has pointed out some of this, but I want to highlight the number. Um, it's my understanding that the executive branch has received over 70 specific individualized requests for documents during Congress's impeachment inquiry. How many documents have been produced? We, zero have been produced. We have not gotten anything. We've yeah. not gotten anything from the Office of Management and Budget. We've not gotten anything from the Department of State. I mean, we have witnesses who complained to us in this process that their own documents had essentially been embargoed and controlled by the president and by the executive branch when they wanted to turn it over so we could find out what was going on. We're in a search for the truth here. This is not a game. We want to know what happened. I hear you. In response to duly authorized subpoenas, how many top aides has President Trump made available to the committees conducting the impeachment inquiry? Well, he's tried to block all of the witnesses. Um, we ended up having 17 witnesses, um, but there's still a number of key fact witnesses who have not come forward because the president has succeeded in blocking and restraining their testimony, like the Secretary of uh, energy like the director of the Office of Management and Budget and so on. My recollection <clears throat> during uh, the uh, judiciary um, uh, proceedings is that you put this question in a different form that I'm about to put uh, to my colleagues uh, now. And that's all of us in this room. I asked the question, how many of my friends here on this dais, dais or uh, think it is okay for an American president to solicit foreign interference in our elections. Raise your hands if you think that that's okay. Anybody? I see none. And in that light, clearly, um, uh, we have these differences. Mr. Collins? Would you consider Ukraine a strategic partner to the United States? Yes. Do you want us to believe that withholding the aid for the reasons our investigation identifies did not harm United States national security? Which ones are you talking about I will, on that facts pattern, Mr. Hastings? I'm talking the one that you, the ones that the majority stipulate to or the ones the minorities stipulate to? The majority. No, I do not agree with the majority's interpretation of the call. I seem to think that that's going to be <coughs> your role. You don't think that asking a, 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 a president of a foreign country that is in a hot war, that we withhold aid um, uh, from him, you don't think that affects our national security if you think Ukraine is our ally, as I believe you do and I do? Yeah, Mr. Case, I, I just don't <laughs> accept the premise of your of your facts. All right. Uh, what value for Ukraine do you see in the Oval Office visit or, or that was being sought? You'd have to ask the Ukraine. Do you recognize that such a visit would send a strong message to Russia, sort of like Lavrov's being in 
the Oval Office last week and the rest of the world that the United States supported Ukraine and was ready to defend it against Russian aggression? I think a better statement was when Mr. Trump sent actually offensive weapons to shoot down Russian uh, assets. And that ignores the fact that the aid was withheld and a hot war was ongoing? Again, we're going, in all due respect, we're going in circles here. I do not believe there's anything wrong with the aid being held for the reasons it was said, and I've stated this before. And actually, Mr. Trump did more for the Ukrainians in a hot war than was previously done. So I think we're... You know, I've heard that before, and I'm not going uh, uh, to elaborate, but I can assure you if they point, as you do, and many do, uh, to President Obama not providing lethal weapons, what the minority fails to note is during the early stages of the Trump administration, the aforementioned lethal weapons were provided to Ukraine. And it wasn't until 2019 during the lead up to the 2020 presidential election and after former Vice President Biden announced his candidacy, or did President Trump exert his official duties or, and place a hold on lethal aid. Let me turn to corruption. Hmm. Ostensibly, this July 25th transcript reflects, according to my friends on the other side, both in judiciary and to the extent that the report from intelligence reflects it, um, uh, uh, that in this uh, uh, particular uh, uh, matter, that Corruption was what was being sought to be determined. Hmm. Let me urge President Trump to look around the world if he wants to talk about corruption and have him answer for me why he cozies up to Russia and all roads lead to Russia when we all know how corrupt they are and what they have done, not only in the previous election, but what they are doing even as we are in the run-up to this election. And yes, my county, um, uh, uh, my state, uh, had two counties um, uh, that uh, hackers from Russia uh, uh, were successful. And he has the audacity to go out and say, now they don't talk about Russia in the elections, they're talking about Ukraine. Why is it that the president, as the chairman has pointed out, Closes up to a dictator like Duterte uh, uh, in the Philippines. Um, uh, why uh, uh, is he not looking right here in this hemisphere where we have not paid as much attention as we should? And I believe my colleague is going to address it, but I do need to raise uh, Venezuela, uh, and I haven't heard very much lately uh, from him with reference to Venezuela. I haven't heard very much from him about El Salvador. Haven't heard other than China uh, uh, dealing with trade. Um, anybody in here that doesn't believe China is corrupt, then you should just visit um, uh, any one of uh, the places where people are in gulags and being uh, held and how intellectuals and religious leaders um, uh, are being uh, tortured uh, in that country. And not to mention the chairman uh, uh, pointed to it as uh, what the president said, that he fell in love um, with Kim Jong-un. And Kim Jong-un is preparing missiles um, and if successful, may one day be able to reach this country and there's no reason to believe that he wouldn't. Is the president aware of what's going on in Italy? Is he aware of what's going on in India? Mm. How about Iran? I haven't heard him say a mumbling word about uh, what's happening in Iran. Is he aware of, of what's going on in Lebanon? Um, is he a, a, aware of uh, the corruption um, uh, that's being identified and how Chile is on the bubble? I, I, I just can't believe you people. Um, and let me turn now to this. <laughs> and ask you all, and I already know the answer. Can anybody in here, particularly those of us on the Rules Committee, name any other president 
in the history of the United States that has asked a foreign government or its leaders to investigate an American citizen for political purposes. Can anybody in here identify any president that has done that? Seeing none, <laughs> I, 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 I proceed. Um, uh, the simple fact of the matter is that my colleagues have determined that they're going to go down the road of distraction and are not going um, uh, uh, to discuss the facts in this matter. Let me tell you some of the people that you all should have heard from, and some would argue that we should wait until the courts, um, and I'm sure that the administration would fight all the way to keep Secretary Pompeo uh, from testifying, Sec uh, uh, John Bolton uh, from testifying, Mick Mulvaney, uh, Dan McGahn, uh, Don McGahn, the man that the president told to go and fire um, um, uh, uh, the FBI uh, uh, director. How about Robert Blair and Michael Duffy, the guys um, uh, from <coughs> Mick Mulvaney's shop where the aid uh, has been withheld? Now let me turn to this document. <laughs> First off, let me ask both of you whether you know um, if a full verbatim transcript exists of this July 25th call. Ms. Collins, do you know? I know that all the witnesses testified that this was clear and accurate transcript. Mr. Raskin, do you know whether a verbatim transcript exists? For the July 25th call? Yes. Well, um, that is not a verbatim transcript. Correct. Uh, that, that we have. That's a contemporaneous memorandum written by the White House. Um, but I've never seen, I've never seen a verbatim transcript. There's no witness testified. There was no witness that contradicted the, the statements in that and in, in, on any of the witnesses. Yeah. Excuse me? They did not. They said that the transcripts was accurate. Well, what about all of those people that testified before your committee that discussed matters that they thought were wrong that the president did. Well, Mr. Hastings, I wish we'd have had all those people testify before my committee, but they didn't. <coughs> okay. Let me turn to the footnote on this unclassified document that's in the record. It says a memorandum of a telephone conversation is not a verbatim transcript of a discussion. The text in, the, text in this document records the notes and recollections of Situation Room duty officers and NSC policy staff assigned to listen and memorialize the conversation in written form as the conversation takes place. A number of factors can affect the accuracy of the record, including poor telecommunications connections and variations in accent and or interpretation. The word, quote, inaudible, unquote, is used to um, indicate, uh, it, it says, indicate portions of a conversation that the note taker uh, was unable uh, to hear. Do either of you know why the full transcript is in a classified server that can be accessed only by the highest of of authorities insofar as classification uh, of their ability. Do any of you know why this thing is in a server? This classified server? No, no I cannot give you the, the full explanation of that. Mr. Collins? Mr. Morrison testified it was put there in administrative error. Mr. Morrison testified to that. In administrative error? That's his testimony, his words, not mine. Who is Mr. Morrison? The gentleman who testified at committee, Mr. Tim. Works at NSS. It, no. See, I'm sorry. Is he the person that put it in the server? Uh, no, he's the one that testified to it. to it. You'd have to ask him. Again, I would love to do all this. We would have loved to have had these witnesses actually in judicial. Would you have loved to have the server? I would love to have the, I'd love to have the witnesses. We got people running around Ukraine looking for a server under some crowd strike 
uh, notion. Yeah, you know, we also have 68% of the people bribing their public officials, too, and that's a Ukrainian issue as well. But on this one, yeah, there's, no, there's no credible witness who said there's anything in the uh, transcript that was uh, not there. I find None it, of your witnesses. None I of your find witnesses. it that the president goes out, issues this unclassified statement, and there's a statement out there somewhere in a classified server that may have gotten there mistakenly, according to Mr. Morrison, as you're testifying. But my question ultimately would be, why is it there? Why hasn't it been retrieved? And why have you all uh, uh, not received it? But I digress. Let me go on and finish up with this Hastings, unclassified statement. Can I ask this question? There's an implication, and I would just like a clarification. Are you implying there's another transcript out there? I'm implying that there's more than what we have here okay, which that's no in witness, the server. Okay, which no witness testified to. No Understood. witness of your witnesses testified to. Understood. And I was but, just making sure that you didn't believe that there was another transcript out there. I don't know what's out there. I know well, something is like, in this server. Well, that's about like us with the Intelligence Committee's findings as well that they haven't transferred over to the judiciary. I'd like to see what's in the server. I'd love to see what's from the Intelligence Committee that's supposed to have been turned over on H660 as well. You and I so could I think go, you and I are in agreement there. Yeah, Thank in you. that regard. Uh, uh, we are. I would also, let me tell you what even the media in dealing with this statement have not gone into certain of its particulars. Here is what was said by Mr. Zelensky, and I'm truncating this so that I can get off uh, and let other members go about their business. He said, I would also like to thank you for your great support. This is Mr. Zelensky talking to President Trump on July 25th in the area of defense. We're ready to continue to cooperate for the next steps. Specifically, we're almost ready to buy javelins from the United States for defense purposes. President Trump replies, I'd like you to do us a favor, though. This is from the man talking about buying javelins. He goes immediately to, I'd like for you to do us a favor, though. And a lot of emphasis has not been placed on that language, and I'm not a linguistic uh, person, but the last time I recall somebody asking me to do a favor, though, it was for something uh, that they wanted, and I can't believe that policy um, is what he was talking about. He goes on to say, because our country has been through a lot, and Ukraine knows a lot about it, I'd like you to find out what happened with this whole situation with Ukraine. They say, CrowdStrike, I guess you have one of your wealthy people the server, um, uh, they say Ukraine has it. There are a lot of things that went on, uh, the whole situation. I think you're surrounding yourself with some of the same people. I'd like, you, I'd like to have the attorney general, meaning our attorney general. And my question is, why would you like the attorney general to call you or your people? And I'd like you to get it, to get to uh, the bottom of it. As you saw yesterday, that whole nonsense ended with a very poor, poor performance by a man named Robert Mueller, an incompetent performance. Um, uh, but they um, uh, say a lot of it started with Ukraine. And my question is, who said that? The only people I know that said that are the Russians. Uh, yes, Mr. <laughs> Mr. Aysen, thank you very much for raising this important point. Um, Dr. Fiona Hill, leading Russia expert, um, who figures importantly in this whole matter, uh, has testified before this committee, and it's completely uncontradicted and unrefuted, that this crowd strike story about Ukraine being the one that attacked our election in 2016 is Russian disinformation. The president there was essentially just repeating Russian disinformation and propaganda. 
either wittingly or unwittingly. It seemed innocent enough. He, he really thought he, he thought he had something there, but that's what he was repeating. There's nothing behind it. It has been completely debunked and discredited. Mm -hmm. But what makes me suspicious, Mr. Hastings, is that he decided to tie that in with his other plan, oh, okay. which is to get President Zelensky to come and to point the finger at Joe Biden and say, this is a guy we're investigating. And you know, you talk about national security and how national security was compromised. And obviously, America's a country that nations all over the world look to. And we're interested in our, the security of our land and our people, but also that of our allies and our strategic partners around the world. And we should have some interest in what happens to Ukraine and whether Russia is going to get to trample Ukraine or not. But here's another way that national security is implicated. If we say that forever hereafter, we're going to allow the President of the United States to use the awesome powers of his office to shake down particular governments, whether they are tyrants and despots, like Duterte in the Philippines and Orban in Hungary and Putin in Russia and Sisi in Egypt, or they're Democrats, struggling democ democracies that need our help, like the reformer Zelensky in Ukraine. But the president is now allowed to shake them down, to get them involved on a covert basis in our campaign. Guess what? The president might think he's slick by getting away with that, but now there's a foreign government that's got, got something, something on us. Mm -hmm. it's they have leverage on us at that point. It, it turns out... Mr. Stacey, would you allow me? Of course. Thank you. I know you're always great at this. Look, I think the process is wrong. I think we're looking the, the wrong direction here. And I think it is interesting that we can talk about all the other corruptions around the world and, and the dislike of the way this president has dealt with them. But we also have to remember, even in the transcript that you just read, it is a backwards look, not a forwards look. It is a 2016 look at what happened then. And you rightly read the transcript that he was talking about Robert Mueller, which was coming out of the 2016 election, all that problems Did that were coming out. Did you read the Mueller I read, report? I read every bit of it, sir. That's my committee. And you disagree and I, with the findings? I, I agree with the findings. No, no collusion from Russia, and that he disagreed even with every member of the judiciary. And the part that obstruction. says that there were 10 obstructions of justice and, and by if, the president, do you agree with that? No, they not, because he did. Because he did. Because obviously you didn't listen to the Judiciary Committee when ex several members of the Judiciary Committee outlined in pretty PowerPoints on the screen, here's this, here's this, there, and then we look at him and say, but I disagree with your conclusion. Mm -hmm. I say, so you have, to, like, you have to take the whole transcript. And this is what I'm talking about here. When you look at it here, he's looking backwards. The Mueller report had just been done. I, I'm, but Ms. I'm Fiona Hill. I'm going to reclaim my time and look. Because okay, Fiona at Hill it. is interesting. and I would Because he brought up Fiona Hill, and I just want to say this one thing. Ukrainians, not Ukraine, but Ukrainians, even Fiona Hill said the Ukrainians bet on the wrong horse. And after being reminded by Ken Vogel that the various Ukrainian officials uh, Leshenko, I can't pronounce the then-powerful Ukrainian parliament, Leshenko was spinning tales and providing false information to Nelly Orr, information that we all know was made its way into Steele dossier. This was aligning themselves with Clinton. Mr. So Collins, it was backwards. Mr. Look, that's Collins, all I'm saying. You, 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 were you there when Ms. Hill testified? Not for Ms. Hill's testimony. No. All right, but you have all uh, seen... I'm, I'm happy to read the transcript just like you all are. All I can tell you is uh, she dropped a dime on um, uh, President Trump's actions in uh, Ukraine. But not enough to find it in the articles of impeachment. Well, perhaps alone, uh, standing and that's alone. Where, and abuse of power is, again, we've disagreed on this. And this is where we can honestly just disagree. I disagree that abuse of power is a categorical right. catch-all for this. I'm going to yeah, reclaim where, my time and I, and because you're you you, you, you. You going to filibuster. Thank and I'm going to reclaim my time from you as well. Yeah. Both of y'all talk pretty fast, uh, no, I might add, in defense of Mr. Collins for a minute. Uh, it's very... Continuing, what President Trump says is it's very important that you do it if it's possible. Truncating again because it's so much in here, um, um, but I'll try to start mid-paragraph with Mr. Uh, Zelensky's reply, uh, reply. I'd also like and hope to see him having your trust. He's talking about an ambassador that he's sending to the United States and your confidence and have personal relations with you so we can cooperate even more so. I'll personally tell you that one of my assistants spoke with Mr. Giuliani just recently, and we're hoping very much that Mr. Giuliani will be able to travel to Ukraine and we will meet once he comes uh, uh, to Ukraine. My question there is, meet about what? <laughs> when, when Giuliani comes to uh, Ukraine. And the president just recently said that Giuliani is a 
a, a, a good man and a patriot, and he's, done, he's doing this for love. Last time I bought an airline ticket, I didn't present something that said love. And the question becomes, who's paying uh, Giuliani? I have a theory about it, but I won't go into it. He then goes on to say, I just wanted to assure you once again that you have nobody but friends around us. I'll make sure um, uh, that I surround myself with the best and most experienced people. He goes on at some point so we can continue our strategic partnership. I also plan to surround myself with great people in addition to that investigation. I guarantee as the president of UK or Ukraine that all the investigations will be done openly and candidly. That I can assure you. Then Trump says, good, because I heard you had a prosecutor, I think he's talking about uh, Proshenko, who was very good and he was shut down and that's really unfair. A lot of people are talking about that the way they shut your very good prosecutor down and you had some very bad, bad people involved. Mr. Giuliani is a highly respected man. He was the mayor of New York City, a great mayor, and I'd like him to call you. I'll also, uh, I, I will ask him to call you along with the Attorney General. Rudy very much knows what's happening, and he is a very capable guy. If you could speak to him, that would be great. The former ambassador from the United States, the woman, was bad news, and the people she was dealing with in the Ukraine were bad news. So I just wanted to let you know that. The other thing, there's a lot of talk about Biden's son, that Biden stopped the prosecution, and a lot of people want to find out about that. So whatever you can do with the attorney general would be great. Biden went around bragging that he stopped the prosecution. So if you can look into it, it sounds horrible uh, to me. Now then, Zelensky says, truncating again, um, uh, that since we have won the absolute majority in person, my uh, candidate who will be approved by the parliament and will start as a new prosecutor in September, he or she will look into the situation, specifically to the company. And my guess is he's talking about Burisma uh, in that particular incident, mentioned in this issue. The issue of the investigation of the case is actually the issue of making sure to restore uh, uh, the honesty, so we will take care of that and we'll work on the investigation of the case. On top of that, I'd kindly ask you if you have any additional information that you can provide us. It would be very helpful for the investigation to make sure that we administer justice in our country with regard to the ambassador to the United States from Ukraine. As far as I can recall, her name was Ivanovich. Hmm. Now that lady didn't deserve um, uh, President Trump commenting that she was going to go through some things, and I quote him. Hmm. I'll have Mr. Giuliani give you a call. And I'm also going to have Attorney General Barr call, and we'll get to the bottom of it. I'm sure you'll figure it out. I heard the prosecutor was treated badly. Now, everybody in the European Union, friends of mine knew that Proshenko was a crook, and there's nobody in this room that does not know that, and Trump very well knew that, or should have, or had poor staffing or during that period of time. I'm gonna end here where he says, good. Well, thank you very much, and I appreciate that. I'll tell Rudy and Attorney General Barr uh, to call. Um, and <laughs> I just can't believe that Perry and Sunderland and Rudy, Gi Rudy Giuliani or whoever the three uh, uh, amigos were were running around in Ukraine in some fashion aside from the diplomatic responsibilities that we have with any country. And yes, Mr. Collins, we do have an FBI. We do have people that do investigations in foreign countries when there are commissions of um, uh, uh, crimes, um, and we don't use um, uh, uh, people running around. Otherwise, they could have used me. I was on the Intel Committee. 
Uh, and people could have asked me, I went to Ukraine. I did, after the Orange Revolution, the monitoring that led to them being able to stand up their uh, government. And thanks to the Luth Lithuanians and the Polish, along with Zbigniew Brzezinski at that time, um, uh, that we were able to do that. And then I went back a second time to Ukraine uh, to monitor their election. So I'm no rookie uh, in this stuff. Uh, but when it comes to policy, what we have here is a corrupt president that wanted to do something to advance his political circumstances. And as the chairman said, that is so wrong. What say you, Mr. Ashton? Well, thank you. First of all, I'm moved by your statements and also by your work for democracy and for freedom and anti-corruption in Europe. And I know that that's something that has been very important to you. The president essentially empowered um, and uh, outsourced um, an alternative channel to the regular Department of State and National Security Council officials. And Rudy Giuliani, as you say, was at the heart of it. We have lots of testimony from witnesses who said whenever the president got some kind of report on Ukraine, he would say, talk to Rudy, talk to Rudy. In other words, Rudy's got the franchise on Ukraine. And we know what Rudy wanted to do is recently today we had an update on it. Rudy now puts himself front and center in the campaign to on smear. On Fox News this morning. He put himself front and center in the campaign to smear our ambassador, the US ambassador to Ukraine who was fighting corruption who is one of the world's leading mm -hmm. anti-corruption fighters, and she understood that Ukraine had a chance here with the election of President Zelensky. And instead of bolstering Ukraine, helping them, getting the aid that we voted for them, aid that had been approved by the Department of Def Defense, having cleared all of the anti-corruption criteria that we had legislated, and the Department of State, which had done that, all the T's are crossed, all the I's are dotted, the money's set to go, the president holds it up, and then he puts this other team into action to engineer the shakedown against President Zelensky in order to get the political favor or the domestic political errand, as Dr. Fiona Hill said, that he wanted. It is, in my judgment, a shame of what happened. And my colleagues on the other uh, side of the aisle, I can't believe that they won't address the facts as you have just outlined them, and as I have attempted to, and as the chairman has, all they want to talk about is process. This ain't about process. This is about the president abusing his power. And you all will pardon me for not using my inside voice, uh, but y'all don't either. Um, I'll yield back, Mr. Chairman. I'm happy to yield now to the gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Woodall. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I rarely find myself in disagreement with my good friend from Florida. In fact, more often uh, than not, I find myself educated uh, by him. Uh, but I've got to disagree with him uh, today because this is all about process. It's all about process. The, I don't know how many minds were changed uh, when the gentleman from Florida read the transcript again. I suspect none. Probably the most single, read, uh, mo single most read transcript uh, in American history, folks know what they think that they know. But to my friend from Florida's point, is there, is there a verbatim transcript uh, somewhere? I don't know. You asked the question to the two witnesses that we had called to testify, two of the, the brightest members of, of uh, Congress in my estimation. They don't know. And if I understood my friend from, from Georgia correctly, there were no witnesses who are working on that uh, uh, transcript that you had an opportunity to talk to directly? No, we had no witnesses in judiciary. So, so my friend from Florida is rightly outraged by his perception of, of, of wrongdoing. I hope that he's equally outraged by the inability to get information, not just our inability, sitting here on the Rules Committee today, but your inability. If we had an Intelligence Committee member here, they could have answered Mr. Hastings' question. And I don't know. Well, I'll ask my, my friends, as, as Mr. Hastings did, is there somebody in this room, on this committee, that believes that the American people and our support of the Constitution that we've all sworn 
to uphold is threatened by having a member of the Committee of Jurisdiction be here to share with us. How are the American people advantaged by the absence of our, by the inability of our witnesses to answer Mr. Hastings' questions? How is America advantaged by that? My friend from Georgia, leading the Judiciary Committee, said that he was told, and I hope I'm misquoting you, uh, Mr. Collins, and I've misquoted you before, so I, I, I won't take any offense with your correcting me. I believe you said you asked the chairman about having a minority witness day, and he dismissed it as dilatory. Well, that was part of the including in the long letter that he read to us, yeah, that it was basically a dilatory day. Very similar to the letter that was given um, to Mr. Cole in answer. I, I have the letter that was sent to, to Mr. Cole, and, and uh, if, uh, if we needed a finer chairman on the Democratic side of the aisle, there, then we might have some other choices on our side, but there is no finer chairman on the Democratic side of the aisle than my chairman on the Rules Committee and the staff that he has to, to support him. But I don't know if you've seen the, the, the letter. I'll, I'll share with you what it says, Mr. Collins. Uh, it says that, uh, not to worry, uh, in this case, however, it says, Chairman Nadler has appropriately said that he will work with the minority to schedule their hearing. Will the gentleman yield to me? I'd be happy to yeah, You know, I, I, maybe he wasn't here when I referenced uh, Mr. Nadler's response before, but I'm quoting right here, where he says, I'm willing to work with the minority to schedule such a hearing. Uh, All right? I mean, yeah, I, I, oh, my, my, friend, my friend from Massachusetts misconstrues my statement. Oh, okay. I, I stipulate that what you're saying no, is, is absolutely yeah. true. Okay. Absolutely true. Okay. I, I Can was I only, reject? I was only going to ask. I was only yeah. going to ask my friend from Georgia what good it was going to do to hold the minority hearing two days or three days or three weeks after we voted to impeach the president of the United what, States. What in essence does it matter if you throw the person in jail and they say, "Oh, the innocence yeah. project will come around at some point and clear him"? Right. That's not what's happened here. You can't. I mean, you can't just say, "Oh, we'll get." Listen, if, if Chairman Nadler came to me and said, "You know, April first next year looks like a great day for your minority day hearing," what good does that do? Right. It does none. And again, it goes to the basic fairness. And I do want to say one thing, if you'll allow me, Mr. Please. Woodall. It, two things come up. One, there's no witness, period. No witness in the statement that d said that there was, number one, another transcript, or number two, that the transcript we have was not accurate. Okay, number, that's just a fact. The other thing is here is I have talked about process a lot, will continue to, but I have also acknowledged, and I have very, a very much of a factual defense of what I believe the facts are wrong here. I have made fact, you may disagree with my interpretation of the fact, but I have made a factual defense. I'll go back to it. We talked about the four things that we talked about that didn't change, the pressure, but there's also five meetings. Five meetings. If you want to draw a correlation between the conditioned aid and it should have come up. It would come up in these five meetings. On July 25th, we have the transcript of the call between the President and President Zelensky. On July 26th, Special Envoy Volker and Taylor met with President Zelensky. The alleged Lincoln aid and investigations never came up. August 27th, John Bolton met with President Zelensky. Lincoln aid never came up. September 1st, Vice President Pence met with Zelensky in Warsaw. Lincoln aid investigations never came up. On September 5th, Senators Johnson and Murphy met with Zelensky again. The supposed Lincoln aid never came up. I point out the last two because they're important, because the last two were after it became public knowledge through Politico that the aid was being held. Nothing came up. Facts matter. And when you don't have the right facts, then you have to go to the more amorphous topics. That's something I have fought on the facts. We may disagree about them, but I have fought back on facts. Mr. Raskin appropriately points out that uh, what we're doing is, is precedent uh, setting. Hopefully it's not unprecedented, but it is certainly precedent uh, setting. And I think he asked us to think of the right uh, question. And his question was, if this were a Democratic president, would your answer still be the same? I care less about the Republican president and Democratic president. I know Mr. Raskin has a love of the law. My question, Mr. Raskin, is how are the American people advantaged by Mr. Collins having no opportunity to put together a list of fact witnesses of his choosing, have them share their story, and then the very able majority on the Judiciary Committee, the Democrats, uh, cross-examine those witnesses. How are the American people advantaged by that absence? So, um, the, the first thing we need to say again is that the president and his team had the power to call whatever witnesses they wanted. Well, and, I, if, and, I, if, if I could reclaim my time for yeah. a moment, you've said that several times. Yeah. The first time you said it, you properly caveated it with, 
any of the 17 witnesses that the Democrats called on the Intelligence Committee, the President could have called any one of those Democratic witnesses back to testify again. I don't believe you mean the President has the right to call any witness that he wants in front of the Judiciary Committee. Well, For Pete's sake, she wouldn't even give the ranking member the right well, to call people doesn't. in front of the Judiciary Committee. He certainly did not have the right to call irrelevant witnesses, and so ultimately it would have been up to the chair to decide whether it, the person was relevant or not. So, so to be clear, so, there is the ability, because I'm misunderstanding, the president had the ability to call a witness into the Judiciary Committee other than the 17 witnesses that the Democrats on the Intelligence yeah. Committee decided they were going to deposition? He could have submitted names for anybody he wanted. Well, my, my ranking member submitted names, and the answer was no. Uh, no, we're not going to do that. But your, 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 well, your but definition of the fair and free process that advantages the American people is that the President could submit any name he wants to the chairman just gets to say no. But my dear Mr. Woodall, you understand that we're in the process of collecting information to establish an indictment, in, in essence, charges against the president. These are articles of impeachment. The trial process takes place in the Senate. That's where they conduct a trial, where their rules will govern, and anybody presumably will be able to bring in whatever witnesses they want to bring in. Now, we have tried to run a completely open, fair, and transparent process. Well, we're here. reclaiming my time for yeah. a moment because you have frequently, and you did when we established the, established the rules for the impeachment process in this yes. committee, uh, you have frequently referred to the grand jury uh, 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 room. The grand jury room is not intended to be a place of fairness. It's intended to be a place of indictment. Mr. You, you have said... I'd be happy to yield my friend from my Florida. My goodness gracious, what did you just say? That the grand jury room is, is not intended to provide fairness to any defendant. It is intended to indict. The, the, as my friend from, from uh, 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 Maryland simply stated, the, the defense comes next. Understood. But are you saying that prosecutors don't have any other responsibility in the grand jury other than to indict? Of, of, of course not. Okay. Of, of, I just want to not. make sure. Of, of course not. <laughs> Mr. Woodall. The, 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 the prosecutor has an obligation to the people that the prosecutor to serves in the, in, in the same way that we have that same obligation. And the words, I, I want to I quote him uh, correctly, uh, Mr. Raskin said there's been plenty of fairness uh, in, this, uh, in this process. And my question was, how are the American people advantaged by Mr. Collins getting absolutely no witnesses before the committee and the White House getting absolutely no witnesses in front of the, the committee? And, and the answer is, Mr. Woodall, this wasn't intended. Uh, no, to be a defense the of the president. If you heard me to say that, I clearly didn't make myself clear. Uh, uh, the president and Mr. Collins and the Republicans could have called any of the witnesses who appeared, any of the 17 sworn witnesses. Any of yours said any of the, It's I'm not sorry. yours or mine. These are American citizens. These, these are, are the Department of State. These are the these are these National are, Security are, Council uh, employees. Re reclaiming my time. Let me just, these I, let me, let me just say we, we can't speak yeah. over one another because the stenographer can barely keep up with us because we all talk so fast. Yeah. So if we're talking over each other, so just I, I caution everybody, the witnesses and members of the committee, just to ask a question, let the answer and... The, I, and and I am, I'm hamstrung, Mr. Chairman, uh, by the fact that Mr. Raskin isn't the decision maker on, on these uh, issues. And, and uh, again, to Mr. Collins' uh, point about the, the clock being the, the master, Mr. Nadler, Chairman Nadler, has put in uh, months of work uh, on this, not as much time as Chairman Schiff has put in uh, on this, but put in months of work, and we have neither of the two committee chairmen who have done all of the work here before us to answer our questions. And I have no doubt that, that Mr. Raskin is exasperated uh, uh, because he is, a, he is an answerer, and, and he, is an he is a fact provider, and he, he, uh, he educates this committee on a regular basis uh, on matters of the law. But it offends my sense of fairness that my ranking member can't have a witness of his choosing. I'm not talking about 100 witnesses. I'm talking about a witness of his choosing to come and that the process gets described over and over again as the White House had plenty of opportunity and everybody had an equal chance to, to question nonsense. 
nonsense. And to let that record uh, stand perpetuates the myth that this is supposed to have been a fair process. I would argue it, it could have been a fair process. It, it simply wasn't, Mr. Collins. Mr. Well, I, I just, just to be clear here, and I, and I think the, the operative word that, that my friend from Maryland said was tried. And I think I'll, I'll give a try, it just wasn't a real good one, to be fair in this. For me, and again, you can't have it both ways. You can't call it a grand jury in which only the prosecution calls witnesses. There's no exculpatory. They have to depend on the uh, prosecutor to be, you know, to live up to prosecutor integrity and all that kind of stuff. You can't have it and say we're a grand jury. And then on the other side and say we want to make it fair so that people can call witnesses and, be, and, and give their side of their defense. They don't call that side of the defense in a grand jury. They don't do that. So here's my here's the issue. If, I, if I've never been when I, in, in a court or when I was practicing, I never went to the prosecutor to say, who could I call? And the prosecutor says, well, you can call all of my witnesses. Well, at least right. at some point in that mix, Mr. Raskin, I believe, would at least, and, and others, on, even on the Democrats, I believe at least they would have to acknowledge that having the chairman determine relevancy of my witnesses called, or even the White House, is a problematic exercise because if they're determining relevancy, then they're discounting <laughs> any possibility, any possibility of exculpatory evidence coming from one of my witnesses. They're basically saying they're irrelevant so we don't want to hear from them and discounting any possibility, any, that they would be exculpatory. Well, so you, let's make that very clear. And this, that's why this was, again, we fell from a very unfair process. Now, Mr. Raskin, you said uh, earlier, and I think rightly, uh, you said some folks can't even, you can't concede that the call was not perfect. Surely folks could concede that things were not perfect. And, and, and Mr. Collins did not characterize the, the call as, as perfect. My question is, can't you concede what Mr. I, Collins I haven't heard has, anybody say that. Who, who said that? Mr. Collins uh, he said, uh, said was he wasn't right. trying to describe it as perfect. He was trying to describe it as non-criminal, uh, right? I, I, I'm misquoting. Uh, I'm misquoting his Wait, his statement. But uh, but but my my question my question to you is: Can yeah. you not concede yeah. that that having the the chairman who is who is leading the impeachment inquiry determine relevancy of the, for lack of a better word, defense witnesses is flawed? Yeah. So um, this was the exact same process that took place in the Clinton impeachment. It was the same process that took place in the Nixon well, impeachment, which is the minority gets the right to request witnesses, and if they're relevant, they will be accepted. It's hard to know what to do otherwise, especially in an environment where people are bringing all kinds of extraneous conspiracy theories to try to explain what's going on. Let, just you know? to, to quote your, you back to you, because I want to use the best sources I can yeah. uh, on, uh, on this material. When you, quoted the, when you cited the House rule that required the mar minority uh, witnesses uh, be heard, you said, is, is, in your recollection, that's not a conditioned precedent uh, to having the, the hearing and reporting the bill. And you are, of course, right. You're talking about the minority hearing provision. That's right. About having an independent hearing for the minority. That, that's yeah. right. There's absolutely no House rule that requires that we hear from the minority before not just the die has been cast, but the bill has been reported, passed on the floor, and sent to the president. That is not a requirement. And you are right that we should probably go back and look at that if we are truly trying to give the minority a voice. But you have to tell me how the American people are advantaged I'll tell By you hearing exactly. from exculpatory witnesses after the House has voted. Okay. First of all, if there is a name of an exculpatory witness, please put it forward. We've done nothing other than try to get all of the president's men to come uh -huh. in and testify. Uh -huh. It's the president who's been blockading Secretary Pompeo and yeah. Secretary Perry and the, the director of the Office and Management Budget and yeah. numerous other witnesses. Well, it's just, the, to me, it's the height of irony that... You guys are making the argument well, that somehow we don't want the evidence in. We want all the evidence. That's why we want to hold the president it, in obstruction it, it, of justice, because he's been preventing us right. from getting all It would not surprise me if you were right. So let me ask the yeah. gentleman from, from Georgia, is that uh, right? You submitted a list of witnesses but that it, you wanted to come to the committee, and the president said that, you, that those witnesses would not be allowed to testify? No, the president talked to me about that. No, no that's not the right. Interesting, the interesting no, thing, that's not right. The interesting thing is I found out something new today. This is why hearings actually are good. It may be even recalling when it's good. This is the first time I've ever heard in Mr. Raskin said it twice today that I could only, that if I'd have just called one of the 17, I'd have got him. That's been interesting. He said it a couple of times now, if not more, that if I'd have just called one, now they're having to correct him. But he, just, he said it several times, and I, and I understand this is tough, and, I, and, he should, and he is in a very tough position, and he's doing an admirable job for what he's doing. But it is interesting that we, that would come out, because I know he is an integral part of that team, that if I'd have just called one of the 17, they would have been accepted. 
which would have been interesting. Wouldn't it have then been logical for the chairman to call some of those 17 so that we could have at least had the impression we were actually doing our own interviews of these witnesses? Because what happened even in the Intel Committee was is some of the after you talked to them, they gave testimony, then they had to come back and some of them actually read up their uh, testimony. Why wouldn't we have brought them back say, okay, you've done this a couple of times, but we didn't get that in the, in the majority whose job it was to prosecute this didn't do that as well. Well, as you recall, we fought that on our side of the aisle when this process was being set up, thought it was odd that the Intelligence Committee was going to be the only one talking to, uh, to fact finders, tried to require that exculpatory evidence be provided to, do, to, the, to the Judiciary uh, Committee. I, I, I want to touch on one more piece of, of, of process because my, my friend from, from Florida raised it, and he raised it in the context of Mr. McConnell and, and uh, and Mr. Graham, Senator McConnell and Senator Graham, and that they should recuse themselves uh, because they've already picked a dog in this particular fight. I think we so often say things to one another around here that the American people end up listening to uh, that turned out uh, to be flawed. And, and again, I, I think everybody on this uh, committee has great respect for Mr. Raskin. He's not just a valuable member of the Judiciary Committee. He's an even more valuable member uh, of our uh, of our uh, rules Committee, um, but because I didn't have a chance, uh, when, I, when I found out I wasn't going to have a chance to talk to, to Mr. Nadler, I went and, and, and uh, uh, brushed up on, on Raskin policy, and I think they misquoted you, uh, to be fair, uh, Mr. Raskin, but you know, Salon did an interview with you uh, uh, even before the President was elected, and uh, their uh, headline uh, is at least one Democratic congressman is already preparing to impeach Donald Trump. The article is Donald Trump won't be sworn in for another 48 hours and at least one Democratic congressman has already seen enough. And you go on to talk about the emoluments uh, clause and, and your, your I, I think, legitimate uh, questions as a, as a constitutionalist uh, uh, about those, uh, uh, those issues. That was 48 hours before the president was sworn in. You're sitting on the grand jury that is impartially considering the evidence. And the emoluments clause that you were quoted as supporting impeachment on behalf of 48 hours before the president was even elected, I can't find anywhere in the articles that we see before us uh, today. It, have you changed your mind from then or do you think, as, some, as Politico is reporting, that we're going to see part two of impeachment uh, come down the road, that this was just impeachment number one, and there's going to be impeachment number two and impeachment number, number three? Thank you very much for that question. And I would love nothing more than to have a separate hearing on my personal views right. about the meaning of the Foreign Emoluments right. Clause and the Domestic Emoluments Clause. Right. I've written widely about right. it, including in the Washington Post. I've written several pieces about it. But I'm here to represent the Judiciary Committee because of the absence of Mr. Nadler. Right. And it wouldn't be fair for me to get into that because I would not be representing the views of the entire Judiciary yeah. Committee. I, I, think that's perfectly, uh, I think that's perfectly fair. Um, the, when we uh, voted uh, uh, to table, as, as uh, Mr. Cole referenced, in, in regard to Mr. McGovern's uh, uh, vote uh, in December of 17, uh, of course, you uh, uh, opposed that motion to table uh, as, uh, as well. Uh, and uh, at that time, uh, you said it was a vote out of, out of frustration um, and, and that what you wanted was a real inquiry, a real inquiry into corruption and criminality in the Trump administration. Now, this was two years before this phone call ever happened. And so, again, I'm looking at articles of impeachment here. Uh, I've got members of the Judiciary Committee who were certain of corruption and criminality in the, in the Trump administration. Uh, that exists nowhere here. And well, we're, Mr. Woodall, I mean, you would concede that there are other episodes of corruption in the business career of Donald Trump and in the political career, no? Uh, that, that are not part, at all part of this process. And so, I mean, I don't know if, that, look, there are patterns of conduct and behavior that have been noticed. One of them is extremely relevant to this investigation. That's what took place in 2016. That's when Donald Trump essentially invited in Russia. The whole world heard him say it, invited Russia to come into our election. He welcomed their interference. The special counsel of the Department of Justice found more than 100 contacts between the Trump campaign and uh, Russian nationals there. And then 
when it began to happen, uh, the president moved to obstruct the investigation. And that's in the Mueller report, which we talked about today, all of those episodes of corruption. So there is a pattern of evidence. And I don't know, look, when, when Bill Clinton got impeached for what he did, you could certainly find Republicans who had been calling for his impeachment for several years for other stuff. Right. There were conspiracy right. theories about him right. going on for years. That doesn't necessarily discredit what happened in the impeachment of Bill Clinton. Right. You've got to take it right. on its own terms. That's why we're yeah. trying to get back to the facts right. of what took place right. here with the Ukraine shakedown. I think you're mistaking my intent. I, I was not uh, citing uh, uh, comments that you'd made in the past to, to uh, put you as a never uh, Trumper whose sole uh, purpose uh, was to uh, to reverse a, uh, a legitimate American election. That was not my intent. My intent was to mention you as someone who's a thoughtful uh, legal mind who had other legal concerns going back for years. And when folks say, Rob, what do you mean this process is rushed? We've done it over uh, uh, just under 90 days. Isn't that long enough? Well, no, that's faster than any other process. That's faster than it. Well, we've got a response from the Justice Department when we ask for our Fast and Furious uh, uh, documents. But, uh, but what it isn't is a complete process, I think by your own testimony here, that there's more that we could have done that we didn't do. And my question then is, because I do think we're all about advantaging the American people and the Republic and the Constitution, are we advantaged? Are the American people advantaged? By, uh, because, again, Politico is reporting that the investigations are going to continue, that the investigations do not stop with the House vote tomorrow. We will continue to investigate the potential impeachment of the president long after we have already voted to impeach the president, is the story uh, that, uh, that, that is, is out there today. Mm -hmm. Are we advantaged as an institution to have impeachment number one and impeachment number two and impeachment number three instead of, as we did in the Bill Clinton era, put all of the articles into a single document after a longer and more thorough uh, investigation and, and have this process sent to the Senate just once. I believe, I'm gonna ask my staff to, just to confirm this, I believe the Clinton investigation moved much more quickly after the Starr report arrived in Congress mm -hmm. than we have so far, but we'll check the days on you. But I think they're approximately in the same ballpark. But look, your basic question is an excellent one. You ask an excellent question here. And all I can say is that we have a clear and present danger to our democracy right now because of the electoral corruption. This president invited in a foreign power to come and interfere in our election. And he used all of the resources of his office to coerce President Zelensky to come in to make these announcements he wanted for a totally political purpose. That's this election, it's going on right now. And so we've gotta deal with this. And we have a very serious and complicated problem to address as a country right now, which is do we want to establish that this can be the norm going forward? That any president, whether their last name is Trump or Obama or Woodall or anything else can go to foreign governments in the middle of a campaign, lure them in, either through coercion or through honey, whatever it might be, and get them to participate in our election. That's a really serious problem. So, look, I agree with you. They're, they're, uh, and, uh, you know, you, you ask a trenchant question, Mr. Woodall. There are other things that are not part of this, but that is because of the urgency of this situation. I, I, I take that uh, I Rob, take that point, Mr. Collins. I say it again, clock and calendar. That's why we're doing it. That's what it is. That's why we say things like it's an imperative, ongoing, whatever you want to call it. It's a clock and calendar issue. And look, we already know that this, when this fails, there'll probably be others. That has been reported widely, not just in, in uh, you know, magazine, out of straight out of the words of Mr. Schiff, out of straight out of the words of Mr. Green, other colleagues that we've had. And again, it's, it's uh, Professor Turley said it this way, the current lack of proof is another reason why an abbreviated investigation in this matter is so damaging to the case for impeachment. It doesn't have the, the footing on it. And if you're doing it because you want to get into an election, when obviously the discussion was a previous one, which there was, you know, issues that we that was looking at, then I can't help you and time and calendar will take over. Well, we're talking today about reversing America's last election. Uh, candidly, I have every bit as much concern about the time that we will reverse the next election, or the election after that, or the election after that, to do this in a partisan way, of course there are always going to be differences of opinion. I disagree with my chairman about uh, uh, much more than I agree with him about, uh, but that doesn't mean that we can't find a process to move forward on together. It is not 
uh, more divided in this Congress today uh, than it was in 1998 uh, when folks found a process that they could work on together because as much as we cared about the presidency then, uh, we cared more about the Constitution later. Uh, and we found a way to move forward. And moving forward in a partisan way is going to have repercussions. I know my friend from Maryland knows that. He believes it's urgent enough that it's worth the risk. Uh, but it is a measurable and substantial risk. Uh, and uh, certainly the 13 of us, uh, uh, 14 with, with Mr. Collins here today, are going to be uh, judged on that front because despite our own personal interest in the facts, we are not a fact committee. We are a process uh, committee, and I don't believe America is going to judge us harshly because of the way the facts come out. I think America is going to judge us harshly because of the process uh, that has come forward. And with that, I yield back. Mr. Well, I thank the gentleman. I, I, let me just say, I, I, I um, you know, uh, you know, you know, we keep on hearing a lot about uh, the clock and calendar, um, but I would remind everyone that we are here because of abuse and obstruction. Uh, and um, the president's abuse of power and obstruction of Congress. That's why we're here. Uh, and, you know, I said in my opening, and I'll say this again, um, I mean, we just have a difference of opinion. The, 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 my friends try to characterize this as trying to overturn the last election. I look at this, you know, as a crime in progress, um, and that we're trying to prevent the president from rigging the next election. And again, um, I, I have ne I've never, ever, ever seen or witnessed a moment like this where a president of either party has publicly invited foreign intervention uh, in our election. He did it when he was running for, for president. Uh, he did it with Ukraine. And, um, and, I, and, and the administration has purposely decided not to cooperate, uh, to drag their feet, hoping that, you know, we'll get through the next election. I mean, this is, I said it's wrong. I mean, it is beyond the pale. And, um, and we just have a difference of opinion on this. I yield to the gentlelady from California, Ms. Torres. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, and, and thank you to um, both of you for being here. I also want to thank uh, my colleagues that have spoke um, before me today um, for using your indoor voice and um, for exercising a decorum. We are on the third floor of the U.S. Capitol, and I think it's important for us um, to be respectful with each other. Um, today, we regrettably face one of the most solemn duties the Constitution vests in Congress. I, like all of you here, did not come to Congress to impeach a president. As a matter of fact, on January 20th of 2017, I stood in the freezing rain to watch Donald Trump be sworn in as the 45th President of the United States. I was there in good faith. I was there because I believe in the peaceful transfer of power. I was there because I believe in the rule of law. And maybe foolishly, I also believe in second chances, that we would have elected someone who can stand up and represent all Americans. But then in September, approximately three months ago, we learned that President Trump had withheld critical military funding to Ukraine, a strategic partner in a war with Russia. And then October 3rd, President Trump announced that China and Ukraine should investigate his political rivals on national TV. The president's personal attorney also said that Biden should be investigated. Now, President Trump famously said, that he could shoot someone dead in the middle of Fifth Avenue in New York City, and he would get away with it. What mindset do you have to be in to say that out, out loud on national TV and to believe that? 
Well, anyone who turns a blind eye to behavior like this is providing him that right. Five GOP primaries have been canceled. Kansas, Alaska, South Carolina, Arizona, Nevada. GOP, the Republicans across the nation are locked in step to defend at any cost the bad actions and illegal actions of this president. The facts are clear. To quote the USA Today editorial board, Trump used your tax dollars to shake down a vulnerable foreign government to interfere in a US election for his personal benefit. Ambassador Gordon Sondland, President Trump's handpicked ambassador to the European Union, testified to President Trump abuse of power under oath. And he said, I know that members of this committee have frequently framed these complicated issues in a form of a simple question. Was there a quid pro quo? As I testified previously with regard to the request to the to the requested White House call and White House meeting, the answer is yes. We also have the rough transcript of Trump's July 25th call, released by the president himself. For all the claims that President Trump was withholding military aid over corruption in Ukraine, he never once utters the word corruption in the call. He does ask for a favor, though, a favor that has nothing to do with US national interest and everything to do with his own political interest. Trump's actions were clear abuse of presidential power. He conditioned official acts of office on a political advantage in the next election. Think about that. All of us here, members of Congress, have taken ethics training on the House rules and on federal crimes. I just did the training last week. We've all sworn the same oath of office to protect and defend our Constitution. And imagine, imagine if a city in our districts ask for our help with a grant or an appropriations request, would any of us reply, I would like you to do us a favor, though, and announce an investigation into my political opponent? Of course not. And why would you not do that? Because no one, no one is above the law not even the president. And you know that asking for that type of favor is illegal. The rule of law is what gives our great country its strength. The rule of law is what separates us from third world countries where dictators reign for decades on. The rule of law is what makes us our great country, the envy of the world, the place that other countries look for inspiration as they grow their own democracies. And it is the rule of law that brings all of us here today. And as the only member of Congress from Central America, take it from me that we never want to see a day when the rule of law simply fades away. I never want to see a day where American families have to send their children to live outside of the country because of public corruption. 
Look at Honduras. Their constitution banned presidential reelections. Their constitution clearly states that if presidents try to get rid of the reelection ban, that they should be removed from office immediately. And despite all of this, President Juan Orlando Hernandez ran again anyway. And the Supreme Court in Honduras, filled with his supporters, got rid of term limits. And he is now serving his second term in violation of his country's founding principles. Honduras is now a narco state. And we have thousands of Honduran families at our southern border seeking asylum. In Guatemala, the people have been waging an uphill battle against corruption for years. Former President Otto Perez Molina took bribes in exchange for lower taxes. Millions of tax dollars lined the pockets of high-ranking officials instead of meeting the needs of the people in one of the poorest countries in Latin America. Today, President Trump said, after a meeting with President Morales, in Guatemala, they handle things much tougher than the US. Imagine that. CSIG, the anti-corruption organization formed to bring justice to Guatemala, brought hundreds of cases of corruption to light. But once again, they began, once they began investigating President Jimmy Morales for illegal campaign financing, he promptly shot down the commission. Does this sound familiar to anyone? President Morales even forced the former Attorney General, Thelma Aldana, who worked to fight corruption to seek asylum in the United States because her safety is now at risk. Does this sound familiar to anyone? I bring these examples up to remind my colleagues that the future health of our democracy is not assured. We can slide back to tyranny, one corrupt act at a time. And until our democracy is like the fake village in North Korea that faces the DMZ, a nice looking facade that masks the tyranny within. That's why the articles of impeachment are so important. Mr. Chairman, the Constitution did not come from a higher power. It is just a document a piece of paper with words written on it. But, but we, the people, give the Constitution its power. We, the people, decide to follow and honor our laws. And today, we, the people, must agree that the laws apply to everyone, including the President of the United States. That that is the president that we expect of all elected officials. And it is the president that we must reaffirm in these proceedings. 60 years ago, Martin Luther King issued a warning during the civil rights era, which resonates very much with the choice before us today. And Dr. King said, if you fail to act now, history will have to record that the greatest tra tragedy of this period of social transition was not the strident clamor of the bad people, but the appalling silence of the good people. Let's move forward. I, I want to ask you, do you know how many witnesses were blocked from testifying? Um, I think I may have to ask Calvin, but I believe that there are nine administration witnesses who may come in that do not control the microphone. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, I, somebody will correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that 
that there were nine administration witnesses who were called who did not come forward. And if I might, Ms. Torres, I'm moved by what you had to say. I was not aware that there were GOP primaries being canceled. canceled. Um, it allows us to refocus on the importance of elections and sovereignty of the people. I know some people would say, well, that's just a private affair. Let them do their own thing. But forgive the law professor and me, but there's a whole line of cases, Smith versus Allwright, Terry versus Adams. It's called the white primary line of authority, which says that party primaries are actually essential for the voting rights of all citizens. And equal protection does apply there. So I, you know, but I know Republicans in five states are being denied an opportunity to choose a Republican um, candidate to move forward and represent them. So the, the, Five. The, general, the, the general point there is that our system is based on the idea of popular self-government, so you need to have the channels of effective political participation open so people can participate and people can compete. Competition is good in economics, it's good in sports, it's good in politics too. We want to have a play of ideas and a marketplace of ideas so we're able to get the best ideas out there. But the other critical point you made, and thank you for pointing us to the Central American and the Latin American example, because there's been a lot of instability in democracy there where it's under attack by despots and dictators and corrupt forces, and we're seeing this all over the world now. What's taking place in America has got to be seen in a global context. There are dictators, despots, tyrants, kleptocrats, and Putin is one of the ringleaders, and Orban in Hungary, who's championing illiberal democracy, and Sisi in Egypt, and Duterte in the Philippines, and the homicidal crown prince of Saudi Arabia, and on and on. And they're all besieging democracy. And who is the beacon of hope for the world in terms of democracy? America is. And we've so, got to show how it's really done. I'm going to ask you one last question. Did witness intimidation occur during your committee hearing? The, the, to, to be clear, there were nine senior officials who refused congressional subpoenas. On what grounds? Um, well, um, they, 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 there were different statements made by different of them. Some of them said that, that uh, it was because of uh, an executive branch policy. Um, and so and I'd have to go back and look and see which ones invoked this or that doctrine, perhaps. I'm not sure. But we've never seen anything like this uh, in scale, in scope, in degree in American history. A we just have not. And the chairman of the Intelligence Committee and the chair of the Judiciary Committee have praised those people who've come forward. And if I could, if you would allow me just one thought about this, I think it's been said a couple of times, your witnesses. I think there were multiple witnesses there who totally recoiled and rebelled against the idea that they were anybody's witness. These are people who've devoted their lives to the State Department, the National Security Council, serving the American people. We have people in there like Ambassador Taylor, a decorated Vietnam War hero. We have um, uh, the, the Lieutenant Colonel um, who was injured in, uh, in Iraq, is a Purple Heart winner. We have Fiona Hill, we have Ambassador Yovanovitch, whose family fled Nazi Germany and Stalinist Russia and committed her whole career to American democracy as an example. These people are not majority witnesses or minority witnesses or these are ours. The vast majority of them said, we're not here in any partisan context. We're not here with any partisan purpose. We're here to tell the truth. And they swore an oath to tell the truth. Those people went under oath. They are not throwing tomatoes from the sidelines, they went under oath and told exactly what they saw and what they heard, and we have their direct testimony. And rather than commending them for their courage, someone on Twitter decided to intimidate and diminish their testimony. You know, I, I never thought in my lifetime we would get to a point where the President of the United States heckles people for doing their civic duty of going under oath to tell the truth. Hey, Mr. Chairman, would, would, I yield. Oh, would my friend yield just I one will moment? I absolutely yield to you. I was similarly shocked, uh, and, uh, as Mr. Raskin was, when I heard folks were canceling their, their primaries. Uh, so since South Carolina happens to be my neighbor, I went back and looked, and it turns out that's just something that they do. They did it for Reagan and Bush, and they did it for Clinton and Obama, that uh, the party that's in power and has the White House 
in the name of saving dollars uh, cancels. And I just, I share that with you because I was comforted when I heard that it was a historical practice as opposed to something that had just and, and I, I appreciate I, thank my I, I appreciate your um, your feedback on that. Um, I'm going to yield back to right. Mr. Thank Chairman. you very much. So I think the committee is going to take a, a five minute break so we, you can stretch your legs and do whatever else you need to do. Three. All right. Is there any piece of back? Yeah, yeah this is strict five minutes if we can. All right. Without objection, the committee stands. Is anybody there?
Texas, Dr. Burgess. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank our witnesses for uh, <clears throat> staying with us throughout all of this. Uh, I know you've been through a lot already, but I, uh, I can't help but be struck by the fact that uh, this does seem to be proceeding rather rapidly. Um, it did, after all, all start with a phone call. No, not with the phone call in July, but with a phone call in November when Molly Hemingway overheard incoming Chairman Nadler talking to constituents on the telephone and said that impeachment of the president was going to be of the highest order. So although there's not a transcript of that call, uh, it was well documented um, in social media, and that seems to be one of the things that we can now use as... <clears throat> evidence that can be introduced. Mr. Collins, correct me if I'm wrong, but it does seem like this is an exercise, and I think this is reflected in your uh, dissenting views that you submitted. This seems like impeachment first, build the case second. It does. And 
there is an inherent problem with that, of course, in that uh, the old saying goes, when your whole when your only tool is a hammer, the whole world looks like a nail. And uh, you've already alluded to the clock and calendar. And I would also submit that this does seem like we are we are busily trying to find the, the data that would actually define the crime so we can then prosecute the crime. Um, the difficulty, and again, this is reflected in your minority views, the, the difficulties for, for future presidents and indeed future Congresses, it says uh, in these dissenting views, if partisan passions are not restrained, the House of Representatives will be thrown into an endless cycle of impeachment, foregoing its duty to legislate and usurping the place of the American people in electing their president. And, you know, we have seen a week, or we are seeing a week this week, unlike any other that we have seen this year, in that today we voted on the appropriations for $1.4 trillion. We are going to vote tomorrow, I think, on articles of impeachment. And then on Thursday, we're going to vote on approving a significant and important trade authorization that has actually been basically agreed to for the past year, but we're just now bringing it up this week. And I guess it just begs the question, the committees of jurisdiction, certainly your committee has been involved in this a lot of time, and your committee has been taken up with this process. No question, the Intelligence Committee has been doing this work. I don't know if they had other work they should have been doing this fall, but they've been doing this work exclusively. And although I'm a member of the Committee on Energy and Commerce, and certainly we have our jurisdictional tussles with the Committee on Ways and Means, it bothers me that the Committee on Ways and Means has had to give up their hearing room for all of these weeks so that intelligence and then judiciary could hold uh, the hearings on the articles of impeachment in, in the Ways and Means hearing room. Does this bother anyone else that all of Congress's attention has been diverted to this at the exclusion of every other process? Uh, it bothers me. Believe me, I, I'll let the Ways and Means folks, no offense to them, I'll let them keep their room. Uh, I prefer you know, judiciary and, and others. Look, I, I'm not going to, you know, be one. I think that we've had a, a large number, especially the Judiciary Committee this year. We have passed other bills, and I will disagree with those. And there's some we've actually made bipartisanly, but it's not been. It's, it's been a start and stop process. I remember when uh, impeachment was taken away from us, and is the way we've described it. And, and in September, uh, we went like almost a two two and a half week period. We didn't know what to do. I mean, because we, we literally had been doing so much of investigations and Mueller and everything that there was nothing in the hopper, so to speak, for us to move forward on. And the, and the chairman did a good job, I think, trying to recover from that. And, you know, I disagree with some of the bills that we passed, but they, at least we had some other hearings. Um, I think over time, without elaborating on this a, a great deal, I think the biggest issue that we have here is at the end of the day, there's, there, I think there's, not a, there's a large decision being made. And that decision is being made on we need to do this you know, now, and, and I'll, I disagree vehemently with the majority on this, this opinion. We need to do this now. But I do, after taking a step back, look at the, because we've had to live with it in judiciary in particular this year, the institutional discussion and damage, as I would call it, to our rules and our processes and our things. Those are the things that concern me, you know, the most whether I'm here or not, because the good thing, you know, the, the logical thing is most all of us here will not be here in, you know, a number of years, whatever that years may be, but there will be others. And, you know, the Intelligence Committee is a committee you used to never hear of. It was a committee that was, it did its job in silence in the dark in the basement. You know, I, when I first got here, Mike Rogers and Mr. Doug Rushenberger, they, they, I, I thought they were combined, because I, every time I saw them, I saw both of them together. And now it's become a committee that I don't think it ever, ever intended to be. And I don't think it should have had it this time. It could have been handled differently. I may disagree with the findings of my, of my judiciary colleagues and even Intel colleagues, but this should have never been in Intel to start with. And I just disagree inherently with that. It, there were other committees that could have handled it properly. I just don't think this was where it should be. But I know sort of, I feel like I know why it was, but it just shouldn't have been down there. Well, and the optics of having this done absolutely in secret in a 
secure compartmentalized facility downstairs, not just in secret, but behind locked doors with armed guards up front. Well, and especially when none of it was classified. I mean, that's the whole different issue. I mean, if it was all non-classified, then why, in the, why you know, do that? And again, they're, they're, I'm, I'm not going to, we're late in the day and I'm tired and everybody else is tired. Uh, you know, th there are reasons that it was happening, but you know, they did it for a purpose. They got the intended result. But again, it was not classified. And really what bothered me was, is you're talking about the, the rules, and I talked to the, you know, the, the House parliamentarians and others, there was no reason we could have not got that information before it was decided to be released. I'm a member of Congress. I could have went to any of those committees, and I did go to two of those committees and was turned down to get that information while it was going on. That was a, just a flagrant violation of House rules. And you can, you can dress it up and make it look better and say, well, it was all in a bigger cause, but that leads us down some pretty bad roads as well. And, and I will tell you, you've been a member of this committee in the past, so you know the responsibility that rests with this committee. Anything that comes to the floor is going to come through us. We set the rules and the parameters around the debate, so it is an important job that is done up here. It certainly has bothered me that all of this activity was done downstairs and in secret and we weren't allowed, even as a member of the Rules Committee, I was not allowed to review the transcripts until uh, very late in the process. There's a lot of material that was collected. I knew that as a member of the Rules Committee, eventually I was going to be asked to render some sort of judgment, but it was virtually impossible to keep up then with the volume of, of information that when it came out, there was a lot that came out. You are also doing now your open hearings in both in, in both intelligence and, and then subsequently judiciary. So there was a lot of material with which to keep up. Um, but let me just ask you, were all of the transcripts that were uh, collected down in the intelligence committee secure room, were all of those made available to all members of Congress? No. We still have one. That, we know of one that is still out that is, is still lacking. That's the Inspector General of the Intelligence Community's report. And also, Mr. Is, is it, may I ask, is that classified information? You'd have to ask Mr. Schiff, but he doesn't seem to want to talk about that on the record. So, I mean, he, he just keeps it. He, we don't have it. But it also is a violation of 660. It, it, it's a violation, clearly a violation of 660. Um, the White House, we know, has not got all the information sent to them. That's a clear violation of 660. Well, you say 660. That's the House Resolution 660. The House Resolution that authorized that was, the That came out of this committee, yes. And, but I want to also say one thing, and again, not to be, you know, not trying to be controversial here, but you must made a statement that should really, frankly, bother every member, no matter what committee they serve on. They could, and I'm not going to take any committee and name them, but you said, I'm a member of the Rules Committee, I couldn't go. Any member who wears a pen has the power and authority to go look at those. And, then, and, and if we can't trust members to go look at those and do that as their job functions, then, then I really question why we're doing this. I mean, because you can say, well, leaks. Well, golly, that didn't stop the leaks from coming out of the rooms. We had plenty of leaks. And, but it didn't matter because when you stop members from being members, then inherently, no matter how good your, quote, intention is or, or how breathless you think that the next election's in peril, the moment you have to take down the liberties and the rights and responsibilities of members to get there, that's a problem. Well, Mr. Chairman, I apologize. I, I should have brought copies of the letters that I sent to the speaker and to the chairman of the Intelligence Committee asking to review those, uh, review those documents on a more contemporaneous basis because, again, I knew we were going to get to this day. I knew this day was coming in the Rules Committee. We were going to be asked to vote on stuff that, uh, again, just the sheer volume of information that, uh, that we now have to sort through in order to make an informed decision yeah. for, yes, our constituents, but for other members of the, of the entire House of Representatives because they, they are all going to be hanging on what, uh, what we decide here tonight. I agree. And I just want to add, because I'm not making this up, and this is for any member of the committee, any member watching right now, this is, is Clause 2E2A of Rule 11. This is a rule of the House. And it was really interesting because they could have waived a lot of this, but they didn't. And this was always available to us, but yet was denied by us on many occasions. And again, it just goes to the heart. No matter how desperate you are to get to an end result, this is what concerns me this time next year or the next year. When is this going to be brought back up again? So um, let me just ask you, Mr. Collins. It seems to me, and in fact the words in, in your uh, minority views are that the charges are vague and malleable. Um, and I think my, my fellow Texan, Mr. Ratcliffe, asked the question during 
think it was during a judiciary hearing, it may have been during an intelligence hearing, what was the crime? Was, were, were you aware, was, in talking to the witnesses, asked witnesses at the witness table, what, what was the crime that you witnessed? And in general, what answer was he given to that question? That they witnessed none. And I think what the majority is doing is taking full advantage of the uh, political nature of impeachment in, uh, in non-defining to move forward with this. Which, of course, is one of the inherent difficulties going forward if you allow the charge to proceed that is vague and malleable. Um, it certainly can occur again under different circumstances. A lot has been said today about fact witnesses, and uh, but let me just ask you this. Was there anyone that you interviewed uh, during the Judiciary Committee proceedings that had direct knowledge of the phone call? I, I chuckle a little bit because, again, we didn't, get to witness, we didn't get to interview anybody. We had, we had four law school professors and two staff members. That's it. And what was really interesting is, is one, we had two presentations, one of which, uh, by the way, uh, our witness actually testified. He pressed and presented and then had to testify under oath. And then the one who presented for the Judiciary Committee actually then left the presenting table and came and questioned our member under oath and transferred out with the Intelligence Committee staff member. So, you know, no, it, 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 like I said, it, I, I can't lay this out any better, but I, I want to make it very clear, and I've done this all day, I'll fight, you, I'll, I'll fight this on process and I'll fight this on facts. We win both. And I think that's what's you know, coming out the most in this. I'm glad you brought about process because we do get a lot of criticism that uh, we're talking a lot of process. This is the Rules Committee. <laughs> that's kind of what we do is the process. You remember, you were on the Rules Committee. Well, um, there's a statement from uh, Lieutenant General Keith Kellogg, National Security Advisor to the Vice President. And I'm gonna read just a portion of this. I was on the much-reported July 25 call between President Donald Trump and President Zelensky. As an exceedingly proud member of President Trump's administration and a 34-year highly experienced combat veteran who retired with the rank of Lieutenant General in the Army, I heard nothing wrong or improper on the call. I have had no concerns. So, was this... I mean, I'm assuming this type of information was made available to you while you were, while you were conducting your, your hearing. Is that not correct? Yeah, he didn't testify. He submitted that. He submitted. So, Mr. Chairman, I'd ask unanimous consent to put uh, Lieutenant General Keith Kellogg's statement into the record. Without objection. Committee. Well, again, it just goes, you didn't have a testimony from an actual fact witness. As far as we know, no actual crime was was elucidated when uh, Mr. Radcliffe of Texas asked his questions of the, of the witnesses who were there. So it gets to a point where, what are we doing? Why are we doing this? And we do need to have a good answer for the American people because they are going to be asking us these questions and they should ask us these questions and with without an identifiable crime, with people who were present when the telephone call was made who are, have, have significant credentials and say there was nothing wrong and they witnessed nothing improper, what are, what are people to think? Well, I, I, I agree with your assessment here, and, and this is one of the reasons we brought out the problems that we've been bringing, bringing out. But I, again, I will also have to say, I've done everything I possibly can do in, in my side, and I know my colleagues have as well. I'm not going to have to answer that question. Everybody who votes yes tomorrow is going to have to answer that question. And that, I think that is an excellent point. Everyone who votes yes tomorrow will have to answer those questions. Let me just ask you one last thing. Uh, and it has to do with the transcript, not the transcripts of the telephone calls, but the fact that phone calls were released as part of the, and I know it wasn't your report, it was the Intelligence Committee's report that, that detailed telephone calls, uh, again, the, the transcripts of the calls themselves were not revealed, just who made calls to whom. I got to tell you, of all the things that we've encountered in this, that's the one that I've gotten the greatest amount of anxiety back home. Um, people ask me, wait a minute, 
they intercepted a call from the president's lawyer to the president? I mean, that's pretty serious stuff. They intercepted a call from a member of Congress. And I realize that we're not held in very high regard outside of this room, but still, a member of Congress was, was listed on that form and not given an opportunity to know about that before their name was listed. That seems to me to be really going too far. Well, look, and I've said that, and I've, I've testified this before. The subpoenas that were issued are valid subpoenas. They got the numbers. They did the metadata. They got the stuff. And they matched numbers. But to say that there wasn't a determination, you know, as we looked at who these calls and to have those numbers, such as the ranking member, such as a member of the media and others, you know, even if you wanted to, t even if you, you know, just grossly in your mind could come to the conclusion it was okay to know that, at what point was it okay to put into that report and not say anything about it? There was no reason to put that in report. I mean, it's, it's the unindicted co-conspirator kind of thing, and I've heard this already. Well, you know, that's, that's even more of a, of a smear on a member of Congress. Well, we didn't really do anything wrong, but, you know, that's what we do. No, that should never have happened. There was ways to do it. Um, Mr. Goldman had no answer for that. In fact, he was very uncomfortable because and he told us he wasn't going to talk about how they did their investigation, which is problematic even on, uh, you know, further because we are the committee. This was our one chance to actually look into how the, the sort of methodology was that went behind it. And again, I don't I, look, it's very important to members of Congress. It should be on both sides of the aisle doing that because at the end of the day, it did not make their case better. It did not make their case stronger. It did not make their case any better, except for the simple fact that all of a sudden, when this report came out, there was about 15 or 20 or 30 or 40 or 50 or 500 media outlets that picked that up. And it just, it just inherited this story of, it of Mr. Nunez and Snowball. And that's, I think, exactly what they wanted. Because frankly, if I had the report that I had to put out, I'd want something to take attention away from it. And that's sort of what they did. They just threw it in there as a, as a gratuitous that meant nothing. But it just goes to show how rushed and how partisan this has become. So your and that should scare that was, everyone. Your opinion that was a diversionary tactic? I think, it was a, I think it was a tactic to say, look at what else we've done here and also look at the ranking member. Let's look at the others. All of this involved. I think it was just simply, a, again, without going into the mind of Mr. Schiff, who I would actually blame for this, Mr. Goldman not, we don't know. What was your reason for doing that? What was your reason for putting his name in there? Except to make a point, because y'all have been publicly feuding for, for a long time about how this process is going, why else would you put it in there? Because there's no, there was no evidentiary value for it. Well, it, as a practical matter, let me just share with you, um, as a rank and file member of Congress, a humble backbencher that I am, um, we talk about damage to national security. This was damaging to national security. The release of that information and the way it was released was damaging to national security because you and I are going to have to make a determination, and I realize it's not quite the same thing, but the reauthorization of 215 of the Patriot Act is going to come in front of us at some point, and how am I supposed to vote for the collection of amorphous metadata to be held in some place until yeah. it's queried by one of our intelligence. Yeah, I think, yeah, and I appreciate that. I think it's definitely two conversations to have on a different level, and I agree with your concerns, and I've had similar concerns, but I don't think, the, my concern more of this is how we treat each other. And I think that's, this is where this hits for me, is how we're treating each other. And not the fact that we can disagree vehemently, and, and you know, the, We've had great times up here, and I can remember Mr. Hastings, and I appreciate Ms. Torres talking about our inside voices. Mr. Hastings and I have sometimes not used our inside voices in here. And it's just because we get passionate about what we do, but we've done that, but we disagree them. But I would never think about taking a report that did and put his name in it in a derogatory way that had nothing of value to add to my report. I just wouldn't have thought that. And so if that's the level that we've gotten to, no matter what you believe about the facts, no matter what you believe about the president, the phone call, the transcript, the witnesses or anything else, to do things like that, to have these gratuitous kind of political, I call it hit job, in the middle of a report that didn't have to be there, that does not benefit you at all, is a problem. Just one last observation, and, uh, <clears throat> and I appreciate your comments. We had the... As you mentioned, you did have one panel of witnesses. You had, there were four witnesses, one of which you selected. Um, I do wish you'd selected someone who had actually voted for the president. That would have made me feel better. <laughs> However, I thought the, wit 
I thought the witness you did select did a, 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 did a very good job. And certainly, I mean, as you recall, he came and testified here to the Rules Committee at one point when we were contemplating a, a legal action against then President Obama over some part of the Affordable Care Act that we thought had been yeah. administered improperly. Um, so I always enjoy listening to, to Mr. Turley testify. His statement that he's concerned about the lowering of impeachment standards to fit a paucity of evidence and an abundance of anger. I mean, I think those are the words that are going to echo down throughout history. That is what this exercise has been all about. Very little facts and a great deal of anger. Anger at the president, anger at the American people for electing him, and it reverberates over and over and over again. And I've said before in this committee, that is not a good look for us. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll yield back. I, I thank the gentleman. And he had mentioned he had sent several inquiries to our leadership. Uh, I think we'll probably be here for a little while longer. If your staff want to collect them, we're more than happy to make them part of the record. And I just, I would also say that um, uh, those of us who vote yes uh, on uh, impeachment, um, obviously have to answer to our constituents. Those who vote no have to answer to their constituents as well. Uh, I and, fully agree with you. And these are, these are votes agree. of conscience. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm voting, uh, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not been a supporter of the president uh, when he ran for president. That's no secret. Uh, but I assure you that my vote for impeachment is based on my strong belief uh, that what he did rises to the level of an impeachable offense. Um, and I genuinely believe, as I've said over and over and over again, that we see a crime in progress, um, and I'm worried about the next election. And that's why there is urgency here. And, and I appreciate the conversation you just had. It's all fine and relevant about getting in the weeds over the investigation. Uh, but we also need to talk about the President's behavior and what he did. Um, and I now yield to the gentleman from Colorado, Mr. Perlmutter. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, first, uh, I'd like to introduce into the record uh, four things. The oath that the senators have to take of impartiality um, if they sit as uh, jurors in a trial on impeachment. Without objection. Second, a letter from 700 historians, uh, their statement on the impeachment of President Trump. Without objection. Third is the editorial from USA Today uh, dated, I think, December 12th, uh, concerning impeachment of President Trump. Without objection. And fourth is a uh, law review article in the Colorado Lawyer uh, by a gentleman named uh, Scott Barker called An Overview of Presidential Impeachment. Without objection. Mr. McGovern. Mr. Chairman, yeah. I, have, I have a very unusual question, but as a former member, I'd just like to ask. Yeah. USA Today, I had the, actually the response to that editorial in that same paper. You want to put it in? Could I put that in as well? Without objection. There you go. Thank you very much. <laughs> I'd like to um, read a statement and then ask some questions of uh, my two colleagues here. The president should be impeached. His actions were an abuse of power that jeopardized America's national security and compromised our elections. No one is above the law, and that includes the president. By withholding almost $400 million, Ukraine desperately needed to defend itself against Russia until Ukraine did the president's political bidding. The president committed high crimes and misdemeanors for which he should be impeached under Article 1, Section 2, Clause 5, and Article 2, Section 4 of the Constitution of the United States of America. This abuse of power is compounded by the President's refusal to cooperate with Congress's impeachment investigation and his stonewalling of witnesses from testifying or turning over documents to Congress. Almost 14,000 people have been killed since Russia invaded Ukraine. Withholding $400 million that Congress appropriated to help Ukraine defend itself unless Ukraine helped the president dig up dirt on his political rival, Joe Biden, was the last straw for me. People's lives and our national security were placed at risk. 
This was more than hush money for strippers or profiting from foreign governments, staying at resort properties, or even obstructing justice as laid out in the Mueller report. The founders fought and died for freedom and independence from a tyrannical ruler and a foreign government. Impeachment and removal from office was the remedy they included in the Constitution to act as a check on a president who placed himself above the law, abused his power for his own personal benefit, and invited foreign governments to get involved in our domestic affairs, especially our elections. A president who flaunts the separation of powers and checks and balances in our Constitution and who refuses to allow witnesses to appear before Congress would receive our founders' universal condemnation. Treating taxpayer money as his own to extort a, quote, favor from a foreign government to aid him in his reelection goes to the very heart of concerns raised by our nation's founders when they drafted and advocated for impeachment to act as a check on the awesome powers of the chief executive. For instance, Madison said in Federalist 47, quote, the accumulation of all powers, legislative, executive, and judiciary, in the same hands may justly be pronounced the very definition of tyranny. He went on to say during the Constitutional Convention, quote, the executive will have great opportunities of abusing his power. And further, that a president, quote, might betray his trust to foreign powers. George Washington's farewell address warned of foreign influence and corruption, which leads to the, quote, policy and will, close quote, of America being subjected to the policy and will of another. Alexander Hamilton wrote in Federalist 65 that impeachment, quote, proceeds from the misconduct of public men, from the abuse or violation of a public trust. Following in, in that, the USA Today editorial board stated it perfectly when they wrote in their December 12, 2019 editorial, quote, in his thuggish effort to trade American arms for foreign dirt on former Vice President Joe Biden and his son Hunter, Trump resembles not so much Clinton as he does Richard Nixon, another corrupt president who tried to cheat his way to re-election. This isn't party politics as usual, they go on to say. It is precisely the misconduct the framers had in mind when they wrote impeachment into the Constitution. Close quote. Impeachment is the remedy the founders placed in the Constitution to remove a president during his or her term of office. This is especially true when the misconduct involves an upcoming election. The president invited foreign participation in our election at least three times. First with, quote, Russia, if you're listening, close quote. Second, with his demands on Ukraine to, quote, do us a favor, close quote. And third, with his request for China to get involved in the 2020 election by starting, quote, an investigation into the Bidens, close quote. Any further delay or simply allowing the election cycle to run its course results in the harm and abuse impeachment was designed to prevent. For the sake of the Constitution, fair elections free of foreign interference and our national security, President Trump should be impeached. So obviously, and to my friends, uh, we have very different opinions about this, and we we work up here in the Rules Committee a lot of hours. Uh, we respect one another. Uh, but for me, this goes to the heart of the Constitution. And to my friend, Mr. Collins, you and I couldn't disagree more on this. And I would want to compliment my friend. My guess is that as an attorney, and I, you kind of come off with that uh, country attorney kind of approach, and a number of us think of ourselves as kind of country attorneys. Um, my first question just is sort of a general proposition to you, sir, is, and, and to you, Mr. Raskin. Do you, as an attorney, understand the terminology, time is of the essence? Do you know what that means, Mr. Collins? What does it mean? What's it mean? It depends on how you want to say time is, I need to know it now for a purpose that might happen if I don't get the 
because, as you would say, the clock is ticking. Would you agree with that, Mr. Yes. Raskin? Okay. Well, the clock is ticking on the 2020 elections. And I think we would all agree that if this impeachment were held in July or August or September, drawn way out, that, that, that time is of the essence, that that would really affect the 2020 elections. So I appreciate the gentleman's uh, statement that, oh, this has been rushed and there just hasn't been enough time and, and all of that sort of stuff, but uh, time is of the essence. And this instance began, at least what started it all, and Mr. And Mr. Hastings introduced this into the record, the memo of July 25th, 2019, uh, which generally transcribes, but not completely transcribes, the president's conversation or parts thereof with President Zelensky. And, you know, we were talking about it, and you used the word transcript, and, and Mr. Hastings said memo. I mean, it's a memorandum of a telephone conversation, and it's not a verbatim transcript. And it goes down at the bottom. The word inaudible is used to indicate portions of a conversation that the note taker was unable to hear. So I'd like to have you ask you a question, Mr. Collins, and you too, Mr. Raskin. Um, just in terms of the completeness of this document, because I think that this document, even with uh, things that are not transcribed, is a pretty damning piece of evidence against the president. And then I think Mr. Mulvaney's uh, comments a month later saying, oh, we do this all the time and get over it, that too is damning. But the president says, I would like you, this is right after Mr. Zelensky says, we are ready to continue to cooperate for the next step. Specifically, we are almost ready to buy more javelins from the United States for defense purposes. The president's next words are, our president, I would like you to do us a favor, though because our country has been through a lot and Ukraine knows a lot about it. I would like you to find out what happened with this whole situation with Ukraine. They say crowd strike, dot, dot, dot. Gentlemen, in your experience, what does dot, dot, dot mean? Mr. Raskin, I'll start with you. What do ellipses mean? Yes. Something's left out. Well, yeah, yeah, so right, but, but we can say generally that something to be continued, okay. um, but we don't know specifically what in every case, but you try, to, you try to deduce it from the context. And I assume, Mr. Collins, you would agree with that. Uh, to a point, is are not her, but okay. I will say, in effect, we can elaborate. Was that a yes? Yes. Okay, so then it goes on. I guess you have one of your wealthy people, dot, 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 the server, comma, they say, Whole, they say Ukraine has it. So again, just in that one paragraph, right after President Zelensky says, we're ready to buy the javelins for our defense, there are missing pieces to this memorandum. And it doesn't say the word inaudible is used to indicate portions of a conversation that the note taker was unable to hear, does it? In your readings, uh, gentlemen? No. I guess that's a no. So this document, and, and Mr. Burgess was going into the classified nature and why was everybody down in the uh, intelligence uh, room downstairs. Just looking at it on its face, it says, and it's crossed out now, and you apparently it was an inadvertent error but can you tell me, Mr. Collins, when this memorandum, up at the top there's a cross out, and I think underneath the cross out it says secret, slash, slash, orcon, slash, no foreign. Yeah. Do either of you know what, what those, the what that means? The, the, the president declassified the, the document so it could be but made. What is it? My question was, what is that? That means that it's not normally put out to public. We don't normally transmit the telephone calls between two world leaders, and our president doesn't do that. And in order of transparency, he did it in this case. That means it's a declassification. So, so this, so 
there's no but there's, no no wait a sec but earlier you said it was an inadvertent error but now you're saying that oh when there are conversations between two foreign leaders we mark it as secret no we're, you're or or con or no foreign no we're talking two different things okay so but initially you and I are this, talking two different things Mr. Collins, initially this document was treated as classified and secret, top secret, was it not? The, cla the if, if you let me explain here, because we're talking no, two different I things. Just, okay, then we don't, then I won't answer. Okay, Mr. Raskin, you go ahead and answer. So, I'm not certain I can completely answer that, Mr. Perlmutter, but can I just try to answer where I think you're going? And he, here's what I would say about this. There's no mystery here, right? Um, the, as you stated, Mr. Perlmutter, the July 25th contemporaneous memorandum itself is overwhelmingly damning of the president's <coughs> designs on President Zelensky. You add that up with everything that came before and everything that came after, and it's all uncontradicted. To me, it looks like it's case closed. Let's talk about July 26th, the next day. I think that's a good idea. The day after the July 25th call, the president called Ambassador Sondland. That's his ambassador to the EU but he's part of the three amigos who are working on getting Zelensky to do the president's will. Okay, he called Ambassador Sondland, uh, Sondland to ask whether President Zelensky was going to do the investigation. Ambassador Sondland stated that President Zelensky was gonna do it and would do anything you ask him to, and then he famously said, he loves your ass. According to David Holmes, who overheard the conversation or part of the conversation, Ambassador Sondland and President Trump spoke only about the investigation and their discussion about Ukraine. There's nothing about the war, nothing about corruption, and so on. Um, and after Sondland hung up the phone, he told Holmes that President Trump, forgive me now, I hope my children are not watching, but he told Holmes that President Trump did not give a shit about Ukraine. Rather, he explained, the president cared only about the big stuff. The big stuff was the stuff that benefited him personally, like, quote, the Biden investigation that Mr. Giuliani was pitching. This is not an Agatha Christie mystery. There's no alibi. There's no alternative hypothesis of the facts. The president went after exactly what he wanted. And we know that our president is uh, very capable of stating what he wants and telling people what his will is. So let, let's talk about that for a couple seconds, and then I know, Mr. Chairman, you'd like to get moving, but I'm, I just have a few more questions. So Holmes, uh, Mr. Raskin, was the political counselor uh, at the U.S. Embassy in Kiev, right? Correct. And his job was, I think in his words, quote, gather information about Ukraine's internal politics, foreign relations, security policies, and report back to Washington, represent U.S. policies to foreign contacts, and advise the ambassador on policy development and impl implementation. I think that comes from his opening remarks. Yes. So going back to kind of the questions I was asking Mr. Collins and you about the, the secret nature of this memo, at least initially, which was unclassified two months later. Two months later. Um, Holmes, I think, testified, quote, contrary to standard procedure, the embassy received no readout of the call and he was unaware of what was discussed until the transcript was released on September 25th. Is that your understanding? That, say that once more. That, that he, Holmes, was unaware of what was discussed. Correct. You know it was ordinary procedure that he would get to know something like that until this thing was released two months later. Correct. And My taking out, taken out of the top secret server. That's right. And my recollection is he was not on the July 25th. Even though it was an inadvert, supposed inadvertent error to put it in the top secret server. So, you were, you, you kind of uh, glossed over a couple of the kind of cruder terms that Sondland and, and uh, was saying uh, in connection with this call between himself and the president. But Holmes, as you said, he could hear could he not, the phone conversation between Ambassador Sondland and, uh, and the President Trump. He could hear it. Okay, and I think his testimony was Ambassador Sondland went on to state that President Zelensky loves your ass 
I then heard President Trump ask, so he's going to do the investigation? Ambassador Sondland replied that he's going to do it, adding that President Zelensky will do anything you ask him to. And then your remarks about whether the President cared about Ukraine or not, but his, his actually his, his final statement was, I noted that there was big stuff going on in Ukraine, like a war with Russia. And Ambassador Sondland replied that he meant big stuff that benefits the President, like the Biden investigation that Giuliani was pushing. So, a couple more things that I think have to be discussed, and, and that was Mr. Taylor, and you, you mentioned this. The individuals who testified, and by the way, I'd say to my friend, uh, Mr. Collins, that you said, oh, we didn't get any witnesses. Well, you had uh, Mr. Castor, you had uh, your uh, inst uh, Mr. Turley uh, testified, and then the Intelligence Committee, if I am correct, had at least three witnesses that the Republicans called, and I'd agree with Mr. Uh, Raskin that these aren't witnesses for or against the defense, although I gotta compliment you, I think you've been a heck of a defense counsel so far, because the record's gotten pretty muddy, and you know, the old saying in law school that I went to, if you don't have a fact, do your best to distract. I have the truth. Huh? I have the truth. Well, so the three witnesses that the uh, minority called during the uh, investigation, Ambassador Volcker, Under Secretary Hale, and Mr. Morrison. So at least five witnesses, plus Mr. Raskin, you said that a number of other witnesses were called, like Mr. Bolton and Pom Secretary Pompeo, uh, Mr. Mulvaney, and, you know, the... So I want the record to reflect that plenty of witnesses were called, and the President has had the opportunity to call witnesses. He was invited, he and his staff were invited to participate in the investigation, were they not? Yes, indeed. And, and they just chose not to. I mean, we were very disappointed that he chose not to participate, just like we were disappointed when he executed his plan to blockade witnesses from coming and refused to turn over any subpoenaed documents. Just a comment that came out of um, testimony by Mr. Taylor, because those individuals that did testify were either decorated war heroes, um, individuals who've been public servants, working in the intelligence community, the State Department, a whole range of things over the course of decades under both Republicans and Democrats. And Mr. Taylor was one of those. What was his background, if you recall? Uh, he was a Vietnam War hero um, and had spent his life in uh, first the military service and then the civilian service of the country. Uh, and I think he was, if I'm remembering correctly, he was um, scandalized about uh, the treatment of Ambassador Yovanovitch, who was the target of an unprecedented smear campaign by people working directly with the president, including Rudy Giuliani. Uh, she was somebody who worked for America and fought for our foreign policy priorities in Ukraine. She described herself as completely nonpartisan. Um, she had a family background of fleeing persecution from totalitarian regimes. Um, and they just decided to set her up and to describe her as a tool of George Soros and somebody who was on the side of the corrupt and so on uh, until finally uh, the president decided to recall her and bring her back. Uh, that is a scandalous chapter in American history that that was allowed to happen to one of our ambassadors. And it was all to clear the way for the shakedown of President Zelensky because as uh, Mr. Giuliani said today, he's quoted in the paper today, um, she was in the way of the plan to get from President Zelensky what the president wanted. Last thing, in, in uh, Ambassador Taylor's uh, testimony, he was talking about conversations uh, with Ambassador Sondland. And in that conversation, uh, Ambassador Taylor said, quote, President Trump had told him, Sondland, he wants President Zelensky to state publicly that Ukraine will investigate Burisma and alleged Ukrainian interference in the 2016 U.S. election. In fact, Ambassador Sondland said everything was dependent on such an announcement, including security assistance. 
He said that President Trump wanted President Zelensky in a box making public statements about ordering such an investigation. So that earlier you referred to putting That's President absolutely right. Zelensky. And, and you know, if I had to pick one quote for people to remember from Ambassador Taylor, it's when he said, as I said on the phone, I think it's crazy to withhold security assistance for help with a political campaign. And that was in a text message um, that he was engaged in. I believe that was with Sondland Volker. I think it's crazy to withhold security assistance for help with a political campaign. That was on September 9th, 19, uh, 2019. Last question I'd like to ask you is, is concerning Mr. Giuliani, who you just mentioned. And in that Taylor deposition, there is a reference to a New York Times uh, report concerning Mr. Giuliani's uh, role. And it's, uh, it's a report from May 9, 2019, which says, quote, or an uh, article, Mr. Giuliani said he plans to travel to Kiev, the Ukrainian capital, in the coming days to meet with the nation's president-elect to urge him to pursue inquiries that allies of the White House contend could yield new information about two matters of intense interest to Mr. Trump. One is the origin of the special counsel's investigation into Russia's interference in the 2016 election. The other is the involvement of form, former Vice President Joe Biden's junior son in a gas company owned by a Ukrainian oligarch. So this is in May of 2019. The ambassadors were told they should work with uh, Mr. Giuliani, and their testimony, again, from um, the Sondland deposition is they were disappointed by the president's direction that we involve Mr. Giuliani. Our view was that men and women of the State Department, not the president's personal lawyer, should take responsibility for all aspects of U.S. foreign policy towards Ukraine. Do you recall that testimony? Yes. Well, Mr. Sondland, and I don't know who came up with the name Three Amigos, uh, apparently referring to Ambassador Sondland, Ambassador Volker, and Ambassador Perry, um, they, they had a couple choices. They could work with Mr. Giuliani or not. And in his testimony, Mr. Sondland says, in working with Mr. Giuliani, that, quote, all communications flowed through Rudy Giuliani. Uh, he, he determined in his testimony, he said, this turned out to be a mistake. But I did not understand until much later that Mr. Giuliani's agenda might have included an effort to prompt Ukrainians to investigate Vice President Biden or his son or to involve Ukrainians directly or indirectly in the president's 2020 re-election campaign. Do you recall that testimony? Whose statement was that? That was um, From uh, the Sondland deposition at uh, uh, page 16, 297. Yeah, I recall reading that, yes. Okay. Well, the articles that the Judiciary Committee has brought talk about an abuse of power, talk about betrayal of national security, talk about corruption. Are these the kinds of pieces of evidence that support the articles that your committee drafted that you would like the whole House to vote on tomorrow? Yes. It was a, a vote of 23 to 17 in committee. The majority felt we were brought to the inescapable conclusion that the President of the United States had abused his power in sweeping and systematic ways for personal purposes by bringing uh, a foreign government into our elections in order to alter our political destiny as a people. Um, and he proceeded to obstruct justice in order to cover that up. That's a pattern that we saw, again, from the 2016 campaign. And the president has demonstrated his unrepentance. He has pronounced his uh, behavior perfect and absolutely perfect and assures us that Article Two of the Constitution gives him the power to do whatever he wants to do. So we have a very clear choice as a country right now. 
Well, and to end with that, in fact, I think the president actually said a couple days before the um, conversation with Mr. Zelensky that Article 2 of the Constitution allows him to, quote, do, what, do whatever I want as president, close quote. And I think that's the problem. That's the core of the issue, that we are in a democratic republic, that we are, have a framework of laws, of checks and balances, that limit a president from doing something like that, or to entangle other governments in our politics and in our domestic affairs. And that is why we brought these articles of impeachment, and that's why I'm going to vote for them tomorrow. I yield back. Mr. Perlmutter, before you yield back, because I always like to answer, because I'm going to answer this question one way or the other, and I'd love to answer it with you. Sure. Going back to our original. And all I, the, the, the two issues we hear that you said not foreign, that's not for foreign sharing. That was what's always listed on these. You're, you're going so back to the So now you are going to have to speak a little slower for Yeah, me. no problem. The, I, the documents. I the haven't documents. interrupted you before, but no, please. No, you did fine. And that was my, it was my. What I wanted to make sure was my clarification and my answer, and to, out of respect for your question, it was okay. two separate things that we were talking about. I was talking about that Mr. Morrison said that it was put on the other server by an administrative mistake. All of these conversations that they have with foreign leaders are marked the way that one is marked, unless the president himself uh, declassifies it. The, that not for sharing with foreign government, that's that not foreign on there. Then you also have the secret classification, which was struck through because he declassified it. All right, so and that, 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 that yeah. brings, so I, and I appreciate, thank you for clarifying yeah. that. So um, in his testimony, um, Mr. Holmes also said that it was unusual uh, for him not to get a readout, I think the term was readout, of the call. D is, does, do you know whether that was unusual or not, or yeah. you just have to accept his that, testimony? Uh, that would be his testimony. It's not something that I would okay. could comment and, on. No, but I, I, and I, thank I you wanted for, to do it with you because I, I can do it in a minute, but I want to do it with you just to have that kind right. of And I thank you for clarifying no your problem. answer. Thank I yield you. back to the gentleman. Uh, happy to yield to the gentleman from Arizona, Ms. Lesko, who not only has the privilege of serving on the Rules Committee and sitting through this hearing today, but also on the Judiciary Committee. So we, I know. Yeah. I'm going to dream impeachment in right. the end, my <laughs> arguments, I think, although to me it's a nightmare, quite frankly. Um, yeah, Mr. Chairman, uh, before I start asking, asking questions, and I have several of them, sorry, Mr. Collins and Mr. Raskin, um, I would like to ask unanimous consent to include my statement on these articles of impeachment into the record. Without objection. And um, Mr. Chairman, I also ask uh, to um, unanimous consent to include President Trump's letter to Speaker Pelosi into the record. Without objection, and I was going to do it at the end, but uh, you beat me to it. So <laughs> I beat you to it. I think it's important to have that part of the record, I, having just read it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, before I, I before I get into my questions, um, I just want to. I thought it was very interesting. I had staff look up um, votes on impeachment, and uh, Chairman McGovern at the beginning in your I believe opening statement, you said something to the effect that no Democrat, Democratic uh, congressman or woman on the Rules Committee. <laughs> has voted for the Articles of Impeachment before. I, I think that's yeah, what you said, right? I did. And boy, I think that's a little disputable or, or maybe a little misleading, I'm not sure. But I can tell you, uh, I have here the final vote result for, um, it was H Resolution 646, and it was dated December 6, 2017. 58 Democrats, including many on this committee, uh, voted to advance an article of impeachment for the high crime or misdemeanor of dissing the NFL anthem protests and calling a member of Congress wacky. Uh, that this was a House resolution that Mr. Perlmutter introduced, and all nine of the Democratic members on the Rules Committee uh, voted to table it, which means that if this was or against tabling it, I'm sorry, let me clarify, against tabling it, which means if it wasn't tabled, you would have voted on the floor of the House of Representatives to 
impeach the President well, of the United States. General Lady, States. would yield just for a, 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 a correction. I mean, uh, the intent was to vote to advance it to the Judiciary Committee. Um, is that, that is, that is, that is, you know, I voted against tabling because I wanted to send it to the Judiciary Committee where I thought that was the appropriate way to deal with it. Um, so, I mean, so I, I stand by what I said. Nobody in this House has yet voted on an article of impeachment. Um, and tomorrow will, will be, assuming we give them a rule, will be the first time that anybody, Democrat or Republican, will have that opportunity. But thank you for letting me clarify the record. Uh, and thank you. Um, and with all due respect, I, I asked my staff that, because you had said that in your opening statement. And I said, is that accurate? And they said, no, that would be if there was a referral. This was actually articles of impeachment on the floor of the House of Representatives that if it had not been tabled, you actually would have been voting on the floor of the House of Representatives for articles of impeachment against the president. The one that was on December 6, 2017, was because you didn't think, you didn't like that President Trump uh, said something uh, negative about the NFL anthem protest and called a member of Congress wacky, and all nine of you, all nine of you here uh, voted um, against tabling that. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, um, I, with all due respect, if I could just interrupt. Uh, I don't think Ms. Scanlon, myself, or Ms. Shalala were members of the House. Oh, oh, oh. This is, I was on the wrong one. I apologize. Thank you for pointing that out to me. This one was Mr. McGovern, Hastings, Raskin, and DeSalnier um, voted against tabling. So um, there's another one where it's all nine. So I, I mis Tabling what? I, I, what are we talking about? Impeachment or? Yes, it was House Resolution 646. It was, um, um, the staff has told me, they were articles of impeachment on the floor of the House of Representatives. Um, and uh, Representative McGovern, Hastings, Raskin, and DeSalnier uh, voted against tabling, meaning that if it wasn't tabled, you would have been able to vote on the floor for articles of impeachment. Then on January 19, 2018, House Resolution 705, and I have this one right here, 66 Democrats, including many on this committee, voted to advance impeachment for the high crime or misdemeanor of President Trump's rhetoric. And on that one, um, Mr. McGovern, Hastings, Raskin, and DeSalnier all voted against tabling. Uh, so meaning that if it wasn't tabled, there would have been a vote. Uh, then on this one, more recent. Well, let, let me just, the generally, you, if there was a vote, you don't know how we would have voted on it. I mean, I appreciate it, but I mean, and, and, and I just would, just, I, and again, I, she, I you, the, you can go on. Right. If you'd like, I would just simply say that, you know, we can have this conversation. It has nothing to do with the articles of impeachment that are before us right now, but I, I'm happy to. Thank you, Mr. McGovern. A lot of what has been said today hasn't had anything to do with articles of impeachment. But um, this, I believe, does, because it proves to me that it was predetermined that you're going to impeach the President of the United States, and you're just searching around for anything or anything to impeach him on. So impeachment number three, on July 17, 2019, House Resolution 498, 95 Democrats including many chairmen and many members of this committee. In fact, let's see. I have Mr. McGovern, Torres, Raskin, Scanlon, DeSalner, uh, all voted against tabling, voted to advance impeachment for the high crime or misdemeanor of insulting the squad. And so, Mr. Collins, my question to you is, do you think the fact that so many of our Democratic colleagues, both 17 out of 24 Judiciary Committee members that are Democratic, and um, here a number of my Democratic colleagues on the Rules Committee voted to move forward articles of impeachment prior to the July 25th, 2019 phone call that the Democrats are using as their central case for impeaching the President, do you think that that kind of undermines their argument? As I stated earlier today, I do believe it is true, and we've seen this over time. And um, 
Mr. Uh, Collins, do you also think that moving articles of impeachment uh, against the president on because he dissed the NFL anthem protests against his rhetoric and against insulting the squad kind of um, lower the bar for impeachment? I think we've seen a lot of, of, of those things that's happened in the last, uh, you know, this Congress and last Congress as well. I think a lot of this does. I think this lowers the bar uh, for impeachment. I think it's just something that we're having to plow through at this point. And, you know, again, they have the votes and they'll move it forward. Thank you. And Mr. Collins, earlier, uh, much earlier, uh, Mr. Raskin had said something. He, he was comparing how the closed-door hearings that Adam Schiff did were comparable to what Ken Starr did uh, in the Clinton impeachment. Um, but isn't it true that we Republicans on the Judiciary Committee asked uh, to have Mr. Schiff testify like Ken Starr did, and the Democrats refused us? Yes. Thank you. And um, I also uh, want to, to uh, I think you already addressed this, Mr. Collins, but another statement uh, Mr. Raskin said earlier was there was no evidence Trump tried to root out corruption prior to Joe Biden becoming candidate or something to that effect. And I, I just, from what I've heard, that's absolutely false. And I wanted to hear what you said. I, I was told that Trump actually had a meeting with the former Ukrainian, Poroshenko, concerned about corruption in Ukraine prior to giving him aid, and also that two of the witnesses, Democrat witnesses, uh, testified that all along Trump was concerned about corruption in Ukraine. Is that accurate? Uh, that was the testimony of the witnesses, yes. Thank you. And also, uh, another uh, thing that I want to clear up for the record, Mr. Raskin said previously that the same process that we're doing now was done, it's the same process that was used in the Clinton impeachment. Mr. Collins, do you agree with that? Because I sure don't. No, I do not. And would you care to expand? Yeah, I mean, I, I think there's a lot of different things here. And again, I think it goes back to the inherent nature of what we're dealing with today. And that is, is frankly, uh, the only bipartisan nature of this impeachment is no. Um, it's, it's not bipartisan in the sense of seeing it should go forward. It's bipartisan in, in no, and that'll be the only bipartisan that you'll see tomorrow. Now, again, my friends across the aisle will say that they're standing for truth, and I get that, and that's fine. That's, that's their argument. My argument will be that it's you know, everything that we've talked about so far. Um, and, and that's also why at a certain point in time we continue to, to go on here. But I think when you look at the actual things that were going on, you know, the, the issues of how witnesses are called, how you dealt with an outside counsel. And, and again, it was also said earlier that the star, uh, the Judiciary Committee handled um, the star uh, faster than this. That's not true. It was longer than this uh, going through when it's, it got to Judiciary. Um, there were several, I mean, there was two and a half weeks set up before the first impaneling of, of scholarly witnesses. I mean, so we never had that. We didn't have barely two and a half weeks of the entire thing. Mm -hmm. So when you look at it from those perspectives, I think there's just, again, I, I have argued here today, and I feel comfortable in my argument today that I've argued both the process problems and the factual problems. I've not been afraid to back away from either. We can genuinely disagree with that. That's why we're here tonight. If we didn't disagree with this, we wouldn't be here. So I think, you know, moving this forward at a late hour and just discussing the facts that this is, uh, you know, an issue we have. I will say something that it needs clarification. Again, I know from my Democratic friends it will not matter, but it does, I think, need to be at least added to the record. And it's been brought up that Mr. Mulvaney on several times, you know, uh, on his comments on, on that was the way it's done, get over it. It was also referring to general conditions placed on foreign aid to all countries, and he did clarify his statement later. Um, if we've gotten to the point where we can't clarify statements, and I get that because if it doesn't fit the narrative, we don't do that, um, then we do have an issue and a problem because uh, there's not a one of us on this in, in here at the witness table or at the dais that has not misspoke at some point in their life. And, um, you know, possibly even today. So, I mean, we just have to look at it from that perspective and go forward. Uh, look, I think we're, I've made all the points that I think, frankly, we can make. I would love to have seen this done differently. It does concern me that the future is now predicated on this. And, um, as I, I can, as like I said, it's just it's just a concern that the bar is at a certain point now to where it is anything you want it to make it. It's always been a concern, 
but the founders concerned about many things from foreign influences to everything, but they were also very concerned about this being an overreach in uh, the branches that impeachment you know, could be used this in a partisan way or, in a, or as the quote actually was, is whoever had the most votes basically, who was stronger in their majority. Well, and that's very true in, in the House, and I think that's why it is resting in the House. That's why is I, I agree with my friend on the Constitution side, it rests in the House for a reason, because we're the, it's the same reason taxes and, and spending have to originate here. We're the closest to the people to actually do this. So I think it's, it, this is normal that impeachment would be here. I just don't want it to become that it is, is frankly, this, you don't even have to jump to clear the bar anymore. And I think that's a concern I have about impeachment is going forward now. Thank you. Um, I'm going to actually turn to the actual bill. Um, and I'm on uh, page two now under Article One, Abuse of Power. And I read... The Constitution provides that the House of Representatives shall have the sole power of impeachment and that the President shall be removed from office on impeachment for and conviction of treason, bribery, or high crimes and misdemeanors. So, Mr. Collins, I have a question for you. Were any of the Democrats' fact witnesses able to establish that the President committed treason, bribery, or high crimes or misdemeanors? Uh, no, and not in the sense of, of the way that was was laid out. And, I, and again, and I've made this comment earlier, and I appreciate the gentlelady for bringing this up. They're not depending on a crime. Okay, and that's that's fact, and they're, they're willing to admit that. I, I, I freely give that. They're not depending on a crime. They're depending on a pattern of acts and abuse of power is what they're calling it. The interesting thing is, though, is in the report itself, they mentioned bribery and extortion and all these other things, but they just couldn't bring it up uh, to actually, you know, to get the elements, if you would, to be, you know, crass criminal about it. That They couldn't get the elements to where they could explain it to the American people and what they were doing. Thank At you. least in my opinion, personally. Thank you, Mr. Collins. And I'm going to be asking you several questions. Um, so then further down on page two, um, the Democrats are claiming, which I think is inaccurate, uh, using the powers of his high office, President Trump solicited the interference of a foreign government, Ukraine, in the 2020 United States presidential election. Mr. Collins, was there any mention of the 2020 election in the phone call? No. And Mr. Collins, has there been any proof or evidence or witness or anyone that can prove that Mr. Trump was referring to the 2020 election? No, and the only testimony that, you know, that it was, it really was never to that. It was discussing on aid and, and conditions on aid that they tried to put forward. And then in, on the bottom of page two and to page three, it says that it alleges, again, I think a lot of this is a wishful thinking fairy tale going on here by my Democratic colleagues. It said it would benefit his reelection, harm the election prospects of a political opponent, and influence the 2020 United States presidential election to his advantage. Again, has there been any proof of that, Mr. Collins? No, and it did raise the question that's never still been answered from to earlier today, is, is now by running for president, you're free to do whatever you want to and not be investigated overseas. Thank you. And then the, the other thing that is repeatedly uh, said in these articles of impeachment is that Trump had corrupt purposes or corrupt intent. Has there been any proof uh, from their witnesses, from anyone, that Trump's um, intent or purposes were corrupt? Depending on how you're wording that question, no. And I think the interesting issue is is how they would presume what his intentions were in those phone calls. And that's, those were presumptions or, or uh, beliefs given to them by someone else. Um, but it goes back to the fact Mitchell Sundland himself said it was a pre presumed, and then when talked to the president himself, said, I don't want anything. I just want him to do the job that he ran for. Exactly. And I have said before in Judiciary Committee and elsewhere that uh, there is no way that you can prove uh, what was on Trump's mind or that he had corrupt intent because there are other logical explanations, even though, Mr. Raskin, earlier you said there was no other logical explanations. Yes, indeed, there is, because there was uh, proof, or I should say there is evidence that President Trump was concerned about corruption in Ukraine. He also said in his phone call 
that he was very concerned that other European countries weren't pitching into Ukraine. He also talked about the video of Joe Biden bragging about how he got a prosecutor fire, fired um, by saying he's going to withhold $1 uh, $1 billion from Ukraine. Uh, so to me, those are all logical explanations of why you, President Trump would want to talk about that, not some nefarious uh, reason. Well, and I think... Um, and so... Go ahead. I'm sorry. Mr. Collins. I apologize. Did you want to add something? No, I thought you were through. I'm sorry. Okay, thank you. Um, also, let's see. Oh, this is a good one. That This gets under my skin, so I guess that's why you guys keep using it. <laughs> is uh, on, on page three at the bottom, my Democratic colleagues and Judiciary Committee and here in the impeachment, they keep on saying that it says, a discredited theory, we're talking about Ukraine now, a discredited theory promoted by Russia, Alec alleging that Ukraine, rather than Russia, interfered in the 2016 election. Mr. Collins, did Republicans, or it, I don't think President Trump ever said that, ever say that Russia was never involved? Or did we just say that it's possible that both could have influenced the 2016 Well, we've never election. said, I mean, I've never been, I believe Russia's been involved in elections, not only ours, but others for, for years. That's never been a, and it, it really is one of the disturbing parts, and I know we have some disagreement between my judiciary colleagues. It was one of the main things that come out of the Mueller report that was genuinely, we both understood, but we never de dealt into that legislatively. We dealt with it in some of our elections, and it may be touched on it, I'll give that much to some of the bills that we passed, but we didn't really dig into it in depth. But um, I think the issue was is, is Fiona Hill and others, uh, you know, had talked about the Ukrainians, and I'll say that individuals, you know, who did side with Clinton. And then Fiona mm -hmm. Hill's uh, her own statement was the Ukraine, in her words, were Ukraine bet on the wrong horse. Uh, but again, this is this goes to a whole you know a discussion that we've had on this, and at this point, it's become very clear. We've talked about this over and over and over. These are the facts, you know, that we look at it. I think it is interesting that you would say that I hear this a good bit, that the, these are undisputed facts. They are disputed, inherently disputed, because if we didn't have undisputed facts, we'd all be agreeing here. And that's not true. We don't agree on the, the basis for the fact. We don't believe on the basis of the motivation of the call. We don't believe that that is, and that's, that's an inherent um, difference will in the, the two sides. That's will, why we're here. Will the gentleman that yield for unanimous consent request? Yes. I ask unanimous consent to insert into the record of this, at this time a November 8th political ar article entitled, quote, Ukraine did not didn't, didn't interfere in the 2016 uh, campaign. Trump officials testified. Yep, Thank and, you. I, and I appreciate the gentleman putting that in the record. But again, for my 14th time, or to, I think today, I've not said Ukraine. I said Ukrainians. Individual Ukrainians. So there's a difference. There's the United States, and there's you. You know, they're members of they're Americans who may do something, but it's not the American government. And I think this is the thing, the point that I've tried to make. You know, during the rest of this, you know, during the hearing today. Yeah, uh, and and in fact, there was uh, I think it was op-eds, guest columns written by Ukrainian officials that were against President Trump, if I'm not remember, uh, if my memory serves me correctly. Um, not to belabor this too much, but I think it's important to get this all on the record. On page four of the Articles of Impeachment, it claims that, um, that things were con he conditioned two official acts on public announcements that he had requested. Again, Mr. Collins, is there any proof of that? No. No, it's not. I mean, it's, we went through this over and over. I mean, and again, one of the questions that came up is they're going to box him in. Box him in so they had a public stance on corruption. He just got elected, and like all of us, we have members, you know, you want to make sure that he's making the stance, not only what he ran on, but also he's going to actually do it, because if you actually do it, you know, say it, you can do it. This is, again, a concern about the corruption issue that we brought up before. And, and I would just, so I'm not repeating myself, there was over and over again in here, it says openly and corruptly urging and soliciting Ukraine to undertake investigations for his personal political benefit. As you noted, um, uh, Chairman McGovern, I serve on the Judiciary Committee. I went over transcripts. I, you know, listened to as much live testimony as I could. I was rejected from actually going into the uh, Mr. Skiff's uh, room so that I could cross-examine witnesses, which was very disheartening and I think very unfair. 
Um, but again, there, there's no proof. There's no proof of this. It's like wishful thinking or something. It's like what you want. And, and, um, and as Mr. Collins said in, in these, uh, the Nadler report, I mean, it, it throws out all kinds of stuff. It in, talks about bribery, which isn't even in the articles of, an, of, of impeachment here. So obviously, it didn't have much proof on that. Um, and you just keep throwing out these things. All right, let's move to articles, Article 2, Obstruction of Congress. Um, Mr. Collins, uh, can you kind of explain what the normal procedure, what has been done in the past uh, when the legislative branch wants something from the executive branch? My understanding is they first pursue accommodations like they talk with each other to see what they can come up with, and then if they run into a roadblock, then one of them goes to court and they and they get a ruling. Um, did, did is that your understanding? And did the House Democrats pursue any accommodations? And if there was a roadblock, did they take the time to go to court, or did they just? move forward with articles of well, impeachment instead. Again, it's, it's a whole year process, but if you just want to talk about the last couple of months, whenever they would call a witness or the witness would not, you know, wouldn't come in, in a couple of cases, uh, the witness actually went to court to determine, you know, should they testify or not given their position. And the House uh, majority withdrew from the suit. I mean, so they didn't want to continue that process in court. Uh, historically, and, and look, it's, it's, if you take the uh, the majority's argument on face value that there is a time issue here, that there is an election issue that is a clear and present danger, as they've actually said many times, then you would you'd want to avoid something that could drag this out further. I get that, um, but this is not historically the way this is done. It's not historically even investigations of of impeachments uh, have been done. Those took long, you know, several years. The Nixon, the Clinton. I mean, there were there were investigations for for a long time into these things as we go along. Remember, though, we were tied up for the first half of the year in Mueller, and then we got out of Mueller in July, and we went basically straight into this, you know, right after it. So this has been the situation we're in. Thank you. Mr. Collins, I'm now going to turn to the, what I call the Nadler Report, which was kind of dumped on us at, I don't think it was midnight last night. It was after midnight the, the night before, 658 pages. So I was frantically trying to read through it. Um, while I was in different committees. Um, but Mr. Collins, at the beginning of this, it says, uh, in th to me, this was laughable, I, I have to admit. It says, from start to finish, the House conducted its inquiry with a commitment to transparency, efficiency, and fairness. The minority was present and able to participate at every stage. Uh, boy, Mr. Collins, do you think that's true? Well, I think they're talking about the, what they witnessed and not what they did. Um, you know, I think this is the the interesting part of this is getting it from our committee and being a rubber stamp for what somebody else did. Um, Grant, I'm not going to, and I've not denied that there was not witnesses that testified in the intelligence committee, and also that, and I've, I never have not been one of the, the members who said that we didn't have our uh, time. We had, uh, you know, our our members actually discussed, our councils discussed that those were actually testimonial times. I did think it was really interesting that. Uh, and this, I think, shows the sort of the craziness of this. I think it was, and I, I, I think it was Mr. Perlmutter, but I'm not sure. I actually, brought up Mr. Castor. Mr. Castor is a staff member, being a te being our witness. And the only reason Mr. Castor was a witness is because Mr. Schiff wouldn't testify because Mr. Nunez should have been sitting in that seat, and actually he was at the beginning of the hearing. He was behind Mr. Castor. So I mean, I under I don't agree with it in any shape or form. But the discussion that you just read is viewing another committee, not our own. Because once it got to us, as I was found out today, and, I, and I'm, I'm hoping it was a misspeak, and I, I assume for my friend it probably was, that only 17 members that were called was the ones we could have actually called. I'm going to assume that was a misspeak. But also, it was, it's really interesting when you're dealing in such magnitude as an impeachment that you actually allow the chairman of the committee, or, or, and then by virtue of a majority vote, determine their relevance. When no idea, and not even a question was determined, could this provide exculpatory opinion? Could it provide anything that would go further in this, this process? Just simply say it's it, it, those witnesses are not relevant. And really what, I, I never had to get a, a letter from Chairman Nadler about that because I could see the timing of, I've also been around this game long enough, you have to notice hearings. And the way we were noticing hearings 
There was not enough time to notice the next hearing if you had to put in a, a, either a minority hearing day or you had to add witness day or the president. You just didn't have the time because when they started actually noticing hearing, sometimes, like I said, it's, it's, it's just a simple fact you can look that you're not going to get the witnesses. It didn't matter. I, I could have put anybody on there and it wouldn't have mattered because they didn't have the time. They'd already scheduled the hearings you know, out when they got it back. So that's, that's just a concern. It, it just goes into the general concern I have about where do we go in this body, in this house, come January 1? Because it will be long gone from us tomorrow. But where are we going to be on January 1? We all have to get together. We all have to work together. We all have to look forward. And then who sits in these seats after this time happens? And that's just the general concern that a lot of us have. You'll get what you, the majority will get what they want, and that's fine. But is, is that a in long-term benefit, not only to what they wanted to accomplish, but also the long-term benefit of this body? I would have to say no. And thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. I'm going to close with something that I've said before in Judiciary Committee. And uh, at the risk of repeating it, it's, a, I guess, an oldie but a goodie, in, in my opinion. And so it's actually um, Chairman Nadler's own words. And I want to repeat. So during an interview on MSNBC's Morning Joe on November 26, 2018, so not that long ago, Chairman Nadler outlined a three-pronged test that uh, said would allow for a legitimate impeachment proceeding. Now, and I quote, there are really three questions, I think. First, has the president committed impeachable offenses? I believe the answer is no, and there has been no proof. Second, do these offenses rise to the gravity that's worth putting the country through the drama of impeachment? Again, I would say no, because there has been no evidence of any crime committed, or that no evidence put forward. They were not able to establish treason, bribery, or any high crimes or misdemeanors. And three, because you don't want to tear the country apart. You don't want half of the country to say to the other half for the next 30 years, we won the election, you stole it from us. You have to be able to think at the beginning of the impeachment process that the evidence is so clear of offenses so grave that once you've laid out all the evidence, a good fraction of the opposition voters will reluctantly admit to themselves they had to do it. Otherwise, you have a partisan impeachment, which will tear the country apart. If you meet those three tests, then I think you do the impeachment. Well, in all three counts, I don't think Mr. Nadler has met his test, and especially in the last one, even if you can test the other ones, this has been a partisan impeachment. Um, not one Republican voted to move forward with House Resolution 660 uh, to, to move forward with the inquiry. Not one Republican and Judiciary Committee voted for the Articles of Impeachment. I suspect not one Republican will vote to move this forward in rules tonight, and I suspect that not one Republican will vote for these Articles of Impeachment on the floor of the United States House of Representatives, and Mr. Chairman and members, this is tearing the country apart. And with that, I yield back. Thank you very much. Um, I'm kind of a stickler for details and accuracy in terms of uh, some of the things that have been said here, um, because these hearings are going to be uh, enshrined in, you know, uh, in, our, uh, in our files, and they'll be there forever. Uh, but I want to go back to something the gentlewoman said about um, the votes on impeachment. I repeat, nobody, nobody, Democrat or Republican, has had an opportunity to vote on articles of impeachment. And contrary to what has been said, uh, voting uh, to not table doesn't mean you get an automatic vote on the impeachment. I'll give you an example. On November 6, 2007, the House rejected a motion to table a Kucinich resolution to impeach Vice President Cheney and then move to adopt a motion to refer the resolution to the Judiciary Committee. Um, and that's what most of us uh, had in mind. Uh, so I can't say everybody, uh, but I can, I'll, I can say that it is just inaccurate uh, to say that uh, people would have automatically voted for impeachment. 
uh, or that, that voting not to table would mean a vote, uh, an automatic vote on impeachment. Uh, I just think it's important for the record to be clear. And having said that, it has nothing, absolutely nothing, to do with what we're talking about here today. Um, and, uh, and I appreciate the fact that the gentlewoman is not phased by the overwhelming evidence uh, about and the president's behavior, uh, but some of us genuinely are, uh, and many of our constituents are. Uh, and I think that is what compels us to be here today. Um, and with that, I want to yield to the... Ms. Torres. Um, yes, so in reference um, to the squad, I'm not sure why members um, and the president continue to pick on them the way they do. Um, not that I need to defend any of them, because I think they do a great job defending themselves. Um, but I believe that the tweet that caused that resolution uh, from the President of the United States actually states, go back to the countries where you came from, referring to American citizen members of Congress. If that's not despicable racism that will continue to be tolerated by some members of our caucus, I don't know what it is. And I yield back. And I appreciate that. I, I think the concern many of us have is the bar has been so lowered uh, that we're, we're justifying and defending the indefensible. Ms. Uh, Ms. Uh, Scanlon. Thank you. Um, Mr. Raskin, I, I saw you sitting up in your seat over a couple questions, so I just wanted to ask if you'd care to um, comment on, on the question about whether the conduct alleged in the articles is is not just a constitutional crime, but also a statutory crime that could be criminally prosecuted. Well, yes, of course. And, you know, there are a whole series of uh, crimes in the middle of the Venn diagram, which are both high crimes and misdemeanors and also possibly statutory crimes. But it has never been the understanding of any Congress, whether it was the Congress, the, the House of Representatives that impeached Bill Clinton or the House of Representatives that brought articles against Richard Nixon or back to Andrew Johnson, that you need first to prove a statutory offense before uh, the House gets to move articles of impeachment. And you can understand how nonsensical that is because it's impossible to square with the other argument we've heard so long from our colleagues, which is that the Department of Justice may not, under any circumstances, prosecute, try, or convict a president while he's in office, uh, whatever the merits of that proposition, and I do think they deserve greater scrutiny, um, whatever the merits of them, how can you say the president cannot be prosecuted under any circumstances because he can be impeached? It's only Congress can impeach him, and then when there's an impeachment um, investigation, then it is being said, you must first prove that he's committed a crime. I mean, it just doesn't make any sense. It's a game of three-card Monty. All of it essentially supports the president's own claim that he is basically above the law. I mean, he says that under the Constitution, he can do whatever he wants. And so I think that all of us should beware for all time of making arguments that um, put the president in a different kind of box, a box that is above the Constitution and above the people. That's going to be really dangerous for us. OK. Um, I also wondered if you could um, address the fact um, it has struck me that with respect to this call to the president of the Ukraine that occurred on July 25th, that um, we didn't hear any rationale, no witness has testified that there was any legitimate national security or any rationale for that call until after the whistleblower blew the whistle on that call. So there were no contemporaneous conversations um, could you, could you address that point? Well, the, the, Ms. Scanlon, you're absolutely right. All of these are uh, after-the-fact concoctions and rationalizations that don't square with any of the evidence that we have on the record. And when I say evidence, I'm talking about the evidence that has actually been um, submitted to Congress through people's sworn testimony. I'm not talking about the kind of stuff that people just put on social media or a tweet. I'm talking about real evidence. So what do we know? Well. Um, if the president was concerned about continuing corruption uh, in Ukraine, why did he cut anti-corruption funding to Ukraine in half? If he was concerned about fighting corruption in Ukraine, why did he recall the U.S. ambassador to Ukraine, who was the lead champion of the anti-corruption effort there? And why did he recall her under circumstances where she was under attack 
by people who are working with the, the retrograde corrupt forces in Ukraine as part of this smear campaign, that's a really serious problem when you think about it. In any event, Congress passed the aid to go to the reformer president, the anti-corruption president, President Zelensky. We attached uh, stringent anti-corruption criteria, which were satisf satisfied according to President Trump's own Department of Defense, according to President Trump's own Department of State. The money was on his way, and then he held it up because everyone knows why he held it up. He held it up because he wanted these statements, these announcements from President Zelensky that had to do with Joe Biden and uh, trying to overthrow our intelligence community's understanding that it was Russia that had interfered in our presidential campaign in 2016, instead replacing Ukraine. Well, that again is nonsensical. Um, but none of that appears on the record anywhere. We asked lots of witnesses. They also said, for example, oh, the president was concerned about burden sharing. Actually, the European countries, the EU member countries, have given billions of dollars to, to Ukraine, $12 billion to Ukraine. How insulting is that for us to go around saying, as a way to justify the, our president's behavior, oh, they weren't doing enough for Ukraine. The EU member countries put up $12 billion, and I'm proud of the more than billion dollar, more than billion dollars that we put in over the last few years, but that's not as much as the EU member countries collectively um, put in. So we'd rather pick a fight with our own democratic allies and say they're not doing enough, even though Ambassador Sondland himself testified, the president's own ambassador testified when we asked him, did the president ever say to you, go to the EU member countries and tell them they need to increase their funding? No, never happened. There's no record of the president doing anything to try to get them to put more money in. It's an after the fact rationalization, it's a pretext and it's beneath the dignity of this body for us to keep spreading this as some kind of plausible rationale for the president's behavior. If you don't think it's a big deal for the president of the United States to shake down foreign governments and pressure them to get involved in our campaigns, just tell us so. But don't make up all of these other fairy tale explanations for what was going on. Okay, and contrary to these, these after-the-fact rationalizations, in fact, we have contemporaneous witnesses like Ambassador Sondland and others who said, no, it was clear that what was important to the president was getting this personal political favor. I mean, the president himself said when asked in public what would he have the Ukrainians do, he basically said the same thing, just like his chief of staff admitted it. This stuff is happening in plain sight. Let's stop playing pretend. We've got a very heavy decision to make about what to do with the president who enlists and recruits foreign governments to get involved in our elections. Is that what democracy is going to be like for the rest of the 21st century? Is that what it's going to be like for our children and our grandchildren and our great-grandchildren? We've got to decide that. You know, Dr. Fiona Hill, in her testimony, said, Russia can't beat us militarily. Russia can't beat us economically. But they've got a strategy that involves the internet and intervention in elections around the world. She said she thinks of Russia as the world's largest super PAC. Right? And are we going to be allowing the President of the United States to be working with Vladimir Putin's super PAC for the tyrants and the despots and the people who are trying to interfere with the growth and the spread of democracy around the world? I hope not. Okay. Well, I wanted to spend a couple minutes just looking at the real fundamental question here before us, which is, should these articles of impeachment move forward? And Mr. Collins, I understand from the dissenting views from the minority that um, you think it's too vague to charge with abuse of power here. Um, and I also understand that uh, you accept that abuse of power can form the basis for an impeachment, correct? Yes. Um, but as I understand it, the, the objection is that you need more concrete facts. So I'd like to just explore for a minute what concrete facts could get you, if any, could get you over that bar? So if a president were to send our troops to war in exchange for a personal cash payment, that would be impeachable, wouldn't it? I think what we're going to go down a road here of hypotheticals that, frankly, I'm just not going to play with. And, I mean, I, I, there will be things okay, that you and I can both agree. Okay, my time. That's fine. Um, Mr. Raskin, in fact, that was a hypothetical that the framers of the Constitution looked at, wasn't it? Sure, that 
that the executive <laughs> can't interfere with that. Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, when the framers were looking at what kinds of offenses should be impeachable, didn't they look to the example of an executive who was being paid off by a foreign country? Absolutely. Um, first of all, all four witnesses, the three called by the majority, um, and uh, Ms. Professor Turley from GW, who was the minority witness, all of them said that abuse of power is an impeachable offense. In other words, we had unanimous agreement among our academic scholars that abuse of power is an impeachable offense. There's nothing vague or nebulous about it. Abuse of power meant something to the framers. Now, we've got to wrestle with the facts. That's our job. But they all said that. And when they canvassed all of the records of the Constitutional Convention and the ratifying conventions and the Federalist Papers, and everybody can retrace their steps themselves, and I encourage you to do it because we've got to use this episode as a civics lesson for America. And when you retrace it, you will find that there were three kind of things on their mind. One was a president who tries to corrupt our elections. Two was a president who makes deals with foreign powers in order to alter the course of our political destiny. In other words, taking choice away from we the people and giving it to foreign despots and spies and you know, b people who would not have our best interests at heart, basically. Um, and the third thing was the president elevating his own personal, financial, and political interests over the common good. And, you know, I, I really want to emphasize that point because the framers wanted the president of the United States to have complete and undivided loyalty to the American people and not foreign powers and not his or her own uh, financial plans and certainly not um, elevating his or her own electoral ambitions over the rule of law such that he or she would be willing to corrupt elections just to get reelected. And, you know, George Mason famously asked, um, you know, is there anybody who really should be above justice? Uh, and especially the person who himself uh, has the more means of injustice. And so we have more to fear from the president because of his awesome powers. How can we say then that he should be beyond the reach of the law? Well, I, that's one of the things I found really interesting as we've gone through this, listened to the experts. I did want to um, ask unanimous consent, and I'm not sure which letter Mr. Perlmutter introduced before, but we do have a letter now that has 500 legal scholars who've signed on uh, saying that there's um, grounds for impeachment in our current no, fact no. situation, and over 700 historians who have signed a separate letter. So I, I'm not objection. sure which one. Okay. But so I, I wanted to explore a little bit, and I'm sorry if Mr. Collins doesn't want to do this. Perhaps he'd, he'd consider another question, because I'm trying to find, you know, do we have any common ground here um, with respect to what might be impeachable? So... Um, if the president ordered the government to withhold payment from a contractor building his wall on the southern border unless the contractor paid the president a million dollars, would that be an impeachable abuse of power? With all due respect to the gentlelady who is very talented in law, if we want to talk about the issue at hand, I'll be happy to. But I'm, I think we're way past the point here at Rules Committee to determine, because we've already issued the articles of impeachment. And I think, in, in all due respect, yeah. we're just getting it to the floor and I'll, I'll discuss as I have the facts of this case, which I disagree with, and we both disagree, and I respect that greatly. I don't, I'm not going to just chase a what is impeachable offense. I wish the, the majority had done that a long time ago. So, well, okay, you know, reclaiming but, but not, my but, time. I, I just, appreciate it. You can go back to it. I think, you know, the, the minority's report says that you don't think the abuse of power allegation here is concrete enough. So I'm trying to figure out what, if anything, you might think is concrete. How about if the facts showed that the president had ordered a government, uh, ordered our government to withhold foreign aid to Israel unless the prime minister of Israel um, paid off our president? The Would that be enough? The gentlelady is very good, but I will also continue to say if the gentlelady, my report is specific to this action and the gentlelady is laying out a hypothetical and laying out a theoretical, uh -huh. which is fine, but I just, I, with all due respect, I'm just not going to participate in it. All right, then, would the gentleman agree that if the president abused his office by, if, if we could agree that the president had sought this favor for personal political reasons rather than one of these after-the-fact 
um, explanations that he's offered, would that be impeachable if we agreed upon the intent? Look, and again, this is our, sort of a last round around this. If you had alleged crimes, if you had alleged actual things in abuse of power, instead of saying an amorphous abuse of power, which is what we list in our report, instead of going to that, none of those specific charges were listed in your abuse of power, but yet you propagated your report with all of these other things. There are ways that you can build it, and the general lady knows my answer is, is can there be an abuse of power? Yes. And I've never not denied that. But what I'm not going to do tonight, because I do not find it convincing or, or relative to this uh, hearing of getting a rule to put this on the floor tomorrow, is what our report actually says. Is there abuse of power evident? Yes, you can go back to the Nixon impeachment. There were abuse of power. Those are things that you can look at. In this uh, highlight here, and Mr. Raskin, I'm sure, can discuss this at, at length in his discussion, I will go back to what I find here is not an abuse of power. I did, I've said this clearly on many occasions. And to engage in hypotheticals to make this abuse of power look better, I'm just not going to do. And I appreciate the gentlelady. Mr. Raskin, you had something? Yes. President Nixon um, was charged in the abuse of power article with conducting a break-in of his political opponent's campaign headquarters. President Trump is essentially being charged with conducting a break-in of American democracy in order to harm his political opponent. The, the two crimes are quite analogous. Now, one has the additional factors you just pointed out, Ms. Gallen, of dragging a foreign government into the equation, which was something extra that the framers feared uh, greatly. But both of these are abuses of power. Con the House of Representatives didn't say, oh, um, you've got to demonstrate that he's been convicted of burglary in the District of Columbia, or conspiracy to commit burglary, before you take it up as abuse of power, right? And so um, it is true that our abuse of power claim has some overlapping elements with bribery, as we've discussed thoroughly in the report, with uh, honest services fraud against the people, perhaps extortion, and perhaps many other crimes, and all of those things can be prosecuted under the Constitution later, but that doesn't absolve us of our constitutional responsibility to prevent high crimes and misdemeanors against the American people in the meantime. I guess but did, but did one man? less try, Mr. Oh, Collins. Let oh, me just. Oh, I have something I was going to say. So I'm fine. just curious. I mean, we have the precedent of President Nixon, who was accused of abuse of power because he ordered the FBI to investigate his political opponents to get dirt on them. Do you think that was impeachable? Again, I'm, I'll comment on the phone call of this year. And also, I'll tell what Mr. Turley said. And when he said, he said, facts must be clear, convincing, and comprehensive. This record does not, is contested. And so the, and the Democrat in the majority has not accepted exculpatory uh, evidence here. So I think when you look at it from our perspective, that's, that's what we laid out in our, in our report. And it goes back to the fact that I inherently will sit here with the facts in dispute, do not believe it's the abuse of power based on this phone call. And Mr. Collins, I'm just trying to find out what, if anything, you would consider impeachable because we haven't seen that yet. I mean, you, you won't even concede what was precedent from the Nixon situation. And here we have a situation, I'm asking if the facts were to show that the president withheld foreign aid to another country in order to get a personal political favor, not for matters of national security, would that be impeachable? And you don't seem able to answer that question. I seem very capable of answering. I'm just not going to follow your path on where you wanted me to lead because at the same well, point in time, I've got to, I've got to do, I, you and I both have to work, vote on words on paper. And words on paper tomorrow is this case. It's not the hypothetical event, because I don't believe you've made this case, and that's why I'm pushing back on it. And we'll continue very politely to push back on this. I'm just not going to go down this road, because you've not made your case. Now, you can convince yourself and well, others that you with can. With all due respect, Mr. But that's Collins, my, that's my minority the House is not it. the finder of fact. The trial is for the Senate. Right here, we're talking about whether there's enough evidence to make out the case. And I disagree. I believe that And I there disagree is. there's not. Fine. Um, I guess one other thing I wanted to just push back on is this idea that somehow this impeachment process is some kind of um, radical left plot of some sort. I, I do have to thank our, our colleagues on the other side for giving my children a good laugh um, that their you know, soccer mom, carpool driving, PTA, running the Apple Festival at the Methodist Church, mom is some kind of radical. But I did want to make clear for the record that the only radical view I'm embracing here is the idea that we the people should be governed by a constitution that divides powers between three co-equal branches. 
and establishes checks and balances on the president. And despite the rhetoric that um, somehow this is a, a completely partisan um, exercise, uh, my faith in these core constitutional principles is, I, I believe it's still a shared American value that unites Democrats, independents, conservatives, libertarians. Um, I think there is a growing consensus even among Republicans who speak off the record or are not dependent on the president for continuation in their job. And I'd just like to point to a couple of examples. Uh, this weekend, Tom Ridge, the former Republican governor of my home state, Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, the first Homeland Secretary of the United States, member of Congress, Vietnam vet, said that he believed the president's conduct here was an abuse of power to ask a foreign leader for a political favor. Um, our former colleague, Mr. Dent, also from Pennsylvania, said he's spoken with Republicans who are absolutely disgusted and exhausted by the president's behavior. Another former Republican colleague of ours, David Jolly, said we have witnessed an impeachable moment. Former Republican Congressman Reed Ribble of Wisconsin said recently, clearly there was some type of quid pro quo, and when asked if he believes the testimony present, presented warrants impeachment, he said, I do. Former South Carolina Republican Congressman Bob Inglis, who served on the Judiciary Committee during the Clinton impeachment, said last month, without a doubt, if Barack Obama had done the things revealed in the testimony in the current inquiry, we Republicans would have impeached him. And while I'm hesitant, I don't want my colleagues to have a stroke, um, Joe Scarborough, who is a former Republican congressman from Florida, said every Republican knows that Donald Trump was asking for dirt on Joe Biden in exchange for releasing the military funds. These are just a few of the folks Ms. who've Danlin. come out here. Ms. Danlin, would you yield just one moment so I can add one? Certainly. We, William Webster, the only person that has been the FBI director and CIA director, said the same thing. Okay. And... Uh, at age 95. Okay, and, and with that, I would yield back. Do, Mr. Raskin, did you have anything further? The, I just want to say, um, nothing strikes me as more conservative than wanting to conserve the Constitution and the Bill of Rights and the political order that has been bequeathed to us by the framers and the founders. And um, the conservative tradition is a great tradition in America, like the liberal tradition, in the heart of the word liberal is liberty. And liberals have every reason to stand up for the Constitution now. Just like progressives, people who look for progress, um, they have every reason to rally around the Constitution. We're not one political party. We're not one political belief system or ideology. We're not one race or ethnicity, but we've got one Constitution in our country. We've got to cling really closely to our Constitution through this period. And I know that doesn't mean we're all going to agree in the end, but I think that if we're all constitutional patriots, we're going to be able to see our way through a very dark moment in American history. Yeah. Can I comment on that? Just, is the last, if not, you need to give back. It's fine. I understand. Fine. Okay. Um, all of these that you just mentioned, the Republicans you just mentioned, Tom Ridge is a great guy. In fact, the last mm -hmm. time I saw him was a few months ago when he awarded Hakeem and I the Civility Award from Allegheny College. He's a good guy. There's just one difference in all these. They don't wear pens currently in this Congress. They're not voting on these articles. And I, and I would have I to mentioned assume, that. And I would have to assume in my position that if they did, then we could always disagree. But they're not. And I think my only thing is, is from a constitutional perspective, and I appreciate it. And, and again, I, I'll just say this. I'm looking at facts. You're looking at facts. We disagree. And I think at the end of the day, that's the way it's, it's got to be. And I didn't mean to prolong that. And from that perspective, I think it's, it's not a con I don't fight less for the Constitution than Mr. Uh, Mr. Uh, Raskin here. I will, I'll never back up on that argument. He can fight and say he's fighting for it. I'm going to fight and say I'm fighting for it. And that's my case then to my, my voters and the American people. To frame this in, you know, anything else is just simply say, look, here's the facts. Let's deal with the facts and let's vote on it tomorrow. And we'll go from there. Are you, are you back? Just, thank you. Thank if you. If I could add one thing to, I, I think, a, a fine statement by Mr. Collins. Um, but for those out there who don't know Capitol Hill lingo, wearing a pin means Oh, I thought I had, there's my pin. Uh, you you got to wear a pin in order to get into the buildings because there's so many of us. There's 435, so they don't recognize. Now, some of us are, are famous here. Uh, Mr. Collins is famous, so they'll let him in. But, you, you know, the rest of us, we, we got to, 
we got to wear our pins in order to get in. But, but I, I do want to push back against the idea that this conversation is only for people wearing pins. And I think America's got to think about this in, in a really profound way. The framers of the Constitution were trying to decide whether impeachment should be located in the Supreme Court and treated as a matter of law and legal induction, or whether it should be with Congress and the people's representatives. And they thought it was so important and so fundamental that it had to be with the people. Now, they know we're politicians. They know we've got other stuff going on. We're fighting you know, in our caucus to lower prescription drug prices, and we're fighting for the Equality Act, and we want to pass the universal criminal mental background check. My colleagues have an agenda. We've got an agenda. We've got to deal with all that and also think about impeachment. And what else do representatives have to do? We've got to interact with our constituents. So when people say to me, oh, well, you, know, you don't want to talk to the public about it. You just want to go decide. I don't think that's right. I think this is a national dialogue that we're engaged in here. It's about the destiny, the future of our whole country, our whole, our whole form of government. So I'm glad that you raised this. I'm glad that I hear from conservatives all the time who are on our side. I'm sure that there's some liberals who are on the other side. I think that's the way that it should be. I, I think we got to not be bound just by what these labels, certainly these partisan labels, are all about. You know, our greatest political leaders have understood that were in partisan competition in the election. Like Thomas Jefferson, he was a real brawler when it came to elections. He was savvy, he was smart. But when he got elected in 1800 and he gave that inaugural speech, he said, we are all Republicans, we are all Federalists. And George Washington reminded people always that the word party comes from the French word parti, a part. Our party is just part of the whole. When we get into office, we have to try to look out for the whole, not just for our part. Barack Obama said, this is not the red states of America or the blue states of America. This is the United States of America. So when we get elected, we have to try to think about the good of everyone. And I know that everybody in this room comes in that spirit and is trying to speak to the whole country and not just to a narrow base. Thank you, Mr. Raskin. I can never match you on the historical references, but I, I do want to close by noting Franklin's uh, response to a constituent when uh, he and his fellow framers came out of Independence Hall in Philadelphia, and they were asked what kind of a government they'd produce. And he said, a republic if you can keep it. So I think your emphasis on people needing to with it as citizens. So thank you, and I yield back. Thank you very much. And I will use it wisely, I promise. You said that to a New Yorker. <laughs> thank you, uh, Mr. Hastings. I want to thank both uh, Mr. Raskin and Mr. Collins for enduring a long day and for all the hard work that you've put in. Uh, just some observations and then a few questions, if I might. Um, when America's founders gathered for the Second Constitutional Convention uh, more than 230 years ago, they laid down not just laws and procedures, but the core principles and values that would guide this young nation. At that time, George Washington asked whether we are to have a government of respectability under which life, liberty, and prosperity are secured to us, or whether we are to submit to one, which may be the result of chance or the moment springing perhaps by some aspiring demagogue who will not consult the interest of his country so much as his own ambitious views. The founders did not take lightly the matter of impeachment. Uh, as, uh, as has been described, the journals of James Madison, for instance, detail a solemn and thoughtful debate among the framers over the power to remove a president and the conditions that would warrant such a decision. It was to be reserved only for treason, bribery, and although those were narrow, they added high crimes and misdemeanors, meaning not just serious crimes against an individual, but it borrows from 14th century English law, those crimes instead committed against the state itself, or in this case, uh, the very nation the president is sworn to protect. Um, and our founders feared two things, and you touched upon this earlier, uh, Mr. Raskin, but two things above all others, the overreach of executive branch powers by what they call the chief magistrate or the president, and the interference of foreign powers, at the time Great Britain and France most came to mind, but though the interference of foreign powers in our domestic affairs, and both they feared would undermine the foundations of our democracy. In fact, those fears had given rise to the very revolution which the American colonies 
sought independence from in the first place. And those fears have been realized, in my view, in the actions of the president, exactly why uh, impeachment exists at all. And the last time this committee gathered on the subject of the inquiry, I spoke of my hopes that the public phase of this process would bring answers for the American people on those allegations. And since that time, more than a month ago, we've heard, and members of the Judiciary Committee, we thank you, and members of the Intelligence Committee, because we've heard publicly from many key witnesses that have illuminated the alarming pattern of behavior the President has engaged in. And these witnesses are not partisan actors, but career diplomats, experienced intelligence officers and, officers and dedicated public servants. And I have to say, parenthetically, one of the proudest things for me was to observe those people testifying and giving as people dedicated to the country, patriots who spoke out not as partisans, but as people who love this country. Lieutenant Colonel Alexander Vindman described the unprecedented subversion of America's national interest in a strong Ukraine in favor of a wholly personal interest of President Trump. Dr. Hill testified to the back channels outside of our usual national security and diplomatic policy that sought to exchange a White House meeting for investigations pursued by the President. Ambassador Sondland, closely involved in the campaign to pressure Ukraine at the behest of the President, declared in no uncertain terms that this was a clear quid pro quo. These and other brave Americans gave testimony not as partisan Democrats, but experts in their field, underscoring that this process has not been one of politics, but one of duty. We have remained committed to a fair and open process with the only goals of discovering the truth and protecting the American public, which is why I'm so troubled that members of the Trump administration have repeatedly refused to testify in hearings and provide transparency to make their argument to the public. Despite this, we now have a clear picture of what occurred between the President of the United States and the government of Ukraine. Regrettably, sadly, I'm convinced President Trump has abused the powers of his public office, leveraged a foreign government for political benefit, and obstructed necessary congressional oversight of his conduct. In the end, it comes down, I think as you just mentioned, Mr. Raskin, uh, to one simple question posed by George Mason two centuries ago. Shall any man be above justice? The answer, of course, must unequivocally be no. This is a profound moment in our nation's history. It is not just a responsibility, but our somber obligation to, to protect the republic and uphold the very tenets it was founded upon, and that's why we must uphold our constitutional duty to justice by taking up uh, these articles of impeachment. And I hope those on both sides of the aisle can see that we are at a crossroads. Uh, and the future of our country hinges on decisions like the ones we make today. We cannot abdicate our responsibility to our constituents, to our country, by choosing to ignore the grave and, in my view, unlawful actions of the President and threaten to unravel centuries of progress. Uh, I'm blessed, as many of us are, with um, three beautiful grandchildren and a fourth on the way. And when I talk to them about right and wrong, I want to be able to look them in the eye and tell them I've always done my best to uphold what is good, what is just, and what is fair. And today that means casting a vote to hold accountable a President, the highest office in the land, uh, but a President who is blatantly and egregiously abused his office, jeopardized our national security, and put his own political favor ahead of our national interests. And for the sake of our children, our grandchildren, all of us, I urge my colleagues uh, to do the same. And uh, with that, I'd like to, uh, if I may, <clears throat> just um, pose a few questions. And uh, part of it involves, admittedly, around uh, the unclassified uh, transcripts of the uh, phone call. The argument being made by the President and his administration arguing that the call of July 25th uh, was intended to deal with widespread corruption in, in the Ukraine. That, that's as I understand their argument. Is that correct, Mr. Raskin? Do you see it the same way, Mr. Raskin? Forgive me, whose argument? The argument by the President and the White House is that their arguments and pushback was to combat general corruption, although it's not yes. in any way described in the actual transcript. But that's, that's the argument now being... Uh, it is, it is impossible for me to take it seriously, given that I uh, have researched all of the circumstances and the context, but I, I think that there's at least some half-hearted effort to stick with that story. So and it, what's interesting when you read the, the transcript, um, um, Mr. Lutsenko was the prosecutor who I believe Trump was referring to in the phone call when he said, I heard to, the, to President Zelensky, he said, I heard you had a prosecutor who was very good and he was shut down, and that's really unfair. A lot of people are talking about that, the way they shut 
him down, down a very good prosecutor down, and you had some very bad people involved. That is Mr. Lusensko that he's referring to, isn't it? I guess it is. No, yeah. it is not. And no. no, it is not. It's Shokin. Well, that's not. Mr. Shokin. It's oh. Oh, it's not entirely clear then. Yeah. It's not clear then because that's not who's, it's not mentioned at all. Um, but the, um, Mr. Lusensko, Lusenko is generally viewed to be corrupt himself. I mean, that was part of w what had happened with President Zelensky was the removal of Lusenko and other prosecutors deemed to be corrupt by the world community. Is that not correct? That, that, is, that is correct. And, but there was a history of corruption going back, and Zelensky was elected as a reformer, um, so yes. And in fact, during the call, it does seem to me that, I don't want to say that the two presidents were talking past one another, but on the one hand, uh, President Trump seemed to be arguing for retaining uh, the prosecutors who had been deemed by the world community generally to be corrupt and to be pro-Russian, um, and yet President Zelensky is talking about bringing in new and capable people. Is that not how I read the transcript, or is, is that, should I not read it that way? But I'm sorry, that who's talking, that, that Zelensky? It's sort of like yeah. talking past each other. The president, yes. uh, President Trump, is essentially arguing for the status quo, the prosecutors who have been deemed to be, is that? that? Well, the, the way I, yes, the way I read it is that President Zelensky is walking a tightrope. He's elected Correct. as a reformer. He has taken on the corrupt forces in his society, but he is being presented essentially with yet another corrupt scheme. I mean, that's what's so heartbreaking about this as described to us by Dr. Fiona Hill and uh, the Ambassador Yovanovitch. Um, this was a moment where Ukraine was trying to move forward from all of the corruption. Um, and as uh, I think it was George Kent who said, we try to teach the other countries of the world not to engage in politically based prosecutions not to have uh, a situation where someone gets into office and then decides to prosecute their opponents or go after someone who is considered a political threat to the president. And here we were, the most powerful country in the world, which Ukraine was depending on, and we were essentially imposing that scenario on them. Yeah. And I, I do note that despite um, uh, suggestions to the contrary, the only real reference is to this are the uh, uh, Biden and uh, as it says uh, at one point the president says I would like you to find out what happened with this whole situation they say crowd strike I guess you have one of your wealthy people the server they say Ukraine has it uh, a lot of things that went on unfortunately it's it's somewhat unintelligible uh, intelligent intelligible to understand exactly what he's talking about but at no point is there a suggestion that he's talking broadly about uh, corruption um, I want to just focus, if I can, in just a few minutes on the role of Rudy Giuliani in all of this, obviously well known to, uh, to New Yorkers, but, um, and I note that um, Ambassador Taylor, I think, in his uh, testimony said that he had suspicions before even taking the job um, and said, in part, can anyone hope to succeed with the Giuliani-Biden issue swirling? Um, what was your sense of what he meant by that um, in his testimony? Sure. He, he, Ambassador Taylor said that he had suspicions before taking his job, and he said, can anyone hope to succeed with the Giuliani-Biden issue swirling? Did he expand further upon that, and can you share that with us? Well, the general concern was that no one knew quite in what capacity Rudy Giuliani was operating. I think that that is a, a, a dilemma and a confusion that persists to this very day. Sometimes he's acting as a businessman for himself. Sometimes he's acting as the president's personal lawyer. Sometimes he's acting as lawyers for other people. Sometimes he's acting uh, on errands from foreign governments or he's doing work with foreign governments. Um, there's an interesting analyst of uh, corruption today named Sarah Chase, who's written a lot about corruption in Afghanistan, where she lived and she said, you've got to understand corruption today crosses different domains. So some of it's in the government sector, some of it's in the private corporate sector, some of it is in the underworld, and then you get certain players who cross all of these boundaries and unify them in different ways. So uh, I, I think that people understood that Rudy Giuliani had the ear of the president. He seemed to be authorized or empowered by the president 
to go on this uh, domestic political errand and try to make this happen. And he clearly had entree into the highest levels of the US government and seemed to be working with a lot of the government officials who were involved there. That's why President Trump kept telling people, go talk to Rudy, talk to Rudy. So did you hear in, um, in committee any evidence or uncover any evidence in the hearings that the White House lacked confidence in the State Department, the um, diplomatic corps, or the Department of Justice to communicate with Ukraine the need for a broad attack against corruption generally? I missed the beginning of your question. Did, I, did we? Did you uncover any evidence or hear any testimony that suggests the White House lacked confidence in the State Department or the Department of Justice or the diplomatic corps to communicate effectively with Ukraine the president's desire to worry about corruption generally? Well, there's an unstated premise there, which is that the president had a general interest in fighting corruption in Ukraine. And we saw little or no evidence of that at all. Uh, right. Remember, there had been hundreds of millions of dollars that had flowed to Ukraine under the prior corrupt president without a peep being uh, mentioned about it. And it was during Zelensky's <laughs> rise where the president got interested, but that didn't even have anything to do with Zelensky. It was because Joe Biden was running for president and he was looking for a hook to go after Joe Biden. And this was the plan that he decided on. And he was monomaniacal and single-minded about the whole thing. And he brought a lot of people together to try to make that happen. Right. So if you take if you take the president as word, which you know, trying to give him um, uh, uh, every uh, uh, every uh, opportunity to to make a case, you, you'd have to make come to the conclusion that somehow he lacked confidence in the Department of Justice or the State Department or normal diplomatic channels. Otherwise, why would he turn to Rudy Giuliani well, of all point. people to it, conduct this investigation? It's a great point. Uh, Attorney General Barr himself released a statement saying that President Trump had never contacted him with any evidence about the Bidens that he wanted to be investigated and never asked him to use the formal diplomatic uh, channels to connect with the law enforcement authorities in Ukraine. You know, there are real crimes that are being um, committed by Americans around the world or Americans are involved in conspiracies with different people. We actually have a way of working on this problem between governments. The president, who would have better access to the Department of Justice than anybody else in the country, never contacted the Department of Justice about getting in touch with Ukraine about any corruption that uh, he knew about. He didn't turn over any evidence. He didn't suggest any clues, none of it. He just went directly to the president of Ukraine and told him what he wanted him to do. He wanted him to make that announcement about Joe Biden. Well, and I do note, going back to the, the transcript, which is much talked about, where the President talks about, which I referenced just a few moments ago, the things that he was interested, which were narrowly uh, uh, about Biden's and the, uh, the, the so-called server. It's actually Zelensky who raises the name Giuliani first. So it's clearly something that had been communicated and well before July 25th, because he says, I will personally tell you that one of my assistants spoke with Mr. Giuliani just recently, and we are hoping very much that Mr. Giuliani will be able to travel to Ukraine and we'll meet once when he comes to to Ukraine. And clearly, there's already a pathway, and clearly Giuliani, who I don't think would be tapped to talk about corruption generally when you had Attorney General Barr and you have Secretary Pompeo and thousands of members of both the State Department and the Department of Justice that could do it, why they would choose Giuliani. But that's clearly a cue for President Zelensky in this conversation to raise the name of Giuliani. It's then, it, then the President uh, suggests um, <clears throat> that a lot of people are talking about that, the way they shut your very good prosecutor down and you had some very bad people involved. Mr. Giuliani is a highly respected man. He was the mayor of New York. I would like him to call you. Um, I will ask him to call you along with the Attorney General. Rudy very much knows what's happening. He's a very capable guy. If you would speak to him, that would be great. An indication that, again, these unusual channels of operating, not through normal diplomatic channels, um, and then again, uh, later on in the conversation, the president, well, she's going to go through some things. Speaking of uh, Ambassador um, Yovanovitch, I will have Mr. Giuliani give you a call, and I'm also going to have Attorney General Barr call, and we'll get to the bottom of it. And, um, and again, the president, good. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate that. I will tell Rudy and Attorney General Barr to call you. Um, and so on it goes. And it is just, in my mind, troubling 
that uh, Mr. Giuliani would be mentioned in the same breath repeatedly with the Attorney General um, and um, clearly representing the President personally. And as you point out, it's hard to tell what role he's playing at any given moment. Is the President's personal attorney? Is he a representative of the United States? Is he doing the President's political bidding for him? Or is he doing something that relates to his own commercial and business interests? Yesterday, Mr. Giuliani is reported to have said that President Trump was given detailed information about how Ambassador uh, Yovanovitch was impeding investigations that could benefit Mr. Trump, not that benefit the United States, but benefit Mr. Trump. Giuliani told the President, Secretary Pompeo, that Ms. Yovanovitch was blocking visas for Ukrainian prosecutors to come to the Uni United States to present evidence to him, Giuliani, and f federal authorities that he claimed to be damaging to Vice President uh, Biden and to Ukrainians who distributed documents that led to the resignation of President Trump's 2016 campaign chair, Paul um, Manafort. Um, is there any evidence at all that supports any of Mr. Giuliani's claims against Ambassador uh, Yovanovitch, either those that were reported yesterday or reported earlier in, uh, in this investigation? Well, it's a great question, because we asked that to numerous of the witnesses, whether there was anything to this conspiracy theory, basically. And um, the answer we got was, no, there's basically nothing to it. They are not aware that there was an organized um, campaign by the Ukrainian government to uh, get involved in our 2016 campaign. Uh, my friend, Mr. Collins, um, rightfully pointed out he's, that, that he and other supporters of the president in this matter have said there, there were Ukrainians who said things, uh, and I think the Ukrainian uh, ambassador of the United States was one of the ones who said things, but there were, you cannot put that in the same sentence or a paragraph or a book with what Russia has been doing to elections around the world. Our Department of Justice special counsel found a sweeping and systematic campaign to subvert and undermine the American election. They had hundreds of employees working around this, around, working on this around the clock. They spent millions of dollars or rubles doing it. They were trying to inject poison racial and ethnic and religious propaganda into our social media system. And that's you know, one thing, Mr. Morelli, that makes me very sad, that our country is divided. I don't think it's divided because we're trying to stand up for the rule of law and impeachment investigation. But the Russian attack on American democracy did have a lot to do with it. I mean, why did we have hundreds of neo-Nazis and Klansmen marching in broad daylight in Charlottesville, it's because there was ra divisive racial propaganda, ethnic and religious propaganda, pumped into American society. So I think that it's almost a patriotic duty for us in this very tough time to see that we try to bridge partisan and ethnic and racial and sectional differences, regional, all of those things. We cannot allow the enemies of democracy to exacerbate pre-existing fault lines in the country and open up old gulfs within our country. Yeah, and, and I, it, 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 just taking, uh, just extending that further, I note in the uh, uh, deposition um, from Dr. Hill, uh, she is quoted as saying, I went back to talk to Ambassador Bolton, and Ambassador Bolton asked me to go over and report this to our NSC counsel, to John Eisenberg. He told me, direct quote, you go and tell Eisenberg that I'm not part of whatever drug deal Sondland and Mulvaney are cooking up on this, and you go and tell him that you've heard and what I've said. So I went over to talk to John Eisenberg about this. I told him exactly you know, what had transpired and that Ambassador Sondland had basically indicated that there was an agreement with the Chief of Staff that they would have a White House meeting or you know, a presidential meeting if the Ukrainians start up these investigations again. And the main thing that I was personally concerned about, as I said to John, was that he did this in front of the Ukrainians. But I want to go back to and extend this to the result of um, um, Mr. Giuliani's campaign that he had set in motion against Ambassador Yovanovitch was also, this is part of the deposition from uh, Dr. Hill, why did the removal of Ambassador Yovanovitch mark a turning point for you? And this is to your point about throwing out conspiracies, et cetera, because there's no basis for her removal. The accusations against her had no merit whatsoever. This was a mismatch of conspiracy theories that, again, I've told you I believe firmly to be basis, baseless, an idea of an association between her and George Soros. I had had accusations similar to this being made against me as well. My entire first year of my tenure at National Security Council, 
filled with hateful calls, conspiracy theories, which has started again, frankly, as it's been announced that I've been giving this deposition. Um, she goes on to say, um, the most obvious explanation of the point seemed to be business dealings of individuals who wanted to improve the investment positions inside of Ukraine itself, uh, and also to deflect wear on the findings of not just the Mueller report on Russian interference, but what's also been confirmed by your own Senate report, and what I know myself to be true as a former intelligence analyst and someone who's been working on Russia for more than 30 years. So the fact that Ambassador Yovanovitch was removed as a result of this, I have to say, was pretty dispiriting. Who did you understand was responsible for her removal? I understood this as a result of the campaign that Mr. Giuliani had set in motion in conjunction with people who were writing articles and you know publications that I could have expected better of. Um, she's then asked, and do you discuss Ambassador Yovanovitch with Ambassador Bolton? I did. What was his reaction to this? His reaction was pained, and he basically said, in fact, he directly said, Rudy Giuliani is a hand grenade that is going to blow everybody up. He made it clear that he didn't feel that there was anything that he could personally do about this. Ambassador Bolton. Um, I also note, in a meeting on July 2nd in Toronto, Canada, Ambassador Volker conveyed to President Zelensky the quid pro quo described Ambassador Sondland. In doing so, he referenced the Giuliani factor and the need for the announcement of the two political investigations. And I note, uh, parenthetically, Ambassador Sondland would later testify, Mr. Giuliani was expressing the desires of the President of the United States of America. We knew these investigations were important to the President, and it wasn't so much that the investigations be done, merely that there be an announcement of the investigation so that it would aid the President's uh, election campaign. And uh, Mr. Morelli, if yes. I might, that's an excellent point. Uh, that might be the ultimate and most devastating refutation of the idea that the president was interested in ferreting out corruption. He didn't really care about the investigation. He just wanted the announcement for electoral purposes. And that's the testimony of his, <coughs> excuse me, his ambassador, Ambassador Sondland. Ambassador Volker had breakfast with Mr. Giuliani and his associate Lev Parnas at the Trump Hotel in December, uh, I'm sorry, here in Washington. Uh, the same Mr. Parnas, I note, who is currently under indictment for campaign finance violations. During the conversation, according to Volker's testimony, the ambassador stressed his belief that attacks being leveled against the former vice president related to Ukraine were false and that Biden was a man of integrity. He counseled Mr. Giuliani that the Ukrainian prosecutor, Letzeko, was promoting a self-serving narrative to preserve himself in power. According to Ambassador Volker, Mr. Giuliani agreed, but the promotion of Lutsenko's false accusations for the benefit of President Trump did not cease. Was any testimony presented that... Uh, in any way contradicts that testimony by Ambassador Volker? Uh, I don't believe so. Um, you know, I, uh, also testimony on August 2nd, Zelensky's advisor, Mr. Yermak, met with Mr. Giuliani in Madrid. They agreed Ukraine would issue a public statement. Again, I note that, again, it's the public statement part of this because that undermines the Biden candidacy. It does nothing to address corruption because the president, as it was testified by uh, Ambassador Sondland, Mr. Trump didn't seem to care at all about whether the investigation was actually conducted, simply that it was announced. Um, and Volker encouraged Giuliani to report to the boss of his results, results of his meeting with Mr. Yermak so that the White House visit could be arranged, which was well was sought after, as we know, by, uh, by Ukraine. Um, I, I'll stop there and re relate to questions about Mr. Giuliani, which to me, whole episode his role um, without um, any uh, portfolio from the United States simply acting as an actor on behalf of the president. Um, and clearly, even as late as today, continue to talk about how the investigations of Biden were to the benefit of the president. There's an old um, problem solving principle called Occam's razor. I'm sure you, Mr. Uh, Raskin, are well aware of it. It says, when presented with competing hypotheses, one should select uh, the solution with the fewest assumptions. And I just note, in order to believe those who support the president's view, you'd have to assume the following, that despite the transcript of July 25th, that specifically mentions the vice president and CrowdStrike, CrowdStrike and the server, we must assume the president meant corruption generally, although he doesn't refer to it in any way at all. We must assume Secretary Pompeo, Attorney General Barr, were incompetent in pursuing Ukrainian corruption charges generally, and that the need was to reach out to um, to uh, Mr. Giuliani, although there's no evidence of his failure of confidence in them. We must assume Mr. Giuliani was in a special position to pursue Ukrainian corruption generally, although there's no evidence or rationale for that at all. 
We must assume Ambassador Sondland and Acting Chief of Staff Mulvaney were both in error when they confirmed a quid pro quo. We must assume Lieutenant Colonel Vindman, Ambassadors Taylor, Volker, Sondland, and Yovanovitch, as well as Mr. Holmes and Dr. Hill, were all arrayed against the President, despite not a uh, modicum of evidence to that regard. We must assume that the White House officials like Donald McGahn and John Bolton and others somehow hold the key to the President's innocence if only they would testify. Uh, but of course, they refuse to testify. The list goes on and on. And I choose to follow the evidence which is laid out in the reports of the House Intelligence Committee, uh, the House Judiciary Committee, and uh, I continue to urge support of the rule and the underlying articles of impeachment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Raskin, at the heart of, I want to follow up on uh, the accusations against uh, Vice President Biden, which is at the heart of, uh, of what we're talking about. President Trump's smears against the Vice President are debunked accus accusations made by a corrupt Ukrainian prosecutor, Viktor Shulkin. You heard me right. President Trump and his supporters are so desperate to undermine um, Vice President Biden that they actually colluded with a Ukrainian fraudster. Deputy Assistant Secretary George Kent testified that there was, quote, broad-based consensus, end quote, among the United States, our European allies, and international financial institutions that Mr. Shokin was, and I quote, a typical Ukrainian prosecutor who lived a lifestyle far in excess of his government salary, who never prosecuted anyone known for having committed a crime, and who covered up crimes that were known to have been committed. That's a nice way to say that everyone in the entire world agreed that this Ukrainian prosecutor was a bad guy and corrupt. And so, Mr. Raskin, would it be accurate to say that the allegations that Vice President Biden inappropriately pressured Ukraine to remove Mr. Shokin are completely without merit? Totally without merit. Um, Vice President Biden was acting to articulate and implement U.S. foreign policy at that moment, and that policy was to get rid of a corrupt prosecutor. Okay, so let me repeat. It was far part of the official policy of the United States and the rest of the world to fight corruption in Ukraine, correct? Yes, it was. Did Vice President Biden um, ask Ukraine to help him cheat in an election like President Trump? No, he did not. Okay, you know, we can obfuscate all we want, but it won't change the simple fact there, there is nothing appropriate about President Trump's personal lawyer continuing to run around Kiev with corrupt former Ukrainian prosecutors in search of do, dirt about Joe Biden. Uh, I believe the American people know that uh, Joe Biden is an honorable man and they know it's wrong to seek foreign help to cheat in an election. And the president's ongoing pressure on Ukraine to investigate the former vice president is powerful evidence for why we have no choice but to move forward with these articles of impeachment. Uh, Mr. Chairman, um, there is nothing more distressing to me than the fact that not one of our Republican colleagues are willing to confront the president over his misconduct. And I have credibility on this. I confronted President Clinton on his misconduct. I've come uh, to impeachment with deep sadness the facts of this case are painful and indisputable. We know that the president abused his office, asking the leader of the Ukraine to announce an investigation of his political rival. We know that he illegally held up congressional appropriated aid to the Ukraine. And we know that he conditioned the release of vital military aid on Ukrainian President Zelensky's opening an investigation based on a debunked conspiracy theory about his political rival and foreign interference in the 2016 election. We also know that the president has actively blocked congressional attempts to determine the extent of his misconduct by ordering executive branch officials to defy subpoenas and withhold information. These facts are uncontested, confirmed in public 
by career public servants who have dedicated their lives to serving our country. Further, they are uncontested by the president and confirmed by his chief of staff. We have now reached a point where despite the unprecedented obstruction from the president, the evidence in this case is powerful enough to delay this vote any further would be irresponsible. Any delay would risk interference in the 2020 election and the permanent erosion of our system of checks and balances. This is not a matter of politics. I have never and will never support the impeachment of a president over a policy disagreement or a different ideology. This is a matter of protecting the integrity of our democracy for the next generation. As we labor to pass on to future generations many of the great hallmarks of our society, our financial might, our brilliant scientific enterprises, the gifts of our great natural resources, the strength of our military and the diplomatic corps as a force for good, we must also work with active stewardship and vigilance to pass on a vibrant and functional democracy. If we don't do our duty to protect the Constitution, the republic that we hand to our children will be less vibrant, less resilient. fortunate to inherit. The framers of the Constitution knew that democracy is fragile. They knew that its survival depends on the strength and the courage we display in maintaining it. But this fragility is also a strength. It requires our public servants to put out, to put our nation's interests ahead of our own, to root out corruption and to hold each other accountable the high standards of democracy that democracy demands. That's why we take an oath to defend the Constitution. If protecting the Constitution were trivial, we wouldn't have to take an oath. For over 200 years, honesty and vigilance and courage have won out as generations of Americans have adhered to their oath of office and met the standards of service that our democracy necessitates. Many died protecting our democracy. We cannot let this legacy be demand, we cannot let this legacy be damaged on our watch. President Trump has not treated his oath of office with the seriousness it requires. But ultimately, this is not only a vote about one person. This is a vote about his and our oath of office. This is a vote to determine whether we will maintain our democracy or set our nation on a path to upend the values and standards the framers laid out for us. I yield back. If it is any consolation uh, uh, to you, I've been in the number nine position and in the number four position, but look at me now. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think that's the most aspiring thing I've heard during the hopeful thing today, which may be a reflection of what we're doing here. I, I do want to say, um, on coming in here seven, eight hours ago, and I've heard a few of my colleagues on both sides say this, it's hard not to be as a member of this institution who has great reference, reverence for this institution. I've heard Mr. Collins say many times that he believes in, he's an institutionalist, um, not to be sad. I think we are all sad and depressed from our perspectives because this, this is not the institution as it's at its optimum. And I'll say for this, the accusations about never Trumpers, I guess I will admit to being an almost never Trumper. Um, after he was elected, I agreed with President Obama and Secretary Clinton that we should give him a chance. Um, and I remember teasing some of my staff, well, maybe he's Chester Arthur, where people thought when Arthur took over for Garfield, given his reputation in New York, no offense, um, that he would not be capable, and he turned out to start the civil service system, which we have benefited from in the last few months when we've seen these really courageous public servants come forward. Irrespective of your position, you can't help but help admire um, these folks 
And then having sat in, as a member of the oversight and sat in hours of those depositions with Mr. Raskin and others, um, Ambassador Taylor, uh, Colonel Veldman, it's just remarkable um, in getting the sense of that. And then having read the 300 pages and listened to the intelligence hearings and the judiciary hearings, I'm just, my concern is that uh, I've heard members of both parties say, pattern, there's a pattern here. And I'll be honest, I'm concerned about the pattern, but the president's pattern. One of the reasons why I was an early uh, signer on to Steve Cohen's articles of impeachment. Mr. Chairman, the committee's not loaded. I'm not offended. <laughs> okay. Um, but having signed on to Cohen's that never came to the floor, as the chairman said, I approached those, supporting those, as referring it to the Judiciary Committee to have a hearing. Because my own intuitive belief is this particular president, whether Republican or Democrat, in my perception, rules don't have the same effect on him as the majority of people. And I think rules are important. And I think, unfortunately, it's part of our business culture right now that um, stretching the rules or breaking the rules and getting away from them is part of what's wrong with this country. So, uh, Mr. Raskin and Mr. Collins, I, I have really one question. In this pattern of things, we're all gonna live with the consequences of our votes. I hear my colleagues feel strongly that they will vote against these. Uh, most likely, apparently, uh, Mr. McConnell believes there'll be a trial that the president will be acquitted. So, what I'm afraid of is that the, power, the president will be empowered to break more rules. I, I, don't think he's capable of, and I hope that's not true. Um, so what happens after this? And I want to read a quote from um, James Madison in, in 51, when he talked about the balance of, a, of, of and I, I'm an amateur, I hate to say this in front of a professional like Mr. Raskin, but I want him to reply to this, because I don't take this as a hypothetical our actions and the actions of the Senate are part of a pattern, and either it will be corrected after this is all done, or if I'm right, the president will go ahead and push the rules again, and I'm mindful that he made this phone call the day after the Mueller report. And this is in the context of foreign interference, that the British, the French, the Germans twice during World War I and World War II were very aggressive at affecting our democracy. The founders were perceptive and understanding in a democracy in those days, which was an unusual thing, that Madison said you had to bind the institutions, these three institutions, the judiciary, the presidency, and the Congress, bind them so there's a check and balance, which is what 51's all about. But put this in the context of what we know from the Mueller report and what Mr. Raskin's talked about and the technology that Mr. Putin and his agents have perfected. We as Americans tend to think in American exceptionalism, maybe sometimes that the Russians aren't very sophisticated. They are very, very sophisticated at propaganda that, as Mr. Raskin said, its ultimate goal is to disrupt democracy and have us basically destroy ourselves. Because Mr. Putin believes the worst thing that happened to Russia was the implosion of the Soviet Union in Glasnost. And he sees the mass of men and women as um, incapable of governing themselves, which to us sitting here, we're, we I think we all believe, whether we're conservative or liberal, that is the opposite of what we live for, what people have sacrificed their lives for. So Mr. Putin wants us to be fighting each other. They, and they've used social media, and somebody from the Bay Area who deals with these companies and is frustrated with them to govern themselves, they have used it in a way, as the Mueller report says, to support this president, according to the report. And I thought that was damning enough to go ahead with impeachment, but we didn't. And the obstruction was clear to me, but we didn't. So in the context of that report, and sitting here a few months before our Democratic primary, which will be super primary in March, and less than a year away from an election, knowing that they're going to do these things, in the context of what we are going to do is not a hypothetical. It's part of a continuing effort by foreign actors who do not believe in this institution or in democracy or average people governing themselves, what do we anticipate the consequences after we vote tomorrow and after the Senate?
takes what I think is a mistake in their action. So let me just read what Madison said. And all the founders are amazing writers because people wrote and read well then. So he said in 51, he said, the interest of the man must be connected with the constitutional rights of the place. It may be a reflection on human nature that such devices should be necessary to control the abuses of government. But what is government itself but the greatest of all reflections on human nature? If men were angels, no government would be necessary. If angels were to govern, neither external or internal controls on government would be necessary. In framing a government which is to be administered by men over men, the great difficulty lies in this. You must first enable the government to control the governed, and in the next place, oblige it to control itself. So our failure to control ourselves as a Congress uh, for the difficulties of the time make me think that the consequences of our decisions and the inability to hold the, this president accountable and constrain him properly under the Constitution is not a hypothetical. It's something we're going to have to deal with in the days to come and before the next election while foreign actors and domestic actors try to disrupt our democracy. So, Mr. Raskin, Professor Raskin, what do we do after this decision? How do we constrain the administration and properly balance that with the needs of this institution? You ask that at 6.50 p.m. Um, <laughs> that's a big question, uh, Mr. Dessonnier, but, but I'll, I'll, I'll try my hardest. Let's see. 30 seconds left. Um, Mr. Collins, if you want to jump in, I don't think it's a hypothetical. I'd love to hear your opinion. I, I'm, I'm, going to, I'm going to give it my best shot first. Um, what are the consequences in terms of the 2020 election? That's something... Um, now, let me say this. Um, I don't want to assume the inevitability of your premise that we're not actually going to deal with this problem. The, the House of Representatives has been immersed in this. Uh, we know a lot more about the facts. We know a lot more about the details. And now it's going over to the Senate. And I want to believe that 100 senators are going to adhere to their constitutional oath, reflect on what that means, and then be open-minded, critical thinking jurors in the process, okay. Um, but what would happen if we don't deal with it, if we all just go home and say, hey, you know, um, authoritarianism is on the march all over the world, democracy's on the run, there's only so much we can do at this point, and we don't deal with it. Well, I think President Zelensky's gotta be watching, Ukraine's gotta be watching. From their perspective, they're in the middle of this. I mean, all of us are sort of acting like, well, President Trump got caught, so of course they're not going to go through with it. But if we let him go, why won't they go through with it? Why won't he have to go through with it? Why won't he have to make his announcement about the Bidens? And then for his own domestic political consumption, he'll have to go through with an investigation. We've just set a new precedent there, a new standard that the president can go and try to recruit foreign governments to get in our campaign by threatening, announcing, and engaging in criminal investigations of their political opponents. That's banana republic stuff, right? That's tin pot dictator stuff, but we've set that as a standard. So that terrifies me. Um, here's another pattern that we've got to deal with. Robert Mueller came to testify before the House Judiciary Committee on July the 24th. And as the president mentioned on the phone call on July 25th, he thought basically... He'd gotten away with everything, right? Mueller found a sweeping and systematic campaign by Russia. He found more than 100 contacts with the Trump <clears throat> campaign. But Attorney General Barr had taken the report for three and a half weeks, and he had said to America, there's nothing in there, nothing to be seen here, prompting not one but two letters of protest from special counsel Mueller. And yet it was too late for democracy to catch up to have a serious, rigorous analysis of what was in the report. And on the very next day, President Trump has the phone call with President Zelensky and says, but do us a favor though, kind of putting the icing on the cake of this whole effort to drag them in to our domestic politics. That's a pattern because 
If it can be done to one struggling democracy, it can be done to another struggling democracy. And if we can allow one tyrannical authoritarian uh, despot like Vladimir Putin to come on in, the water's warm, well, why not others? Why not Turkey? Why not the president's friends in Saudi Arabia? He already basically whitewashed their assassination, murder, and dismemberment of a Washington Post journalist. So what big deal would it be for them to say, come on in and get involved in our election campaign? So that's a serious problem. Now, what about, you say, the pattern about checks and balances? It's interesting because the phrase checks and balances appears in the Federalist Papers not to refer to the three branches. It's not legislative, executive, judicial. It refers to the House and the Senate. Mm -hmm. And those are the checks and balances we should be thinking about yeah. right now because the people's body will speak this week. And if it goes the way I hope we, go, we will go, we will impeach this president for abuse of power. We will impeach this president for obstruction of the Congress. But we are placing our faith, as the Constitution obligates us to, in the Senate to do their job. But what that also means is place our faith in the people to make the Senate do their job, because we're politicians and we know that we don't respond exclusively and entirely to the will of the constituents, but we do a lot. That's an important ingredient in representative democracy. But look, in Congress itself, we cannot be afraid of our own power. One thing I disagreed with, I think I heard one of my majority colleagues today say, is we've got three co-equal branches. And I've been trying to correct this from the very beginning. Man. Our framers, the founders of America, overthrew a king. And in the first sentence of the Constitution, the preamble, they stated what America was about. We the people, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and preserve to ourselves and our posterity the blessings of liberty do hereby ordain and establish the Constitution of the United States of America. The very next sentence starts Article 1. All legislative power is vested in the Congress of the United States, the Senate, and the House of Representatives. You see what just happened there? The sovereign political power of the people of America flowed from the act of Constitution making into the Congress of the United States. And then you get 37 paragraphs laying out all the powers of Congress the power of appropriation and spending, the power to regulate commerce domestically and internationally, the power to declare war, the power over the seat of government, the power of a copyright, and so on and on. Even the power in Article 1, Section 8, Clause 18, um, to have all the other powers necessary to the enforcement and execution of the foregoing powers. And then in Article 2, you get to the president. And remember, in the Articles of Confederation, in the Articles of Association, we didn't even have a president, right? So they wanted to create somebody who would show executive energy to execute our laws. But that was the job, to take care that the laws are faithfully executed and to be the commander in chief of the army and navy in times of actual insurrection, right? That's the core of what the job is. And, and section four of article two is all about impeachment in order to make sure a president doesn't become a king. Think about this. Why do we have the power to impeach the president and he doesn't have the power to impeach us. And it was a great Republican president, Gerald Ford, who answered it. Here, the people rule. Here, the people and their representatives rule. So if, if the president were to be impeached, he doesn't go to jail for one day because of that. That's criminal prosecution. It's got nothing to do with us. But what we're doing is protecting the country and the Constitution. Mr. Collins, you want 30 seconds? <laughs> <laughs> I think my friend just summed up the entire thing for me. He did. We went on a whirlwind trip. He is a, he is a wonderful teacher. I would have loved to have had him in class. And he is, went all over the world at a 30,000-foot level. You'd, you'd watch him along, and his oratorical skimmed down to touch the common man and come up and touch the, the wings of the gods. The problem is he never addressed the issue we're dealing with. And I think that's the very heart of the problem we have right now. It is one thing to speak in brash or rhetorical flourishes today, and we have, and we're getting to an end, thank you, Lord, of dealing with this. But the bottom line is, is the question, I believe, yes, where do we go from here? Mm -hmm. It's like the, you know, the, the simple man who, who once needed to get his, uh, 
you know, it was, uh, I used to watch it, and I know this may come as strange to my colleagues on uh, the majority side. I, I really enjoy the West Wing. I watch it. My family has watched it over and over and over again. And, and, and that answer right there, which I respect deeply, this, it is amazing. We differ on so many things, but actually, I, I, Jamie and I just get along very well on many other things. We just, he's wrong, I'm right, but we'll deal with that. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Um, but we did, but there, was a, there was an episode in which President Bartlett was in his, one of his rhetorical flourishes. And Toby asked him about a friend, a friend who had called about getting something fixed at the VA. And he went into this long story. If you remember this, this, this scene, he went into this long story about the red tape and that veterans had to come to D.C. and because they were tape with red tape, that's where red tape come from. And Charlie, who is the body man for, for the president, looked at him. He said, but Mr. President, all he wanted to know was how to get his wheelchair fixed. And I think that's what we're seeing a lot of here today. It's future. What is going on? What's going to happen? What happens tomorrow? What's going to happen tomorrow is you're going to vote through the articles of impeachment. Probably after that, it's going to go to the Senate, which has been a predetermined observation from day one, not because of, of anything else. It's not going anywhere, and that's fine. That's the path we chose. But where do we go from here? This is my question. Because I think when you look at this, to simply say, and, and to come at it from the facts, which is the only way the majority can come at this, is that the president did something wrong. At which point has he ever done anything right for this majority? He never has. And I think when you look at the, the discussion, and, and I understand your, your discussion, Mr. Perlman, I get it. But when you look at it from the fact that, that from the moment after the election, there was discussion of impeachment. From, 19, from minutes after he was sworn in, the Washington Post said, now the impeachment begins. When we begin to look at this process all the way through, my only question is, is not when do we do this, you know, how or where do we go from here? It's just when. It's just when do we do it again? Because it's not a matter of this facts, and it was like I said earlier, not engaging in hypotheticals. We go back to the simple basic facts of happened in this case. Four basic truths. Zelensky and President Trump said no pressure. The transcript shows no conditionality. The Ukrainians were not aware of the aid was being held when they spoke. And the Ukrainians didn't open an investigation, still received aid, and got a meeting with the President. There were five meetings, three of which took place from the call to the after till the time the Ukrainians found out about the aid being held. Two of those meetings were held after they found out about the aid being held. None of these, ranging from President Trump to Senators Johnson and Murphy, Vice President Pence, none, none of these actually discussed aid being linked to the money. None. So we start off and we get rhetorical flourishes here at the end, which is fine. I understand it. If I had to sell this, I would have to be rhetorically in flourish as well because the Constitution is at stake here. It is the determination, is this Congress going to become a body in which we impeach because of partisan ideas, which is also what the founders discussed. You have the majority. We had the majority for a while while I was here, for six years. It's a massive responsibility. And at times we did it well, and at times we did not do it well. And I believe that is why probably last November we got an election that gave you the majority and gave you the gavel. But remember, just because you can don't mean you should. And sometimes when the facts, especially when you have to go at them from a perspective of the way this process has went, as I said earlier today, I'll fight process and I'll fight facts, and I'll win on both. Because when I take this case from here at this table in just a few minutes when we leave, then I'll take it to the floor tomorrow, and then I'll take it to the American people, just as this president will, and just as those who fought. And when we understand what actually happened, when what is actually charged, not what was assumed and not what was put deep into a report, but what was actually ended up, then I simply see nothing that helps us down the line. But I do see two things that bother me, and this will finish my statement to you. I see a process that has been trashed in the rules and processes of the committee and of the whole. And I see a process of impeachment that has been lowered to where you don't even have to jump anymore. And that is my concern. I know Mr. Raskin doesn't share it, but that you ask, that is my concern. Where do we go from here? In some ways, looking at this, God help us. I yield back. Let the record know that was more than 30 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> well, let, me, let me just finish with, um, from my perspective, the specificity, and Mr. Cole and I were talking about people reading the summary of the phone call and different people reading it and having different realities when they read it. But as all of us can relate to, a candidate for federal office, the law says, cannot, quote, knowingly solicit, accept, or receive from a foreign national 
any contribution or donation. And that contribution or donation is defined as anything of value. When I read that summary, he's clearly asking for someone, something of value, so an investigation that would cost hundreds of thousands of dollars against his primary opponent the day after the Mueller report, a day before he went out, I'm told, and said that the Second Amendment gave him the right to do anything he wanted. So with that, um, just maybe briefly, Mr. Raskin, the president withheld these funds. Mr. Collins says he, he released them, but my recollection is in the testimony, he released them because people in the Congress and the press were starting to say, you need to release these. So it was the pressure um, brought to him to release it that, ga that got him to release it. And in that time, the Ukraine was exposed to his patron, Mr. Putin. So was he fa faithfully executing the duties of his office when he did that? Well, he got caught red-handed, and um, I don't see any ambiguity in the historical record about that. We announced our investigation on the 9th of September, and then it was on the 11th that the money was finally released. Thank you. I yield back. Uh, thank you. I have good news uh, for both of you. Uh, I think everybody has asked, a question, has asked their questions. There's nobody left here on this committee. Um, I do. I just. Do, I, do, I do want to close with this. I want, first, I want to. I want to thank uh, both our witnesses uh, for enduring this very long hearing. I want to thank the members of the Rules Committee, Democrats and Republicans, because I think we have very uh, sharp disagreements on this. Um, but I think this hearing was conducted with civility. I want to thank Mr. Cole and and his team uh, for helping with that. I mean, um, I, I like this hearing quite frankly better than the one that was in your committee. Um, but, uh, but I mean, I, I think people feel very strongly uh, about these issues. And, um, and I think, um, yeah, you know, and I, I, I do, I, I, do, I want to thank everybody for, um, uh, for their cooperation here today. And um, so you guys are dismissed. Um, and there are no other witnesses here. So that will end the hearing uh, uh, portion of this. Uh, 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 Mr. Chairman? 755, yes, Mr. Um, can I be recognized for unanimous consent yeah, request? Sure. All right, then when we have a I, have, I just said, yeah. I have uh, the four letters that I sent individually asking to review the documents, two letters that were group projects, and I would like to add those. Without objection. Record. And then also, I think it's significant that President Poroshenko came and talked to a joint session of Congress, many remember, in 2014. Would you, uh, the the gentleman imagine. deserves to be heard. Uh, in his address, uh, he referenced a lot of things. Uh, how Ukraine had voluntarily withdrawn from being a nuclear power with the promise that they would always be protected, and then maybe they weren't. But he also, this was a speech in which he also said that they needed more military equipment, both lethal and non-lethal. Blankets and night vision goggles are important, but you cannot win a war with blankets. And again, this was from 2014. Donald Trump was not president. I just thought it was important to put that in as, in as part of the record, as we've heard, Without about how national security sure. was threatened by so, President Trump's actions. So the uh, hearing portion of, of HRS 755 has come to a close, um, and um, we will uh, recess subject to the call of the chair, and we will work with you about an appropriate time to reconvene to meet some of the obligations that your members have and our members have. Okay. Tonight. Yeah, tonight. We're meeting tonight. Yeah. Uh, with that, uh, the hearing is closed. I can promise you that. Yeah, I can promise you that. I think. I think. I think. Um, I think it'll be at a decent hour.